One of the most challenging aspects for students studying 3D is venturing beyond modeling and texturing to create a fully rendered and composited shot. I certainly wish that I had experience before I landed my first effects job with virtually no compositing experience. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. And if you're interested in brushing up on some PBR servicing with UDIMS, learning about lighting and AOVs, batch rendering, render layers, EXR compositing, all with ACES CG, then this tutorial series might be useful for you. We're going to be taking a full effects shot from start to finish using Maya, V-Ray, and After Effects. So even if you are using some different software, a lot of the foundational concepts are going to be the same. This was originally a lecture series that was nine hours in length, and I created this for an effects class that I teach at college. But going forward, we're not going to be using this concept anymore, and I didn't want it to go to waste. It's been a huge amount of time putting this together, and a lot of the information here is, I think, going to be valuable to a lot more people. So I decided to break this up into segments and release it publicly. So throughout the series, I'm going to be using this model of the Razor Crest by Tron Man. I chose this model specifically because it's not low poly, but it's not too high poly either. It's just a good amount of detail. It's got good texture maps and it has UDIMs, and that's something I would like to show you with Maya and V-Ray. But most importantly of all, it is free. So this first part is going to be pretty boring. We're just going to be setting up a project in Maya. I'm going to be going over some settings that I like to use inside of Maya, and then we'll be importing the Razor Crest model. So if you are interested in using the same model, I will have a link in the description. And as we progress through these videos, if you realize that you would like the completed Maya scene or the EXR sequences that we use, that is all going to be available on my Patreon. So that's going to include the completed Maya scenes, the EXR sequences, the After Effects composition, and of course the VDB sequences that we'll be needing later on for the dust. So in a future video, I'll be showing you some stuff that we did in Embergen to generate some clouds of dust as the Razor Crest comes into land. And if you would like those same sequences, they will be available on Patreon. All right, so let's get started. Right, so as a prerequisite, you need to download a V-Ray. So we can type in V-Ray and then type in PLE, stands for Personal Learning Edition. And on chaos.com, you can sign up for a free version of V-Ray for Maya. So this is the PLE version, the Personal Learning Edition. So you would just say, get started. You'll have to create an account. And this will grant you a three month license of the PLE version, which is pretty much the same. You just don't have batch rendering support. Uh, otherwise, you can download a trial of V-Ray, which is only for 30 days. But I do recommend the PLE if you intend to use V-Ray for more than a month, basically. And at the end of 90 days with the PLE, you can renew it as well. And as far as I'm aware, you can renew it indefinitely. So make sure you sign up for this and you download it. And then you will just run the installer then launch Maya. Go ahead and download this from CG Trader. I'm going to do that first. And before we actually get into Maya, we actually need to create our project folder. So after you've downloaded those assets, you need to drag them to some kind of folder. And then we need to create a folder for Maya. So I'm assuming that you know how to set projects in Maya, but what you've probably done in most classes is gone inside Maya and then automatically create all the folders that you need. That's fine, but generally it produces way too many folders than you actually need. So what I prefer to do is the manual approach, which is just creating the folders that you know that you will need. And a one thing to note is you can literally name your files whatever you want, but by default, Maya will not look for your textures in a textures folder, for example, unless you explicitly refer to that when you set up your project. So we're going to use the default names. If you want to use other names, that's okay, but just know that Maya is not automatically going to know where they are, or it's not automatically going to save things there. So first thing that we need, we create a new folder. We need an assets folder. So for the assets, this is where we're going to take these, the Razor Crest Alembic file, which is the model, and then our uh, textures. And for our textures, I have a 7-zip file, so I'm going to extract this. If you don't have 7-zip, I highly recommend it. It's a very, very useful compression software, which is free, much better than WinRAR. But if you ever see a 7Z file, it just means that you need to use 7-zip. And if you ever explore models and stuff on CG Trader or TurboSquid and stuff like that, you'll often see 7-zip files. Anyway, so I'm going to take both of these, drag them into assets just for now. And then we're going to create a new folder. We're going to have one for scenes. So we got our scenes folder. This is where our main scenes are going to go. We're going to have a source images folder. So source images is where Maya automatically will look for source images or source input 
So textures and HDRs and things like that. And that is all that we need to do right at the very beginning. When we start rendering, Maya will automatically create an images folder. But for right now, this is, this is all we need. Okay, so now we need to go to Maya. If you don't see this little splash screen, this was a recent addition to Maya 2022. So if you don't see this, it doesn't matter. Basically like a home menu, which you can disable if you don't want to. So you can create a new file here. You can open one. You can do your project stuff here, or you can just do go to project. One thing I wanted to note here is by default, Maya's project is going to be in your username, documents, Maya projects default. So if you start rendering, for example, and forgot to set your project, and then you can't find your image sequences, just look here, because that's probably where it is. All right, so let's click go to Maya. And uh, you'll also notice in Maya 2022, they added the view cube from 3ds Max. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with 3ds Max. I use 3ds Max at work. It's kind of useful in 3ds Max, uh, so kind of cool that they added that. Another thing that you'll notice is that we're now using Aces Color, which is a different to what you may have seen before. Um, and there's going to be a few things that we're going to change with the UI as we progress through this lecture series. This is going to be more how I liked to set it up. Uh, so the, one of the first things that I like to do is go to Windows, and then we're going to Settings and Preferences, Preferences, drag this over here. And the very first thing that I like to do is make sure that we have autosave on. So for autosave, that's going to be under one of these settings here. I think it's under Files and Projects. So make sure you enable your autosave. I know some people say that it's bad, but uh, it's not bad. It's always good to have an autosave, in my opinion. Uh, there will be a time where autosave saves you from having to remake an entire file or miss a deadline or something like that. So by default, every 10 minutes, it will save a file. Uh, you can limit your autosaves if you want to, but usually this is, this is good to go. And I think this is good. Autosaves will automatically save in your project directory. So we'll set that up in a second. Another thing that I think is useful, if you are on a decent computer, if you go to your undo, turn on undo, and then make sure that your queue is set to infinite. This means there's no limit to how many undo commands you can do. This is extremely useful. I'm not sure if this is default or if this imported from a previous version of Maya, but uh, it used to be finite. But make sure it's on infinite. I think that is definitely the way to go. And there's one last thing that I like to do. So under files and projects, I forgot to do this a second ago. If we scroll down to the file dialog, by default, Maya has its own file open dialog with specific settings for Maya. I don't like that very much. So I'm going to switch this to the OS, the operating system native. So this is going to be the standard Windows file browser, and I prefer that. So that's what I'm going to do there. And I think for the rest of the settings, we're good to go. So just click Save. All right, so the first thing we have to do is set our project. So I'm going to do File, Set Project. And by default, this will go to Documents, Maya, Projects, which is not what we want to do. So what we want to do is go to our project location that we just set up with the asset scenes and source images and grab that path. Although I just realized I need to create an actual folder for this project name. I can just call that Razorcrest. Take these folders and just slap it in there. So inside this, this is going to be where our, our project files are. But uh, we want to grab that path. So you can either copy and paste this, or you can use some software called Listery. And Listery is really, really cool. It's free. And what it does, if you are, have any type of file browser selected, that's like a, a native Windows operating system one, like this, like File Explorer. If you have anything in that window selected, and then you go to another file browser here, like the Set Project one, and simply click it, it will automatically grab your path. So instead of having to copy and paste it, and paste it in there, it automatically just does it for you. So that's really, really cool. It's life-changing. And it also has a really useful search function too. So you can just literally start typing stuff, and it will try to find where files are. So if I type in like, Razor Crest. It's going to find you all those Razor Crest files, like right there. And if you want to know where it is, no problem. Right click, open folder, and it'll take, take you right there. So very useful. It's free. You might want to check it out if you're on your own personal computer. 
So that is how we grab the right path and then click set project. By default, it will say, hey, you need to create a workspace. Sure, that's fine, create default workspace, and then we are ready to go. Okay, very first thing we're gonna do is save this just so you don't accidentally lose everything. So we're gonna do Razorcrest underscore V001, so for, for version one, click save. And now we can import the model. So later on, we're gonna be using references rather than imports, but for this specific file, we are gonna use this basically just for the model with some kind of temp lighting. So that's fine to just do an import. And it's probably what you've done before. So next we're gonna to go to assets, and then we're gonna lo load in the Alembic ABC file. So that should just take a second to load in, and then we've got our model. So just to uh, review here on just some basic Maya stuff, uh, we can turn on our wireframe here and just like look at the model. I think uh, there's definitely some areas where the topology could be improved a little bit, but for the most part, it is, it is pretty good. Uh, it would be a little bit difficult to edit some of these areas like where there's triangles, but uh, yeah, not really our concern. We just want the model and it looks pretty cool. So I'm gonna turn this wireframe off. Before we actually can start creating our materials and our lighting and all of that, we need to use the correct render engine. So by default, as you know, in Maya, the default render engine is Arnold. So there's nothing wrong with Arnold, as I said, but we are going to switch this to V-Ray. So if you click on this and you don't see anything else here, you either need to install V-Ray or you need to make sure it is loaded. So we go to Windows, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager. And the plugin that we're looking for is V-Ray. So we can just type in V-Ray and V-Ray for Maya. And uh, there's always a, an error now in the newest version. Uh, it's a plugin that comes with Maya, a USD plugin, which is another file format. For whatever reason it doesn't work with, or some component of that does not work with the newest version of V-Ray. So until they fix that, there's an annoying error. Uh, we're also gonna do the V-Ray volume grid too, that's fine. And then let's load all these, cool. All right, refresh. Okay, so now when you go back to your renderer, V-Ray shows up. And by the way, that last step, if you grab the PLE, I think it does actually say V-Ray PLE version. Uh, so just keep that in mind, but the installation is pretty much the same. Okay, so V-Ray PLE. Uh, and by the way, the only differences between the V-Ray PLE version and the full version of V-Ray is that there's no batch rendering support with the free version. So batch rendering, we'll explain a little bit later, but uh, for right now, it doesn't matter. There's really not much else that's different. All right, so we will be going through all of these things later on, but for right now, we can close that, and then we can start loading in the materials. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions so far, please let me know. Otherwise, in the next video, we're gonna start doing V-Ray materials. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned for the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to part two of the Razorcrest series. In this video, we're gonna be going over V-Ray materials with Maya. And specifically, this model that we're using has UDIMs, so that's something I would like to go over. If you are interested in following along with the same model, that is available in the link in the description. And if you're using your own ship model, all the concepts are the same. If you don't have UDIMs, you can just ignore the UDIM tag, but everything else is gonna be the same, all right? Let's get started. Very first thing, we need to go to the Hypershade. And I hope this is not new material, but we, you might learn something that you didn't learn before. So with V-Ray materials, they are very similar to Arnold materials, but there are some differences. And the very first thing that we want to do is just grab in a standard V-Ray material. So we can just middle mouse click and drag that over, or you can just click V-Ray material there. And we're going to create a material for the main body. And for this object, there are a few different texture sets that come with it. So if we go back to our assets folder here, I'm gonna grab this entire folder and I'm gonna pull this into source images, paste it there. And inside our Razorcrest textures, we can see there are a significant number of files. We have 137 items. These are all TIFF files, so they are uncompressed and they're quite large actually. Some of these are very large. Uh, there's also some JPEGs that you can use, but I recommend using the TIFF sequences. 
And you really do need to use the tiffs for the normal maps and height maps, but uh, for color and for doing things like roughness, JPEGs are fine. But when you start using like normals and height data and stuff like that, the compression really does, in many circumstances, hinder the fidelity. So usually JPEGs aren't good for those. All right, so a brief look at these shows us that we have base color and we also have our, we have height, which we may or may not need, depends. We have metalness and we have normals and roughness. And for the surfaces here, we have the greeble, which I'll show you what that is. We have the main material, then we have the glass material. So there's really only three V-Ray materials that we need to create for this. And you might also notice that these have sequences. So these are actually UDIMs. Basically, instead of having to create multiple different objects with different UV sets or have like one massive like 16K image, you can create multiple. Uh, I'll just show you this. It'll be easier. If I go to UV, UV editor, you can see that each UV tile has specific parts of the geometry on it. And it's very useful, very convenient. So instead of having to have multiple different objects now, UDIMs allow you to, you know, piece them all together as one as a sequence. So you'll load the base one and then we'll just step forward and grab the next texture for other assignments. So hopefully you've done UDIMs before. UDIMs has actually been around for a long time, but it's only just becoming more popular to use. But uh, we'll be using UDIMs as well. Okay, right. So back to the hypershade. And we need a V-Ray material for the main material. So we'll just call this Razor Crest Main. That's probably fine. And we'll call this Main Mat. Okay. And because we might have other things called Razor Crest Main later, who knows? And uh, yeah, so we're also going to get rid of this thing here, the property editor. This thing, for whatever reason in Maya, is kind of garbage because it never shows you the full list. We're actually just going to use this on the attribute editor. So to prevent confusion, I recommend clicking this X and then we just get a bigger view of the material viewer and the material viewer. If you hold down the alt key, you can orbit it around as you normally would any viewport in Maya. Okay. So this is set to hardware. Hardware is fine. V-Ray sometimes doesn't load or is too slow. And of course we can't use Arnold with V-Ray materials anyway, but we can use hardware. So this is going to be just a quick, you know, approximation of what it's going to be. It's not going to be perfect, but it'll give us a good idea. Okay, next we're going to need our attribute editor open. So I'll pull this over here and then we'll grab, then we'll be able to see all of our different material channels. Okay, so if you are familiar with Arnold, Arnold does have a few different names. And there's also a difference with V-Ray materials in that they support PBR workflows, but you don't have to. So it's it's kind of a weird mix. We are going to be using a PBR workflow for this. Uh, PBR is just physically based rendering. And PBR itself is a specific workflow. So you'll find that most render engines actually do work in a physically based way. So V-Ray, even if you're not using the PBR workflow per se, it's still physically based. So it's kind of a misnomer that if you're not using PBR, you're doing everything wrong. However, uh, PBR was made to simplify the number of textures that you need. So it's faster for things like games or real time rendering, but it's also to make it a little bit easier to use. That said, PBR kind of shot off in two branches. There's two different main workflows for PBR. And I find that at least with my own experience, like professional experience, a lot of people do not understand PBR to the same extent. So I hope you leave this class with a better understanding of PBR and some things that you might be doing wrong when it comes to things like metalness, for example. Okay, so I'll explain this as we go. So the very first thing, we need a file. So there's two ways you can do that. Of course, you can grab a file node from down here, or we can simply click on the material, go into our diffuse color, and then we can load in a file this way. So this is probably easier. So we'll just do file. And if you haven't used the hypershade for editing your materials, the nice thing about it is that you still have your stacked layout like this, like the old 3ds Max compact editor. And I keep bringing up 3ds Max. I have no idea if any of you have ever used that. That's what I started with. Uh, I'm sure some of you out there have used Blender before, and I really haven't used Blender, so can't really compare that. I'll try to keep the comparisons to Max down. 
But uh, yeah, anyway, so we have our diffuse color and by default we have a file node and the file node is attached to a placement node. So this is so you can do some basic adjustments on rotations and UVs and stuff like that. Like if you wanted something to be tiled or way smaller, but still fit on the UVs of the object, you can do that there. And uh, you have your alpha and your color. We have our main material, then we have our shading group. So the shading group allows us to do things like the surface, volume, and displacement. We're not really gonna be doing anything for right now that's not just surface, so we can just use this node right here. I hope this is review, as I said, but uh, if I'm going too slowly over this, I do recommend that you watch this part just to make sure that you're doing everything correctly, because there might be some parts that you, you just forget or you might have been doing incorrectly before. So this part is gonna be pretty simple. We can click on the input connection, so that little arrow, and then grab our first file. We're gonna go inside our RC textures and then we're gonna grab our first file for base color. So for a UDIM, you're gonna see 1001. This is gonna be the first one, like that. And by default, this is only gonna load in that first one. To get the UDIM, what you do, you highlight this number right here and I'll, I'll zoom in on this so you can see this a little bit better. And then we wanna replace that with the following. So you do less than sign or greater than sign, whichever one that is, and then the UDIM, UDIM, and then you do a greater than sign. So that is what tells V-Ray, tells Maya that this is actually a UDIM. It's a sequence. You need to load in all of them, not just that first one. You can click reload. And of course, I never even attached this to the vehicle. So let me do that really fast. I'm going to select everything. I'm not going to select the glass. Deselect that. And I'm going to deselect these greebles over here, which are these little just bits of detail. Uh, so basically everything except the windows and the greebles. And then I'm going to go back to our hypershade, right click over the razor crest main, and then do assign material to viewport selection. And that will automatically add it here. Okay, so when you apply that, you unfortunately will not notice that any of your UDIMs are on. And uh, as to the best of my knowledge, this is simply due to the fact that V-Ray does not display them in the viewport or Maya does not display them properly in the viewport for V-Ray materials. Unfortunately, can't really see them. Uh, I, I think that Arnold UDIMs show up, but uh, yeah. So you really just have to render it just to make sure that everything is good. Uh, we're not gonna render just yet. We're gonna make the rest of our materials and then we'll get to that part. So one other thing that you can do if you missed that last step where we went over how to apply the, the material, you can also just select all your geometry here, right click over it, go to assign existing material, and then you can just say, hey, razor crest main, done. Okay. Likewise, on creating a material, for example, this glass, you could right click over it, say, assign new material, go to V-Ray, and then say V-Ray MTL. And then we can call this razor crest glass mat like that. And then we could do the same thing for the greebles. So these right here. And with Maya, if you just click the G key, you're automatically going to get your last action, which is assign new material, V-Ray material. And then we'll call this razor crest greebles mat. So the greebles are just like, it's a detail that's I mean, these are probably functional or supposed to be functional, but they're just little bits of stuff to make it look more detailed. Honestly, that's what Agreeable is. And next we can go back to our hypershade and then do the rest of the materials. So we're going to go back to our main material here. And if this is cluttered in your hypershade, you can simply right click over the one you want, hold it down, graph network, and then you can just clear out everything else. Also going to make this shader ball a little smaller and uh, just move that to the side. Okay, so one thing that it is important that you start doing is every time you add a file node, it's just going to say file one, but file one doesn't mean anything. So let's just call this razor crest base color. Base color is the same thing as albedo, which is the same thing as diffuse color in most circumstances. There are very specific use cases of things that aren't albedo or aren't diffuse or aren't base color, but for the most part, if it's just the color image, I think color is the most sensible thing to call it. If you're in PBR, you call it albedo, whatever, okay? 
they're pretty much the same thing. And in our case, they are the same thing. V-Ray by default calls this diffuse color. So whatever, base color, diffuse color, albedo, doesn't matter. Next, we need one for our roughness. There was a, a question, by the way, on the surveys, before I forget, uh, there was a question on here that said, do all materials have reflections? And a shocking amount of you said no, but they do. Every single material has a reflection. So hopefully you were like, oh, well, Lambert's don't have materials. And if you're like, oh, Maya materials, okay, you get a pass. But if you're talking about like what I meant was real life materials, every real life material has reflections. So you always have to have reflections. If you want your CG to look good, it needs to have reflections. Uh, there's someone always brings up and like if, if I'm actually in class, Vanta Black. Well, Vanta Black is like pure black. So let me just show you this. So Vanta Black is like this super, super black paint. And it's like the most unreflective. It just absorbs like every single amount of light, like 99% of the light or something. Uh, it still technically doesn't reflect all of it. 1% uh, of light, it doesn't reflect or 0.1% of light, whatever it is. This is like a really rare exception. And this honestly looks like you're doing some kind of matte holdout object, uh, which we will be using probably later on in this class. Like it looks like someone cut that mat out. It's not normal. It's a cool science trick, but if you're trying to do CG, unless you're making Vanta Black, it's going to have reflections. So you always need to include it. Now with V-Ray, roughness is not on by default. Roughness for the diffuse color is something different. This is if you have like a thin coat of dust or something and you just want to make it look like the diffuse color has some other surface on it, basically. That's what roughness does. Uh, it's not really, it's definitely not PBR for the workflow. It's just an additional thing that you can use. We're going to go down to the reflections, though. And you'll notice that V-Ray by default uses glossiness. So glossiness is basically which areas of a material have a diffuse highlight or a glossy highlight, like a really sharp highlight. But roughness is what PBR uses, and roughness is just the inverse of glossiness. So if you ever get a glossiness map, all you have to do to switch it to roughness is invert it, and that is, that's it, you're good to go, okay? But for that, we are going to click Use Roughness, and now you can see this is Reflection Roughness. So the only thing to kind of be mindful of here is that A, you are using a roughness map in roughness. If it's a glossy map, you can't put it in roughness, you got to put it in glossiness. But uh, you can always go into Photoshop and invert it, or you can invert it in Maya as well before you even get into the material. Whichever way you like to do it doesn't really matter, but uh, just remember which way is which. And then remember that the roughness up here for the diffuse roughness is something completely different. Okay, also self-illumination is an older way of saying emissive. So usually PBR says emissive, V-Ray, and some renderers say self-illumination. It's the same thing, okay? Uh, we are going to be using metalness in a moment, but for right now, we're going to leave that on. All right, so for reflection roughness, we're going to click on the little checkerboard, get a file, and then we're going to go into image name. So on image name here, go to our RC textures, and now we're going to go and load in the main material roughness. We've got to scroll down here, and that's going to be right here. So the first one right there. Actually, it doesn't really matter which one you load because none of the numbers are important. Because we're always going to replace it with that UDIM tag. So then we can click reload. Now, this is very, very important that you do this. And we've got to change our color space. And this is going to be different to what you might have been used to before because of ACES. So ACES has these specific profiles. And hopefully you guys can see these. They kind of go off the screen, sorry. Uh, but for color space, if you made it in Photoshop, by default, color images are going to be sRGB. But anything that is technically it's considered non-color, so if it's just grayscale, you can have a grayscale color map, but it has three specific channels. Grayscale maps, by default, should only have one. Technically, you could have a grayscale image that is sRGB, but anything going into a reflection glossiness channel or reflection roughness, Maya will interpret it as a different type of image. 
And this, for some reason, did not update to roughness. It says roughness here, but it doesn't say there. Strange. Uh, that is actually roughness, so don't worry about that. Anything that goes into roughness or glossiness will not have an extra gamma curve on it. So I'm going to have another video explaining linear workflow and what gamma is and why it's important that you get this right. But basically, it doesn't expect this to be sRGB, which is a gamma profile. So you got to say, hey, don't interpret this as sRGB. Okay, it's kind of annoying that we have to do this, but uh, we're going to just do it by default. Maya also has a specific set of rules that you can use. So anything that has roughness in the name, it would automatically just put it in the right place. But we're going to do this all manually, and then I can show you how to set up rules if you're interested. Okay, so color space, we're going to do utility raw. You could also say in most circumstances, scene linear, and we're going to say scene linear Rec 709, and not this one that says Rec 7 2020. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that. It should say scene linear Rec 709 sRGB. Kind of goes off there. And that's because there's no color in it. So scene linear would preserve whatever color primaries are being used. Color primaries are just what tells the computer what color you're actually trying to use. So different profiles have different primaries, which are, are different slots of color, avail available color. So we're basically stripping the, the, the double correction that we would normally get with a double gamma curve. So we're just saying, hey, just you don't need to interpret this as a color image or sRGB. It's going to be linear. I will explain more of this later, but that is very important. Uh, so one thing to note is, so you can't place this base color in multiple slots because the interpretation of the color space is different depending where it goes. Another thing that I wanted to point out here, by default, Maya will say, hey, your, your out alpha is going to be your reflection glossiness. And that's all great and everything, except for if your file does actually have an alpha channel, it's not going to show the right value here. It's just going to be whatever your alpha is. So there is a way to mitigate that. You can click on the file and then go to your color balance and then say the alpha is actually luminance. So if you're familiar with After Effects, which you should be by now, hopefully, but if we start talking about luma mats versus alpha mats, so luma mats are using a map that's just the black and white information or grayscale information. That's what the luma is. Alpha is where there's transparency and where there's not transparency. So instead of saying alpha, we're saying, hey, use luminance instead. So we'll use your color channel or whatever channel it uses as the luminance instead. That is one way of doing it. Uh, if you want to be absolutely sure that you're doing this right, and what is probably more common practice is to delete that and then just pick your red, green, or blue channel and plug that into your roughness or re your reflection channel, essentially. Uh, this is also useful when you start packing materials. So if you ever do any game dev stuff, a common workflow is to put four images in one file to save space. So you could have an image for your metalness, one for roughness, one for AO, and one for displacement or something like that. You could have all of those channels laid out. This is pretty common though. By default, Maya wants to put it in alpha. That's okay. But if you want to do this, that's okay too. If you want to do out alpha though, I do recommend that you remember to do this. Otherwise you might realize you've done something wrong later. So alpha is luminance is very important. Okay. But if you don't want to do that, just hook up one of these other channels. Okay. Next. So this is probably one thing that you may have done wrong in the past. It's kind of a convoluted thing, to be honest. It could be easier to set up materials, but you will find this in pretty much any software that you use. One day, we probably won't have to do this and it would be intelligent enough to figure it out. But the reason why there are different color spaces is because there are different workflows for different people and what might be common to you, and what honestly probably is the most common way, might not be common to other workflows. Like there are workflows where everyone uses purely linear files, even for color, and you would never use sRGB, for example. So it just really depends on the workflow. Okay, so uh, we are going to go into the... I'm actually not going to put metalness on just yet. I want to show you what that's going to do. But we are going to add in the normal map in a second. So for the normal map, we go down to bump. And unlike Arnold, we do not have a specific node, like an AI 
normal node that we have to plug in, V-Ray can just do it directly, which is very nice. So you can just say, this is a normal map and usually it's tangent space, so that's fine. Then click on our input and then go to file. And then we're gonna grab the normal map. So we're gonna do that right here. And then once again, we're gonna grab the UDIM. And for normal maps, because there is color information, it's just not used as color per se, like we never need to look at it. We just say utility raw. So it's whatever that happened to be made in. It's, we're not doing any other profiles. We're just taking the image as is and not doing anything else to it. So technically you could embed a color profile into a normal map and that would screw you up, but probably, you probably haven't done that. And you probably use something like substance designer or substance painter or something. And that will export everything properly. So raw is usually what we do there. Okay, right. So that was kind of convoluted, but uh, let's go to our other materials. I'm probably going to speed this part up because it's literally the same process and it's a little bit lengthy. So, um, but there's a couple of things I wanted to show you. If you want to do those things a little bit more quickly inside the Hypershade, you can click the tab key. The tab key opens up a little file search dialog and you can just do file and then you can say file texture it automatically creates that for you which is really nice if you wanted to plug in something like uh your diffuse and by default i don't know why this is all shortened but you can grab the full list just by clicking these little buttons there and then we can go to our diffuse color or it's actually just called colors the, the node color here if you open this up it's diffuse color there but we can just say hey out color goes to color right there and then we can load in our color map for, and this is going to be for our Greebles. This is a much shorter UDIM, but it's a UDIM nonetheless. We still have to add in the UDIM tag. And then we have to do the same thing. And I forgot to name some of these files here. So this is going to be Greebles color. And I know this is kind of annoying, but we should do this here as well. So. Grab this, paste this here, and then this is going to be roughness. Normal, and then just to keep the same convention, I'm just going to call this color. Cool. Graph network, and then we can, and then we can do the same thing. So file, texture. Grab the roughness. Once again, need that UDIM tag. Color space, raw. And then for this, I'm going to say alpha is luminance. Plug in the alpha into reflection glossiness, but remember we need to switch this from glossiness to roughness right here. This changes for whatever reason, this does not. Don't worry about it, it's fine. And next, we got to do the same thing for our normals. So we got to grab another file here. We're going to do out color into our bump, and we need to tell VRA that this is not a bump map, it is a normal map, so it handles it properly inside that node or you can just click here these kind of work hand in hand but whichever one you prefer like you can do literally everything you want to right here but it is nice to use this sometimes it's more convenient and you will of course need it for the color space to select which one to use but this one is going to be raw and then we're going to grab our rebel here and by the, well, by the way just i want to show you that Anytime that you replace an image, by default, Maya will just go, oh, you changed your file, let me change the color space. It's like, thanks, Maya. So it is useful to create rules so you don't have to do that, but uh, that's what you have to do by default, which is kind of annoying. So, raw, right there. I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna copy and paste this name in here. This one's gonna be roughness. This one is, this one is going to be normal. We're going to close that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start rendering this. 
because I think it's easier to to create the glass while we can see what's happening. But for the rest of it, I, I we kind of wanted that information already on there, so we had something to look at. But uh, yeah, let's start rendering this. All right, guys, thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to continue with V-Ray materials, but we're also going to do some lighting as well with HDRIs and a V-Ray Sun and Sky system. All right, see you in the next video. Welcome back to part three of the Razor Crest series. And in this video, we're going to be going over HDRI lighting and V-Ray Sun and Sky systems. Now, in this video, we're also going to be going over some metalness and other material stuff. And as we progress through these tutorials, there will be some overlap and some back and forth between different topics. Uh, in the previous video, we were doing materials and there's going to be a little bit more of that to come as well. So as you work on materials, you do need to see what you're doing. So that is what this section is about. And if you're only interested in the dome lights or you're only interested in the sun and sky, check the chapter links below and you can just skip ahead to the part that you're interested in. All right, let's get started. Okay, so there are a few ways that we can start rendering. We can use dome lights. So I want to show you how to create HDR dome light stuff. Like if you were to use Marmoset, Marmoset is basically doing the same thing. Uh, Substance is doing the same thing. Anything that you can, you basically have like some kind of real-time view of the object and it's it's lit really nicely and like oh it looks so nice in substance why does it look like garbage in maya well let me show you how to do it in maya okay so we can click on the v-ray tab here or you can just go to create and you can grab your v-ray stuff from your lights section here v-ray lights uh but i kind of like this panel now i never used to but here we go i'm just going to use this and we can grab a dome light and by default the dome light is going to give you a pretty homogeneous like ambient light essentially it's not what an ambient light is though that is different in maya there is something called an ambient light which is an abomination and you should never use it so don't use that unless unless you know what you're doing basically so what we need to do is grab our v-ray frame buffer so the v-ray frame buffer you can access that and it's the same thing a frame buffer is the same thing as a render view so arnold calls it a render view and, and so does redshift but V-Ray is kind of old school, it calls it a frame buffer. And we can grab that directly by clicking this button here, or you can just click on where it says IPR here. Now the disadvantage of these, this one here is going to render like an entire sequence right away. So it's just gonna start rendering a whole sequence if you have that set in render settings. Uh, this one does not even work with V-Ray. This is the Maya render view. IPR also starts rendering right away, which you might not want. So if you want to just open up the V-Ray VFB, you can grab that right here, and this will open this little window. I will explain what these are when it's important, but for right now, we just want to click this little teapot, which is green. And if you get an error down here that says, the license could not be found, uh, this is what you do. So you open up a browser. You go to localhost colon 30304, enter, and this is the licenses that I have. So it will tell you what you have right here. Uh, I will give you a warning if you have a PLE version. I grabbed the PLE just to see what was up and make sure it still worked. So I don't have that currently installed. But you do have to manually renew this. So keep that in mind. If you downloaded this right at the very beginning of the semester, for example, you will uh, probably have to, well, in fact, you will certainly have to renew it before the end of class. And you can let it expire, it doesn't really matter, but uh, just be aware that one day you might go into to Maya and then try to render something and it'll give you an error. It's like, could not obtain license or something. Sometimes that can be caused by the license server not even running. So if this never even loaded for you, it's just a spinning spinning wheel or like a kind of 404 error or something like that. Uh, that means the license server is not even running. And to do that, you would have to go into Windows, go to your start menu and do that. I actually can't show you that on mine because I have a 4K display and I'm only capturing a small section of the screen just so the UI isn't so minute for you guys because I'm not scaling my entire UI every time that I, I want to do a video. Okay. If you need help with that, just let me know. But that is where you go just to check that everything is, is correct. Okay, so dome lights by default are going to be really, really flat, like a super cloudy day. 
not particularly attractive. So we can stop the IPR and then we could grab some kind of HDR image. So a really, really good site is going to be HDR Haven or this Poly Haven now, I guess. So Poly Haven. Uh, but they do have some really good HDRIs. So the HDRs here, they're all free and they're usually like massive. Some of these are like 16K and uh yeah they're really really useful so you can pick whatever you want but i'm going to do something that actually has some bright light in it like uh something that has it's not going to be lost in shadow so something like a desert this looks like it will be will be good and it kind of fits in with the theme now for the format here there's a couple different choices well actually a few on some of these you can do 1k 2k all the way up to 16k you really are probably fine with 4k unless you really want to zoom in on a surface and then see like super sharp reflections which you might need but uh, i don't think that we're at the point where 16k is required in or, or like beneficial really it's cool it's like a future-proof thing that i'm sure every everyone will be using 16k hdrs in a few years or something like that but for right now 4k is good 8k is good they're, they're going to be good. 8K if you need to see super sharp reflections, basically, but usually the surface is not going to be super sharp. So 4K is good. And then for the format, we have EXRs and HDRs. Take your pick. They're both going to be pretty much the same. Click download. I'm going to save the file. Then I'm going to grab that image. So I'm going to paste that in right here. And then I'm going to go back into Maya. And then to use that texture, we say use dome text with the dome light selected. So if you clicked off this and you're like, how do I get back? Just go to your outliner or select the light in the viewport, use dome text. And then on the dome text, we say file, image name, and then we're going to load that in. Okay, so to see how this looks, we're going to open up the V-Ray frame buffer. So there's a few different ways that we could open up the V-Ray frame buffer. We could click this little button here which opens up the V-Ray frame buffer here. You can also access that by just clicking one of these up here. This though will start a sequence if you have sequences enabled, so you might not want that. It can be like a final production render too. IPR automatically starts up the V-Ray IPR, which you might not want. So, and then this button right here doesn't actually open up the V-Ray IPR. It is just this button. So if you want to open this up and don't and not render it, you got to open up this right here. All right, so we're going to actually stop that, move this over. There's a couple of things we have to do here on the dome text. If I go back into our input here, by default, Maya will assume that an EXR file is going to be raw, but this is actually going to be very saturated. It's going to look a little bit incorrect, like too contrasty, or not contrasty per se, but the, the colors are too saturated. So usually HDRs and EXR files are actually going to be seen linear rec 709 srgb and when you change that you'll get a more realistic looking image here this does of course depend on how it was made but if we look back at the original image you can see this is the color of the sand this is what it's supposed to be and if we set that back to what maya thought it was supposed to be which is raw it looks very reddish that's because the color primaries are different with raw so it's not doing any kind of correction, but we do want to say, hey, this is supposed to be in sRGB space. So we're going to set it there. That's going to give us a more accurate render from the original. If you did want a richer color, you should go about it in a different way. You should just color correct that image with sRGB. Now, there are circumstances where you might be using an HDR that is actually raw. It just depends. Okay, so this is a little dark. So what we're going to do, go to our dome light and then we can just crank up the intensity. And you might have to do this quite a bit. So, well, that's that's way too bright. Uh, let's do something like eight or uh, I don't know, something kind of like this. Now, something that is really, really useful about the new version of Maya is that it uses ACES color. So ACES color is a color profile system that allows interchange between lots of different types of cameras. So really, really briefly, I, I want to explain this in more depth, but uh, it, it can get really technical, but really briefly. 
So when you're doing color corrections for film and every you have lots of different cameras, well, every camera interprets color slightly differently, but it can mean that if you're trying to take two shots and make them look the same, like as if they were shot on the same camera, it can be actually a little bit tricky to do. So ASUS originally was set up as a way to allow you to basically just pick the camera that it was used on and then say which kind of format or color profile you want it to go to and it will just adjust all the colors for you and it doesn't matter what the source is if the camera company wants to make a profile for it they'll take that profile and automatically convert it to srgb or rec 709 or whatever color space you're working in and make sure it looks almost exactly the same okay but for 3d it actually became very useful because it also allows for tone mapping so you can never have a value that's going to clip, which I explained in the previous lecture. You can't have values that go over one with ACES SDR mode. So it's, SDR just stands for standard dynamic range. Sometimes it's also referred to LDR, which is low dynamic range. But uh, that sounds bad. So I guess SDR is what they went with. HDR is high dynamic range, which on that survey, by the way, a few of you said that HDRs were something completely different. This means high dynamic range, SDR or LDR, low dynamic range or standard dynamic range. So basically sRGB 8-bit. So this is great that you can say, hey, I want the intensity of this to be like white, but it's never gonna completely blow out really. The, the values here are always gonna be one for the, the hotspots. Okay, obviously we don't wanna go that crazy with it, but we do need to, to bump it up because by default it's way too dim. We do want to make that a bit brighter so we get some uh some bounce light so maybe value of four is okay maybe maybe five it just depends but aces is going to give you a really nice natural look so it might even be a little bit too bright but hey you can you can correct that later so over here if that's exposing too much like an actual camera would we could just lower that value change our exposure exposure and, and do stuff like that so right now that's just how you get an hdr in there uh, we don't have any reflections though, so I want to show you reflections. And by default with V-Ray, it doesn't give you any reflection value. So for this next part, I find it a little bit cumbersome to have the V-Ray VFB open. So I'm going to just stop this. If you have trouble with this next part, go back to just using this. This is good. But we're going to do it in the viewport for a lot, a lot of this lecture. So I'm going to click on the little V icon here. This is going to basically do the same thing, but in the viewport where we can navigate around. And if you've ever used Unreal, this is really close to how Unreal is, but it's not quite as fast, but the quality is definitely, is very good. Okay. And I think there's a future in which you might not need Unreal to do renderings. Like if, if you can do it all in Maya, but it's all real time, kind of what, what Redshift is trying to achieve with their Redshift RT. I think this is going to be really, really cool. Anyway, we don't have any reflections, so we need to change that. So we can just select this, and it's great that you can see it in the viewport too, which is, which is good. But by default, the reflection color is black, and that's, that's incorrect. It needs to be something... For PBR, it needs to be 100% white. Now, there are workflows where you could set this so it's not 100% white, but then you're not using PBR anymore. So you got to pick the workflow you want. In this class, I want you to use PBR so you understand it. It is probably something that a job would want you to be able to do. So you on a job application, they're going to be like, oh, you need to be able to use PBR, the PBR workflow or PBR surfacing or whatever. So you need to understand that. Uh, one other thing about ASUS is that because it is color correcting the swatches. It looks gray to you, but uh, if we turn off color management, you can see it's actually, it is white, but uh, we wanna have color management on. It's gonna appear gray just because it's color correcting everything. So that's one slight annoyance with using ASUS is that it does make this a little bit awkward. Uh, you can also, if I turn off the V-Ray frame buffer here, uh, you can change this to untone mapped sRGB if everything gets too dark. But uh, as you can see, untone map means that it's going to be way too, too bright there. This is what the HDR would look like if we didn't have ASUS on, by the way. Like for the tone mapping part of it, it's super bright and clipped out. But with the tone mapping, 
it gives a really nice curve to fill in uh, basically what your eye would see and what a camera would see for the most part. Okay, so back to V-Ray. So with reflections on, we have a much, much nicer looking image there. Okay, cool. So for this next part, I need to show you metalness. So metalness is kind of a, a confusing thing, I think. Uh, metalness basically means, is the object metal or is it not metal? And it's really not that difficult, but there's a lot of things that go wrong when you start doing bad things with metalness. And part of the reason is you have a slider. So you can start sliding up your metalness and be like, oh yeah, this is 25% metal or 30% metal or, or, or whatever, like 80% uh, metal. And that's wrong. That's, that's not PBR compliant. So PBR says it's either metal or it is not metal. You have zero or one. It cannot be anything else. It cannot be 0.1. It cannot be 0.99. It has to be zero or one. Because it is a binary operation, it is like, it, is it on or is it not? And if it's not, it does this weird curve where it's not doing anything that's physically accurate. So basically, the reason why there's a slider is because there are parts of the geometry or parts of the texture that might be metal and parts that might not be metal on the same UV set or the same texture map. There was a, a question, by the way, on the surveys before I forget, the very first day. So I asked a few things. So quick, just a quick refresher. Is this image good for a metal mess map? And most of you said yes, but really it's not. A few of you said, nah, it, that looks like a roughness map. And you'd be correct. This could be used as a roughness or a bump or a displacement or something. Can't really be metalness. Why? Well, there's grayscale values. Metalness is black or white. Okay, so that, that's, that's what you need to use. And by the way, I'll, I see this all the time. If you grab some kind of PBR texture or you, you're exporting something from Substance Painter or Designer and you get a black, a pitch black metalness map, meaning that nothing on your object is metal, please don't load that in because you're wasting resources doing that. Like Maya has to load that and, and do something with it. If it's just pitch black, leave the value as zero. If it's 100% metal, there's nothing else on the surface at all, don't, don't put in a pure white map. It, it's pointless, okay? The only reason you might wanna do that is if you're packing all your materials into like a single texture, but uh, you still wouldn't ever have to hook up that node. So just, the, you don't need to worry about pure black or pure white metalness maps. Just use a value of zero or one. So for that, we actually do get a metalness map texture. So if we go back to our RC textures here, and then we look at the metalness one, there are basically two values. We have black, and then you have white. Now, there are a few complaints that I have with this, that there are some grayscale values here. A couple values are technically acceptable with PBR, and when you're doing like fringes or edges, the value might get shifted a little bit just with gradients. But uh, you really want to avoid having gray values. So this would be okay. This is pretty good. Um, the ones that are bad are things like this. Like this is not metalness. I'm sorry, but like th this is this is not. It needs to be black and white. So these things are things that we would probably want to go and correct later. I'm gonna load these in as is. And it looks okay. It looks it looks fine. But just keep in mind if you are creating a texture and your metalness map comes out in grayscale and it's not just black or white like it really should just be a mask black or white on or off you probably need to go back and adjust it or fix something okay so in this case i think maybe there was some kind of opacity that was being used and it was it just didn't output properly but i see this all the time even professionally so substance has a really useful guide if you're interested i can show you where that is so if you just type in substance pbr there's a pbr guide part one and part two and they do explain how to use metalness and what metalness is supposed to be with a lot more depth than what i'm going to explain uh, but they have a really useful image here this is what your metalness should look like so people say that oh well what about if it's rusty or something well for the parts that are rusty then it's not metal anymore so you just say that it's corroded so it's not metal anymore things that are also not metal are metal that is painted or metal that is dirty. 
So if you have anything that's covering just the base metal, the raw metal, it is not considered metalness anymore as far as PBR is concerned. It's just the raw metal. Okay. So for this, we actually do have raw metal. So we want to use that. I'm going to just toggle this on and off again so you can see what it does to the, the overall value. So this looks really shiny and really cool. I like it. But there are parts that don't really make as much sense. So if this was not metal, it would look very diffuse. Diffuse is like how the light just kind of falls over it, kind of spreads out over it. So it's pretty diffuse. But with metalness, it's going to be very, very reflective. Okay. And it's not going to use your diffuse color at that point. It's just going to reflect everything. But there are parts that we do need to have that, that dirt or that, those scratches or paint or whatever. So for those areas, that's what we need the metalness map for. So we can load that in, no problem. So we can grab our metalness map, go to file. And by default, it's going to say, hey, it's, it, there's nothing there. It's just black. There's not metal anywhere. We can grab. So we can grab our metalness map from here. Same thing as always. This is something that you just have to know for UDIMs. If you see a number at the end and you have more than one texture, that's a UDIM. And when we load that in, by default, the color space is going to be wrong. We just say utility raw. And then we would need to do the same thing for the greebles as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn off the V-Ray view there just as we're messing around with this. It can just slow everything down. And uh, on, if you have a older computer, it could end up crashing. So just bear that in mind. So save often. Metalness there, I'm also going to say alpha is luminance. And uh, for our greebles, I'm going to do the same thing. This time I'll show you this one again. Tab, file, texture. I'm going to name this first this time. Metalness. Greeble metalness. Grab this. Udim. Change our color space right there. Alpha is luminance. And then another cool thing that you can do, if you have your main material selected over here in your attribute editor, you can go to your metalness here or whatever channel you're trying to do, and then just middle mouse click and drag that node right there. And then release, and that will automatically hook it up. That's a really useful method of doing that as well. So whichever method you prefer is good with me. OK, so now if we turn our V-Ray view back on, you can see that those greebles are now added. OK, so now this is actually very, very bright now that we have all that metal. So we might want to go back to our light and then just tone that down a little bit and, and just get a slightly different view. There's also another type of lighting that I'd like to show you, and that's just using a V-Ray sun and sky. But I think it's probably more common that you'll be using HDRs. And you do need to know how to use them, uh, how to use them properly. So I hope that was a useful guide there. If you have any questions on that, definitely let me know. But the one, one other thing I wanted to show you, so if I select the dome light here and I try to rotate it, it doesn't rotate. You're like, what? This is really dumb, actually, that V-Ray doesn't let you rotate the dome lights uh, because render engines like, like Redshift, for example, do allow this. And it makes sense that you should be able to rotate that node. So to rotate this in V-Ray, what you got to do, you got to go to the dome text, and then there's a placement node, a V-Ray place environment texture node right here. Uh, don't know what that means. Don't, don't worry about that. Uh, but basically, you have a horizontal rotation. So you can rotate this around this way. And you have a vertical rotation. You can do it like this. OK, so that's how you do that. That's a common question that you might get if you can get like frustrated with like, why, why can't I move this? Well, that's why. Okay. Right. So I'm going to turn this off and then I'm going to d just delete it. I don't care about that anymore. That can go. If I go back to VRite right, right here, you can see that everything is gone. There's no longer a default light anymore. It'll just say, Hey, there's no lights and it won't even give you anything. So it's just black. 
So next, I want to show you the sunlight. So we can say V-Ray Sun, create sun. And this will give us a little sun right here. Cool. Turn this back on. And this is not going to give us any type of environment. So we're going to have our like shadows be pitch black. But this is going to allow us to just rotate around here and then just have a look at what's going on. Okay, so to actually get some GI essentially, what we need to do is go into our render settings. And if you go to overrides, environment, you can create your sun this way. And you can also create a sky. So you create sky and this will create a V-Ray sky. Now, because the V-Ray sky is so absurdly bright, we have to create a view for our camera that is a physical camera node basically for our camera. So we don't actually have to create a camera. By default, in Maya, any viewport camera is a camera, fully functional. So if you select this button right here, you can grab your camera or you can just do perspective. I recommend that you do this on perspective and any other camera that you have, just so if you render from different views, it, it, you can actually use it. It's not like so blown out unusable. And then the way you access the physical attributes, you go to attributes, V-Ray, physical camera. When you do that, then you will get a physically accurate camera and all the different things like your aperture, your ISO, all, all sorts of stuff. Okay. So it's pretty useful. All right. So next we need to grab our sun transform and I need to zoom out here. And on this, actually, I'm, I'm going to need another view for this. So I'm going to just click the space bar and go to a different view so you can kind of line this up. Uh, or what you can do, this is kind of useful, right click over this menu and then say two planes side by side. So you can get one view here and then you can get like a perspective, a new perspective view. I can say new perspective. I can drag this wherever I want. I can do that over there or get like a nice reflection, something kind of like that. Sometimes it's easier than having to zoom out and do it this way because not all the uh, lines show up. Okay, so this looks pretty nice. We get some nice reflections going on there. Um, and then also you should be able to see your, your normal map. If you zoom all the way in, you can see like little, little cuts there. Uh, these are the highest resolution textures. So there are areas where it looks a little bit, a little bit questionable if you get too close, but it's fine from the distance that we need. Okay. Uh, one thing I did forget to do though, on the greebles, if I select the greebles there, go into the material, I forgot to change the reflection color there. So they're white. So that's that's very important. And uh, next we got to do the glass. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. In the next part we're gonna finish up with V-Ray materials, and we're gonna go over glass. All right. See you guys in the next video. All right. Welcome back to part four of the Razor Crest series. Now we're gonna be going over V-Ray glass. This is the last part of the Razor Crest ship model that we haven't surfaced yet. And uh, there's quite a few settings to go over for glass. Now this is not specific to cockpit glass or ship glass, works for pretty much any type of glass. So if you are interested in learning about V-Ray materials, then let's get started. All right, so select the glass and to create glass in V-Ray, there's a few things that we need to do. First of all, glass doesn't have any diffuse color. This is black, so we can change that to black. And the reflection color is always going to be 100% white because that's PBR. That's the that's the rule with PBR. And because we're using the metalness roughness workflow, we don't need glossiness. So we're going to say roughness. And then there actually is a map for this for roughness, I believe. We go into our textures slot. And I believe for the glass, there's a, there's just one here. So technically we don't even need to use in this. It's just one. So we can just say that and we can just leave that number. It's fine. And when we do that, you can see that now there's like little scratches on the glass, which is pretty cool. Now, just to show you the difference now between roughness and glossiness, if I were to switch this, well, now this is interpreting this image completely in the opposite direction. So for example, if I go back here and I open up this image, 
anything that is black with glossiness means it's not going to be glossy. It's going to be a very diffuse reflection, very spread out, like a matte finish. And then all the white areas are going to be super bright. And to me, honestly, glossiness makes more sense than using roughness just because I'm more used to seeing things like reflection maps and specular maps and things like that. The types of maps that you don't usually use specular maps, I think, anymore. It just makes more sense to me and it might make more sense to you. It just depends. If you've kind of grown up with roughness, that's fine. So what roughness says is we click roughness on and then we say, all right, anywhere where it's white now, that's where it's rough. And anywhere that is black, it's going to be not rough. So this is the opposite. So that's what the differences are. So these scratches here, these little bits in the glass, these are considered rough. So like little, little bits of dirt and specks and stuff going to be rough like that. So we get a nice, nice reflection. Okay, so there's other things we can do like the Fresnel. So if we turn off Fresnel, by the way, you get some like really bad looking. I mean, there are cases where you don't want a Fresnel reflection, depending on your material. So we do want that fall off, which is it's driven basically by the IOR value, the index of refraction. So you can lock this value right here, or you can unlock it, and then you can go to town with some other types of effects. So there are cases, especially with glass, that sometimes is pretty tricky to use without changing settings or using IOR and things like that. And the, you can grab IOR maps, but IOR is like really tricky to get right and understand. So usually V-Ray just says 1.6 and that's everything. So you can go and if you have never done this, you can look up like IOR values. And you can get things like, oh, oh I want acrylic gr glass. What is the what is the IOR value of all this stuff? And for the most part, most materials have a very, very similar IOR value. So it really just depends on what you want. Sometimes you can play with this to match some kind of real life shot that you're trying to trying to get. Um, if you go to zero, you basically are like saying there's no Fresnel at all. And Close to zero, you're kind of doing the same thing. It's a dimmer. And then at one, everything is absolutely black. It's just pitch black. So I'm not going to get into the science behind that. To be honest, I would have to look that up myself. But usually we just lock that. There are cases where we might want to unlock it to make the highlight a little bit larger and things like that. Also for reflection, there are different types. There's things like Fong. So see how this changes the highlight is a lot sharper there. This blin, pretty common one. Ward. Ward is very nice for like plain metal or it, it can be. It can for very, very nice softer metals or like a painted surface. It can, it, it can be, it can be very nice. For things like glass though, the GGX is, is very similar to blin, but it's a little bit more natural looking and it usually gets better reflections, sharper reflections. So we're just going to leave it on GGX. They're just different methods of doing what is called the BRDF. So if you want to get really involved with it, there's resources online, uh, Substance. They have a good guide on all of this stuff if you're interested. And you always have to make sure your reflection color is 100% white. You can't have like, if you're doing PBR, you can't have a little bit of reflections. And you also, unfortunately, can't do things like red. Like that's not PBR compliant. Now, if you're just trying to make some weird, wacky looking material, I mean, it's what looks good. That's the ultimate reality of, of all things CG. If it looks good, you've won, okay? And you did a good job. But try to follow the workflows for the most part. Occasionally, you can bend the rules. And PBR, as I said, is one specific workflow. It is not the only workflow. So there are ways and reasons why you might need to do things like that. So that's why the option is available. Uh, metalness, though, you, you should never have like partially metal objects. It just makes sense. But I think also there is a there is a normal map that comes with this to actually get surfaces on here. So for surfaces, we need to change this to normal map, grab our map, and then go to file, load in that image. And I believe this is just a singular map as well. Grab that. This is going to be utility raw. 
And, and notice if I leave this on sRGB, the normal map is wrong. It's not what you saw in substance, for example. So changing that to raw kind of shows you that it's right. Um, next, how do we actually make this transparent? Good question. So we have a refraction channel here. So refraction is light that passes through a surface. Reflection is light that bounces off a surface. So we can crank that up and you can see. I think I need to change the light orientation here. Uh, let me grab this. Actually, I'm going to go back to my other view just so I can see that line a little bit more clearly. And uh, I'll just move that there. Yeah, unfortunately, the V-Ray viewport IPR sometimes doesn't update or doesn't let you get out of it unless you stop it. So that's why I just did that. Uh, this might be a better view to, to see this part. But there's also uh, this annoying feature. Hey, see how you zoom in? It gets darker and darker and darker. Uh, that's the auto exposure at work on the camera. Let me show you how to fix that. So we click our camera. And I realized I never actually showed you where the V-Ray extra attributes were that we added earlier. Uh, we've got to go down here to extra V-Ray attributes. And uh, by default, when you add your V-Ray extra attributes, it adds a node here. So it was super bright if this is not on, but when you add that, it automatically checks that. And then you get things like your, your aperture and your uh, ISO and shutter speeds and stuff like that. So as we zoom in, it's, it's kind of dumb. Uh, you can do what is called specifying your focus and specifying the focus allows you to zoom in usually and it's fine. Uh, it's kind of annoying that you do that. This is also used for depth of field, but uh, we're good. Let's turn that on if you want to be able to zoom in and not have issues. Uh, you can also do things like, hey, I want to increase the the camera sensors sensitivity to light. So you can be like, whoa, I can make that way brighter. Uh, usually cameras actually do have like an ISO of like 400, just as like native. But then on the, your F number, you can increase your F number. You can decrease that. And there's also usually exposure controls. So you can say, hey, I don't want to, I don't want it to determine it. I want to determine it. And I want to have my exposure value is this notch. So like 13, like on a camera, you'd have like a, a exposure notch. So something like that. This is all, it can get a little bit convoluted and not particularly important for what we need. All of these things though, if you are interested in photography, you can use these and they're pretty accurate to what a camera would do with the exception of there's not going to be film grain. So usually with a camera, the darker your image, you if you have like a super high ISO, it would make your image super grainy. It's not replicated here because you almost never want that. So yeah, you wouldn't be able to make your, your footage look awful, basically. Okay, so I kind of got sidetracked there. Uh, we're talking about glass. So for the glass here, uh, let's select this and then some other things that are useful. So there is an option here for your IOR. So depending on how much light you want to pass through it, you can lower your IOR to so something like 1.1 or like 1.01 to let some stuff pass through. And you can see how it distorts the image. Uh, that's not really going to be like what most glass is going to be though. So if you want to look up the IOR of like actual glass, I think it's a value of like 1.57 or something. You can just type in on this IOR index list glass 1.5. Okay. 1.5. If you wanted to be super accurate with it. Cool. This glass looks a little bit awkward because of this, the shape and I guess the thickness too. So this is dependent on the thickness of the geometry that we have. So if we solo that, so just control one to solo that, and you can see that there really is no thickness on this glass at all. So that's kind of a problem, to be honest. That's, um, that's not correct. We, we really would want to have a little bit of thickness for this to work. You could extrude it backwards and then invert everything, which is probably the, probably the easiest thing to do. So we could do control E. This is going to extrude everything and we just pull that in a little bit. So something like that. 
And you can see now this actually has thickness. But this has flipped our normal, so we got to go to Mesh Display, Reverse. And now this would be correct. If we go back to V-Ray, we can now see the glasses accurate. So with that other way, what we could have done is just say thin walled. So thin walled means is basically just one, one plane, and that's going to give us much better results. Uh, thin walled though is, is only for that feature. It's really not for doing anything else. So the thickness is very important when you start using IOR. So if I uh, turn this off, make this even thicker, just make this like ridiculous, just, just for education purposes. And then look at this, you can see how like ridiculously distorted everything is and it's going through all that layer of glass and it looks very, very weird. Okay, with all the different bending that's going on. I'm gonna control Z that, put it back. So if you don't have any thickness at all, you, you have to say thin walled, otherwise this is not gonna look correct. And of course you can play around with your IOR. Certain types of glass will have different IOR refractions. Uh, you can do some kind of weird, <laughs> that looks kind of, kind of weird. Uh, but by default, usually it's like 1.5, which looks fine. Now, if you wanted to tint the glass, there is an option here under translucency. The translucency is a little bit, a little bit awkward to explain. I mean, it's usually for subsurface scattering, which is light that goes through a surface. Uh, different to a refraction, though. It's like it's how the light like diffuses underneath, like the skin, for example. Uh, so that's what translucency generally is. If you wanted to change the tint, you can do something like red. But for anything else, if it's like black, for instance. Um, your fog color is, is it's going to be like really sensitive and it's going to usually just fill everything in. You don't have that much range to play with here. Uh, so what I usually do for this is to go up to basically the refraction color and just tint this. This gives you far more control and technically, no, it's not, you're kind of breaking the rules a little bit, but we're just dimming all the light that's coming through. Technically, that's not the same thing as just having you know, tinted glass, but it makes it look a lot better. And it's way easier to control than just the fog color of the interior of the glass. So whatever. Okay, that's fine. So if you wanted this to be really, 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 really tinted, that's going to look pretty good. Okay. But when you think of it, though, light passing through tinted windows is not going to be as bright. So that's fine. Okay. Uh, right. Next. Couple other things. There is also on this refraction glossiness. Uh, refraction, by the way, in V-Ray does use what is called glossiness. It doesn't use roughness. So just bear that in mind. So if you have a refraction glossiness map, you would want to uh, change that. So you could use the same image here, the reflection roughness, invert that, pass that through into a refraction glossiness. That's fine. For the most part, though, um, if I increase the refraction color here. And then I decided, hey, I want this to be a little bit frosty, the glass to be frosty. Just lower your reflect, reflection glossiness and boom, you get you get a, like a really blurry looking glass. So that's pretty cool too. That's how you would get frosted glass, for instance. And if you wanted frosting only around the section, that's why you would have a map on there, a texture map. If you want to like super diffuse textures, more like a lampshade, you would have like really, really diffuse glossiness like that. Uh, glass though is like 99% glossiness for refraction. So that's basically what we're going to do there. Cool. Okay. Uh, I need to just lower that just a little bit, make that a little bit dimmer, but that's, that's up to you. And there you go. Cool. I'm not really looking at the references of the real thing, but I just wanted to show you some of the materials. Okay, so I hope that makes sense for the material part of this. Now what we got to do is start talking about passes. And passes go hand in hand with your materials. So we're going to break this video up into other parts. In the next part, we're going to talk about passes. And then as we progress, we'll talk about render layers. So I highly recommend you play around with this. See what happens when you, you change certain certain things like if you decide that oh hey I don't want 
my mentalness anymore. And you can break the connection. Like, w what happens to my material? Like, what does that look like if I go back to something that's not metal anymore? Like, maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want to coat the razor crest in paint. But uh, for the most part, though, I do want you to, to to get an image that looks very much like this, uh, with all of your your nice highlights and 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 you have all that detail in the normal map and then the roughness map as well so hopefully this was a review for the most part maybe you learned something new about v-ray if you haven't used v-ray before all of this is applicable to any type of render engine so redshift arnold if any of you do you want to use redshift or arnold for this and really just don't want to use v-ray i am totally cool with that as long as you are resourceful enough to figure out the differences but uh, I, I would like you to use V-Ray to say you, you learned something, okay? But if you want to just learn more about whatever your favorite render engine is, I don't really care. Foundations are the same. Anyway, so the next part, what we're going to do, we're going to take like a, a render of this in the V-Ray frame buffer. I'm going to explain all the different parts of the, the frame buffer and what they're for and what they do. We're going to take that into After Effects, composite that, and basically replicate the same thing that we got through the V-Ray frame buffer, but by extracting all the different passes. So that's going to be the next part of the video. And then after that, what we're going to do is start making an actual scene. So this one went on for a pretty long time, but if this was an actual in-class session, this would probably be the full three hours. So hopefully this is a little bit faster, but I know you have to stop and, and start things as you as you work your way through it. Have fun playing around with this. This is very important to understand if you want to do 3D visual effects or 3D graphics or any type of CG stuff. It is important that you understand how to get to this point to do, to do lighting and stuff. So we barely scratched the surface of lighting, uh, but using a sun and sky, using an HDR, hopefully that was useful. So as always, let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in the next video. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions of what we've covered so far, please leave a comment on any one of the videos or post on the Discord server, and I would be happy to help. All right, see you guys in the next video. Now we need to talk about how to set up After Effects for Asus. So as we progress through this tutorial series, we're going to be going back and forth between Maya and After Effects. And as of Maya 2022, the default color profile is Asus CG. And while Asus CG is a far better profile to use than sRGB, it does present a problem if we are using After Effects. So currently there's no native way in After Effects to view Asus CG, but in order to view our render properly, we're going to have to use a plugin. So admittedly, this is a little bit of a clunky workflow because there's no built-in way of doing this in After Effects, but luckily there is a plugin that we can use, and that's what we're going to be going over in this tutorial. I also want to show you what I think is the best way of viewing Asus CG renders inside of After Effects, which involves leaving the default After Effects color management settings on. I'll explain why that is, and I'll explain how to do that in this video. Right, let's get started. All right, so this is going to be a quick video for installing the Open Color IO plugin for After Effects. But before we do that, I wanted to explain why we need it. So here I have just a render of the Razor Crest with that HDR again. And this is what the image is supposed to look like. So this is using, if you select in the V-Ray frame buffer, your display correction, you should see the OCIO, which is open color IO, and ACES CG is the color space. And this is what this is up here. So when we save this out of Maya, we actually don't save the display correction. So all images coming from Maya are going to be in a linear format. So they're not going to have that gamma correction embedded in it. So this is just so we can see it. But to maintain the linear workflow, we need to save this out as linear, and then After Effects needs to take in this image and then display its own display correction. So we need to make sure that After Effects can use the same profile, which is the ACES CG and then the view transform right here. So by default, After Effects does not have this functionality. I'm sure it will get it eventually, but right now we have to use a plugin for it. So just to demonstrate this as we go along, I'm going to save this render. I'll just call this a Razor Crest test. Click save. And then we can go back to After Effects. So inside After Effects, we're going to double click our project space, go into the Razor Crest test, double click this. And we need to set up our composition. So once again, we're going to select 
8 BPC. Make sure this is set to 32 bits per channel. And it's vital that you linearize. This absolutely has to be on or this, these next steps are not going to work properly. So just make sure it's linear because we are giving After Effects linear files from Maya. So we have to make sure that we're working in a linear space. Okay, so if we were to click and drag this down here to make a new composition, you can see that the image that we get looks absolutely nothing like the image that we saw in Maya. So we saw this really nice image here. The shadows are a lot darker and it doesn't look so washed out. The highlights are also, they're nice, they're not clipped. So inside of Maya here, if we go to our info tab, we can hover over these values and you can see that these RGB values are going way over one. So they are clipped, it looks really bad. The shadows are way too bright. Just overall, this is, you can't work with this image. It's not correct. This is because After Effects isn't expecting this in sRGB space, but really we rendered in ASUS CG space. Okay, so what we need is the open color IO plugin for After Effects. So you can just type in After Effects OCIO plugin and go to fnordware.blogspot.com. Okay, so we're gonna grab the Windows version and then I'm gonna save file. All right, so if I go to my downloads folder here, we're gonna take this open color IO AE, right click, we're gonna do extract all, extract. And inside this, there's gonna be a manual. If you wanna grab the manual, you can, but we really only need this AEX file. This is the plugin file. And then we just need to copy this. You can either cut it or copy it. Next, we're going to navigate to our program files. So we're gonna to go to C, Program Files, Adobe, After Effects, Support Files, Plugins, and then we're just gonna paste it right here. You would just say paste. I already have the plugin installed, so I don't need to do that, but you would just click paste and it would go right there. And then you wanna launch After Effects. So if you have After Effects open already, you would wanna restart it, then open it back up again. So let's assume that you've already restarted After Effects. Inside the effects and presets, you're gonna look for an effect called Open Color IO. This is the name of the effect. And then the way that we apply this, right click down here, go to new adjustment layer, click enter to name it. Let's call this OCIO. We can click and drag the effect over here to OCIO. And then it's going to request a configuration file. There are lots of different profiles for open color IO. It's not just for ACES CG. There's lots of different ones, especially when you start using different footage from cameras. And there's a whole heap of reasons why you would use open color IO. It's not just for rendering from Maya, but we can use this to grab the ACES CG profile. And in doing that, we need to grab the configuration file. So Maya provides a configuration file for us. So we're going to click on custom. And to find the configuration file location, we go back into Maya. And the easy way to do that in Maya is to go back to the V-Ray frame buffer, go to display correction, and then on the OCIO file right here, click on the little folder icon and select this path up here. Do control C to copy. Go back to After Effects, paste that path in, click enter, and then we can grab the OCIO config here. So this file contains a whole bunch of different conversions for different cameras, different color spaces. So what we're going to do, we're going to do, instead of convert, we're going to be on display. So I'm going to select display. Now for the input space, what we have to do is go to scene linear, ACES CG, and then the display would be set to sRGB. That's correct. And then the view is set to ACES 1.0 SDR video. This matches exactly what Maya's is right here and what the color space input display device input and the view transform is inside of V-Ray. Now, here's one other problem. After Effects by default will color manage your entire composition for you and it's expecting this to be in linear space. But because of the open color IO config, it is actually doing all the gamma correction for you so After Effects, after it sees this, still thinks that this is in the wrong gamma and will gamma correct it again. So in order to fix that, what we're gonna do is type in color profile converter. We're gonna grab this. We click and drag this underneath the open color IO. 
So on the color profile converter on the input profile, I'm going to go up to sRGB. You can see it changed there. And then on the output profile, we're going to say sRGB again. And then we're going to linearize the output like this. So let me show you what we've just done. So by default, After Effects assumes the image is going to be linear. And because of that, it thinks it's been really helpful by applying an inverse gamma curve. However, the OCI plugin also adds a curve as well. So when you have two curves, you get a double correction like this. So now the image is way too bright. So if I go back to After Effects here, and I turn off this color profile converter, it's way too bright. And that's because there's an extra gamma curve that's been applied. So with the color profile converter, we're simply adding an inverse curve to that. So what this gamma curve does is it basically just cancels out one of these and then you don't get a double correction. So it's going through back and forth like all of these different corrections to go back and forth. And then at the end, we get a gamma that is correct for final output. All right, so I hope that makes sense. You have to have that plugin in order to view your renders properly. So that is a requirement. So if you have any questions on the installation of that or why we're doing what we're doing, just let me know and I can clarify it for you. All right, I hope that quick explanation of ASUS and how to set this up in After Effects was useful. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, welcome back to part six of the Razor Crest series. In this video, we're going to be going over the V-Ray frame buffer. So this will be everything you need to get started. We're not going to talk about the light mix or the composite features. Those are really amazing features, but they're too long for this video. But I'll be showing you just about everything else. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. So in the first part of the lecture, I kind of left off with the same file. If I select the viewport IPR for V-Ray, we can just get a quick preview of where we left off. So we had everything surfaced. We put all our textures there, created materials, and then we had a sunlight system. This viewport IPR is really nice, but a lot of times you actually want a bit more control. So this is really good. You can manipulate stuff and you can get real-time feedback or close to real-time feedback. But if you want to compare images or you want to save your file or make adjustments, that's when the V-Ray frame buffer is very handy. So I'm going to be on my V-Ray tab here. If you don't see a V-Ray shelf, it doesn't matter. You can just click on V-Ray up here and then say show V-Ray VFB, V-Ray frame buffer, or you can just click this little icon here. And we briefly used this last time, but now I want to explain a few more things that you can do with it. So let's just start the IPR, the little teapot icon there. And there's some really useful things that you can do. The, the first thing, let's start on the left hand side and then we'll work our way across. So the first thing here is history. So if you don't see your history, you can go up to options, VFB settings. Then go all the way over to history and you want to enable history. And then for the location, it's more convenient usually just to use your project path. So just select that. And then there's a whole heap of other options that you can do. So if you click show advanced settings, there's very specific things that you can do. It's not particularly important for what we need though. The only thing that we really need is to make sure that it is enabled. So then you, uh, you click save and close, but I didn't really save anything because I already have it. So this is a common feature in most frame buffers or render views. And that is to save a snapshot or save history. The so V-Ray calls this history. So you can simply click this little button here. And then you can do something else. So for example, let's say I'm just going to move this down here and I want to grab my sun and then I want to just make it a little bit brighter. So I'll, I'll say like that. So I just doubled the intensity and maybe I wanted to change the sky model too. I wanted to do improved instead. So if I wanted to compare what both of those were, I can click history again on the second one. Then I can stop the IPR. It's always safer if you're going to be doing a lot of operations to stop the IPR because it does require your computer to, you know, be processing any change. So if you don't want to make any other change, just click the stop. You can also click the pause button. So when this is not play, it'll be set to pause. And then when I click stop, by default, it will always save another view. So one of the other things you can do on history is delete history. So you can delete a frame that way. So I just wanted to use these two right here. So to view another 
frame, you just double click it and then you can see it. Double click the newest one and you can see the newest one. But if you want to compare them though, you can select this little A, B button. You can click A, which is going to be your first one. And then you select whichever other one you want to compare it with. So you could have an entire stack here of lots of different images. So here I only have two, but I can click B. And then on the A, B, if we, if we hold this down, you can do A, B horizontal, vertical, or you can do four different ones if you had four. But let's just do horizontal. And then it, you get this little slider and you can simply drag the slider across and then compare specific parts of the frame to the other version. So B is going to be on this side and A is going to be on this side. And it's a really useful feature. For navigating the V-Ray frame buffer, if you hold down the middle mouse button and click and drag, which is a little bit unusual because by default in Maya, you have to hold down the alt button. But V-Ray's like primary DCC is 3ds Max. And in 3ds Max, you have to hold down the middle mouse button to navigate. But just get used to it. It's, it's fine to, to go back and forth between them. Now let's say that you've zoomed in on something and you want to see your full view. You can click the F button to focus, which is the same thing as focusing in Maya. And that's fine. And then if you don't want to have these A, B things anymore, you can simply select your A, B again, and then they go away. So moving to the right here, this shows you your passes or render elements or AOVs. Right now we don't have any, we just have your, we just have the beauty or the RGB color. And we also have alpha. So you can see that the geometry is separated from the background. So this doesn't act as a map. If you had an HDRI, then your alpha would be completely solid and it would just be white everywhere. You also have the ability to view single channels at a time. So you can say, hey, I just want to view the red channel or I want to do red and green or blue and red. So you can separate them that way. And then you can also view to switch the alpha channel here directly without having to go to the drop down. If you're going to save an image, you have multiple options for saving. So you can do current channel, which is whatever you have selected here. You can say just save everything to separate files. So if you did that, it would save one image for RGB color, one for alpha. And then you also have save everything to a single file. So this is going to save out an EXR, which we'll go over in a little bit. Let's say your V-Ray frame buffer though is kind of crowded and don't actually want this image. You can click this, clear image, and then it completely clears the frame buffer. Another really useful thing is this right here, which is the follow mouse. So follow mouse is not really going to be as apparent if I try this now, but if I click the start IPR, I can start down here and it's going to work its way up. And as I mouse over parts of the ship, you can see those parts are going to be worked on. So if you had a really large image that takes a long time to render, but you just want to see if certain parts of it are rendering properly, you can do follow mouse and you can hover over the area that you want to focus on and it will render that part first. So not something that I use a lot, but it is kind of useful. Just remember though, you want to turn it off because sometimes it can be a little bit awkward if that's left on. You can also do test resolution. So let's say you're working in 4K and you don't want to have to keep changing your render settings every time you just want to quickly look at a preview. You can click the 50%, which will make everything really, really tiny. And then you actually do have to physically like zoom in to see it. You can also do like all the way down to like 10%. And then you do have to kind of readjust your frame buffer, which is kind of annoying, but you can see that's what 10% would be. So if you have very large images, it's very useful. And likewise, you can also go above that as well. You can never go back to 100% though without just clicking this button again, which will take you back to 100%. We also have a really useful feature here, and this is a newish feature, which is kind of cool. Let's say I only wanted to look at this engine. I can select this, and then it's only going to view the engines, so whatever that object is. So if I move that, both engines are selected, they're one object. And this is really, really useful if you want to see just that one object being rendered, but you want to like play around with your materials, for instance. So I could go into my materials here. Then I can say, hey, I want to see what this looks like with no reflection color. And we can kind of see what that specific channel is doing, which is really cool. 
especially if you have a very heavy scene or a very heavy object that takes a long time to render, this is a very, very useful way of just isolating that specific object. You also can do specific things like uh, view your UVs, for instance. And then there are other options as well here, like view wireframes and stuff like that. Uh, we can also pause the IPR. So if we don't necessarily want to stop it, we just want to you know, pause it. You can pause it there, or you can stop it. Now to do an actual full render, we can click the teapot here, and this will render the entire scene. And this will take a lot longer than IPR because it is actually using whatever settings you have in render settings and applying those to the image. So this is taking considerably longer than just the IPR. IPR, it tries to get you a view really, really quickly, even if it's a little bit rough in places, and then it gradually just refines it over and over and over again. This works in a very similar way. And I'll also show you bucket rendering in a little bit so you can see the difference between that. So when that is done, automatically this will pop up in your history, and this is the completed frame. It tells you this was 33.5 seconds. And another really cool thing is you can, you can right click over these images, and then you can say, edit note, this one or something. Like, I don't know. Like you, you wanted to say, hey, this is the one I wanted to use. The other ones are not as good or whatever. Very useful to, to do that. Now, one other thing that I forgot to mention, this little button here, it's the same thing as double clicking an image. So you can just select that and we'll load whatever image you have selected. Or you can just double click it. It doesn't really matter. All right. So on the left hand side, we have a few things that are useful. We have statistics. So if you wanted to get into the nitty gritty of like how many threads your computer has or what the total RAM is or how, how much RAM was it actually using, what, what's the timings of these? It displays all of this information total number of triangles and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool, uh, not particularly useful for our class. So in this stack, we have our display correction, which I explained in the previous video. This allows you to set your color profiles. So here we are using Asus CG, which is listed right here. Older versions of Maya by default uses sRGB. So if you select sRGB, everything's gonna look a little bit off because V-Ray is rendering an ACES space, but you're trying to view it with an sRGB profile, so it's not really the same. You also have Gamma 2.2. These two things are very, very similar. And the Gamma of sRGB is about 2.2, but sRGB also includes what's called a color primary. It's basically like a lookup table for telling your software what colors it should choose. It just helps it out because there's a lot of different color spaces. And the computer might not know what do, what do you mean by red? You know, it, it, you gotta like tell it. So usually things are in sRGB, but in this case we are using the Open Color I/O and Asus CG. This will be set as default. So you can change these things if you had to for a specific project. But I think going forth, Asus is going to be the the standard, and you'll kind of forget about using sRGB. So that's fine. We also have some really useful things here called lens effects. So if I if I select this and say enable bloom and glare, you might not actually notice anything at all. But when we did that, we get a new render element or render pass or AOV, and that is called glare. And now you can see we have like a little little glint right there. So these are really useful for compositing, and you can you know increase the size of this and you can kind of blow it out that way. You can increase the intensity. And depending on what you do, you might not actually see that much of a change. We also have a bloom and glare slider, but it's not really a slider anymore. It just says bloom. So if you say zero bloom is only gonna be a glint, and if you say one, it's only gonna be bloom. So glint is gonna give you that kind of lens flary look. If you had that at zero, it's going to be much more like a, a specular hit that you might see on like some shiny car. And if it's like just something that's really kind of glowing almost, that's going to be what Bloom is. So this is something you often see in, in games. You'll see Bloom and it makes your specular highlights just kind of glow. It's a nice look sometimes and it is something that cameras will produce. And you can even to a certain extent kind of see that with your eyes, like something that's super bright would have kind of a fringing around it. And that allows you to do that. 
So we have some controls for that. You can do things like lens scratches, lens dust, all of this stuff. You can change the shape of the aperture, all sorts of stuff like this. It's useful. We'll use it later on, but for right now, we don't really need it. So I can just disable that and then go back to the RGB color. Okay. So we also have denoising. So we'll talk about denoising a little bit later. Uh, we have to set that up before we get to this V-Ray frame buffer in the render settings. And this is going to be very, very useful for our project. So because the render times on this might actually get a little bit long, denoising kind of removes grain and it can drastically improve render times because it doesn't have to render out all the grain. It can leave a grainy image and then it can just get rid of it later just by using some algorithms to detect where grain is and kind of smooth it out. Very, very useful. So then we have our source. There's some useful stuff called light mix and composite. I never use composite. Light mix though is very, very useful, but we need to actually have lights to be able to do anything useful with it. And for right now, we only have one light. Okay. So some other things that are very useful and we will start to use them later is if you click this little button up here, we can create all sorts of basic corrections, like basic color corrections, like we have in After Effects, plus a few other ones. So for example, we can grab curves and we'll get a little implementation of curves here. So if we know that for whatever reason, we can't get the scene looking quite right. And we know we're going to have to do something in After Effects or whatever compositor you're using. You can quickly kind of preview what that's going to look like. So you can say, hey, I, I want my curve to be way more contrasty, or I just want everything to be brighter, or whatever the adjustment may be. You have the options to use these curves here, or you can do things like white balance. So white balance is very useful. You can make your image kind of much warmer or much cooler. And these are things that are very, very useful when you're trying to get the look. You can see them in the in Maya. So if you if you need to change something, you don't have to go back from After Effects and then render it out again and then save and then re-import that into After Effects. You can do it directly in the frame buffer. And for certain cases, you might actually really like the corrections that you've done. And it is possible to bake these changes in. Although for our class, we're never going to do that because it kind of breaks our workflow. So we're not going to do that. But let's say that you got the most absolute perfect color and you're like, oh, I love this. I wish I could have this in After Effects. What you can do over display correction, right click you can say save all CC. So that's color correction basically as a LUT and LUT is a lookup table. And then you can re-import that. It's called a cube file into After Effects. And then you can get the same transformations that you could in the frame buffer. All right, so there's a whole, a whole heap of stuff that we can do with that. Hope that kind of clears up where you can find stuff. Some tutorials and some older tutorials that I made relied on an older version of V-Ray, so it was V-Ray Next. So this one is V-Ray 5. So V-Ray 5, they changed their frame buffer and admittedly, some stuff was a little bit confusing where it is, but that is basically for all that we need. If you are also interested at the bottom here, you can hover over different parts of the image and it will give you the value of every pixel. And you can say that in, see that in raw, or you can see direct RGB. And then you can also change how these colors are perceived. So 8-bit is, we'll never do that. But if you wanted to see what this would look like on the web, it's going to be a little bit different than what you would see in After Effects, for example, because of the bit depths and, and color primaries. Okay. So that's getting into a lot of information. We don't really need that right now. So actually what we can do, we don't want any of these anymore. We can delete them. So then we can just select all of those, just shift, select them and then delete. And then if you want to clear the frame buffer, you click this button and now we are completely good to go. If I want to clear these adjustments that I made, simply click on what the color correction layer was and I click delete. Okay. So I can just minimize this and for the next part, what we want to do is set up our render passes so we can see those in the V-Ray frame buffer as well. All right, guys, thanks for watching. As we progress through the series, there will be more features that I show you with the V-Ray frame buffer. In fact, the next part, we're going to go over V-Ray render elements or AOVs or render passes, and we'll view those in the frame buffer as well. All right, so I'll see you in the next video.
All right, guys, welcome back to part seven of the Razor Crest series. And now we're going to be talking about render elements or AOVs, or also known as render passes, and how to do that in V-Ray. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. So before you watch this video, you need to watch the video on how to install the Open Color IO plugin for After Effects. I had a separate video on that, and I briefly explained why we have to do that. So if you have not watched that, please watch that first. Please make sure that it is installed. It's not readily available in After Effects. You have to go and download it. Okay, so if you haven't done that, please do that. Otherwise, let's begin. It's going to be really important that we have a set project for this part of the lecture. So to do that, if you are using the most up-to-date version of Maya 2022, you get this home screen. And you can set your project really conveniently here. So you can click this folder icon. And mine's already set. So that's what the project is. But you can just go inside that folder, click Set Project, and then click Open. And if your project is set, it will take you to the Scenes folder. And by default, Scenes is going to have the Razor Crest version one or whatever you called your file. If you did not name your folder scenes, it's not going to work properly, or if you called it something else. So by default, Maya will only look for scenes in a scenes folder. So if yours does not open up the scenes folder, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not set, but if it says something like documents or users documents Maya 2022, then that's just the default path. And it's going to be really important that you set your project to your project path because when we start rendering out images it's going to put them wherever the set project is and we want them in our actual project all right so you can select that if you don't have this splash screen though i can just simply say go to maya and then show you the old way of doing it oh it's file set project and then once again you always double click the folder that you need to set and then don't click anything else so the folder name is the folder here then click select folder and then go to open then open up the scene this way for the next part what we want to do is set up our render passes so we can see those in the v-ray frame buffer as well so one of the biggest takeaways from this class is what is a render pass or an aov so this is a little bit confusing there's a lot of terms that kind of mean the same thing in certain circumstances so you'll hear me say quite often render passes. The render passes are the same thing as AOVs. V-Ray also calls these render elements. So if I go up to my render settings here and then I select render elements, these are things that you might be familiar with in Arnold. So these are your passes or AOVs. So AOVs are arbitrary output variables. And what that means is you can start extracting specific things from the beauty and the beauty is just whatever you render like just natively without doing anything at else no other adjustments you just click render whatever frame it gives you that's called the beauty sometimes it's also referred to as just rgb color or just color so beauty is generally kind of the main term that you will hear but you can often hear just rgb pass so that's what that is so certain software calls these passes, certain software calls it AOVs, V-Ray calls it render elements. This is probably the least common way of calling it. Probably the reason that they do this is V-Ray kind of started it with 3ds Max and 3ds Max throws the term passes around like really liberally. So to differentiate 3ds Max passes, which aren't really passes at all, they came up with render elements. That's what I am assuming. But inside of Maya, usually going back in the day when we use mental ray, which some of you probably have never even heard of before, it was called passes. So passes are the same thing as AOVs and AOVs are probably the most common way of calling it. So arbitrary output variables, which is kind of a mouthful to be honest, but basically it just means that you can arbitrarily decide what you are outputting in a variable. Okay, so you can just say, hey, I just want to grab GI. Just I just want to see what GI is, or I just want to see what the lighting is. Every render engine has like its own naming convention for what these are. And V-Rays is probably the most peculiar. Like it has something called lighting. Well, what what does that mean? But we're gonna go through these and I'll explain how they're used. And then what we're gonna do, we're going to render out this image 
and then we're going to recreate the beauty. So the beauty is basically whatever we render. So if we go back to IPR right here, this is the beauty, but it will be useful later to be able to say, hey, let's let's take just the reflections and we'll composite those separately. Or let's take just the color and composite that separately. Or let's take just the glass and do that separately. And the reason why that's useful is kind of twofold. So the first one is pretty obvious. Let's say your render takes 10 hours and you don't really know how reflective you want it, or you might need to change the level of reflectivity later. Well, if you just rendered this image right here, good luck trying to remove the reflections. Like it's pretty much impossible. But if you could isolate just the reflections and maybe tint them or reduce the intensity or blur them a little bit, it's really, really useful to be able to do in After Effects or just in post. And the other reason is to be more creative or to composite a more pleasant or more realistic image. Sometimes there is a need to take specific passes and do certain adjustments to them. Like maybe instead of using that glare adjustment for the lens effects, we could do that just based on the specularity and we could make our own glare pass in After Effects, for example. Okay, so this is all kind of theoretical. Let's actually do something practical. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this and you're just gonna to have to memorize what you need for this, but there are many ways that you can actually composite. So I'm gonna show you a way of compositing that's fairly straightforward and it offers a fair amount of control, but you can go in a lot of depth with this to do things like changing almost anything after it's rendered. So you can change things like, I wanna change all of the color of the ship you can do that with passes or changing the shadow colors and things like that i'm going to show you a more simplified way which is going to combine the shadow information and it's going to combine the the diffuse color or the the base color or albedo okay so this is just to explain what they do if you want to experiment with some of these other ones you're more than welcome to some of these passes aren't really useful as passes in the beauty and some of these are just for like diagnostic purposes. You, what you don't want to do though is select all of these and just have them all render out because while the majority of them are always calculated when you render, it's not really taking any additional amount of time. It does have to store them all. So when you save all of these in an EXR file or it's just separate files, it makes that EXR file a lot larger than you might need. And it sometimes does take longer if it's just saving it. Some passes do actually take a lot longer to do because they're not part of the beauty, and especially for diagnostic or utility passes. What we need to do now is just simply take this render and then recreate it in After Effects. So to do that, we're going to use these passes here. So these passes are going to be a little bit different to Arnold AOVs if you are familiar with them. And these are also a little bit different to Redshift if you ever use that. We're gonna actually start with GI. This is the first one that we need. This is global illumination. Next, we're gonna do lighting. So lighting is the direct lighting or that sunlight and light from the sun. And you can either double click them or you can click add. Then we're gonna go down, we're gonna skip all the raw passes. These are really useful if you wanna start like extracting very specific pieces like you just want to grab the color with no shadows, for example. This is what the raw passes are for. I'm going to grab reflection, refraction. So refraction is going to be for light that kind of bounces off. And refraction is going to be light passing through things like the glass. So you can still see a little bit of the light passing through that. So normally we would need self-illumination, or this is the same thing as emissive. But uh, the nothing on here actually has its own light source, I don't think. So we don't need that. And then we're gonna do specular. So I'll explain what all of these do in a moment. So we are actually gonna be using a lot more of these later, but to recreate the beauty, this is the bare minimum that we need. And we don't need self-illumination simply because there's nothing that illuminates, okay? If something did have a little light source on it, we would need this, but we don't need it right now. Okay, so now that we have these, now we can go back to the V-Ray frame buffer and then start IPR again. So you're not really gonna notice anything that changes here, but now if you click up here, you can see that we have more channels. So let's have a look at GI, first of all. And GI is gonna be very, very dim here because we don't have a lot of 
light that's specifically illuminating the scene just from bounced light. We go down to lighting, you can see that there's quite a bit more direct light here, but a lot of the lighting of the ship is actually in the reflections. Because we have that metalness, a lot of this is now only in reflection. Then we also have refract, which is going to be the glass. And then we have specular. So the difference between reflections and specular reflections are basically the, the intensity and the angle that it hits. So you can think of specularity of kind of intense pockets of light that kind of bounce off at specific angles. So these are going to be things like highlights and you, you can get a little bit of, you know, like more diffuse specularity as well, depending on the, the surface. But the majority of specular highlights are going to be these really sharp, bright parts. Okay. And then of course we have alpha and then we have our beauty or RGB color. So I wanted to quickly show you something here. So I've, let me close down my render settings. I'm going to go back to the ship and then I'm going to turn off metalness just temporarily. I'm going to break the connection and I'm going to reduce the metalness down to zero. So now I'm going to start IPR again. So now this looks very, very different. It looks like it's coded in something. So now if I go back and have a look at these, now look at GI. GI is way better lit now. So if I go back to lighting, we have way more lighting. And if we go now to reflection, Reflection is only the reflection of the sky. So this is an important consideration that when you are using metalness, it is influencing how the shader is like basically taking in the environment. So when metalness is turned on, it takes whatever your diffuse color is and puts that basically as a reflection. So when you go to GI, all of that diffuse color is not going to be there anymore. Then we also have our specular. That's going to be pretty much the same. There's a little less specularity now because of the metalness is turned off. But if I go back to my render settings and then I decided to use diffuse color and then render that, go to diffuse color, you can see that we have basically whatever our color map was on our image here. So on our diffuse color, so whatever this one was, and this is a UDIM, so we can't actually preview it, but this is what the texture is as our diffuse color. Now, if I go back and then I turn metalness all the way up again and then render this, now look what happens to diffuse color. It's like black now. It's like there is no diffuse color. So just bear that in mind that metalness actually takes whatever your diffuse color is and reflects it, okay? So that will greatly change how your passes appear if you use metalness, because things like your GI and, and your lighting are going to be very, very pale or barely anything's on there. And the majority of that information is going to be in the reflection channel. Like almost all of that is in reflection just because of how the metalness channel works. Okay, just bear that in mind. In this case, we do actually want that metalness map on there though, because the material is actually metal. And it doesn't really matter as long as that information is in here somewhere. We're going to composite that and we're going to get back to the beauty. Right, let me just control Z this back to having that metalness map on here. And now we can go back to the V ray frame buffer and go back to RGB color. Now, if I wanted to recreate this, I'm going to click and hold the save disk icon. And then I'm going to say save all image channels to a single file. If you're saving directly from the V-Ray frame buffer, it doesn't know where you want to save it. I'm just going to go into images. And then we had this from last time. So I'm just going to say Razor Crest test. And I'll just say passes, or you could say AOVs or something. And then click save. Okay, so let's open up After Effects now. And this is the part that we have to have that open color IO plugin installed. So if you don't have that, you need to watch that previous video and make sure that is installed. If you're on campus though, it's already installed, so you can just follow along. Okay, so we're gonna double click our project window, go to images, and then we're gonna select this Razor Crest Passes EXR. 
And the really good thing about EXR files is, first of all, that they're lossless, or they can be lossless, usually by default. They can store up to 32 bits per channel. So if you remember, that's a huge amount of information. And they can store multiple channels. So this is what is referred to as a multi-channel EXR. All of those passes that we just created are now saved inside this EXR. So we're just going to click and drag this down here and then start our composite. So we only rendered at half HD, so it's 960 by 540. It doesn't really matter. It's just to kind of drive home the point of how you can begin to composite. So I'm going to do shift slash or the question mark key to kind of fit this up to 100%. And the first thing that you'll notice is that we have this weird fringe around the ship and our sky is gone. So to get our sky back, we're going to right click over the EXR file, go to interpret footage, main, and then we'll say ignore. So ignore. And then the next thing that you'll probably notice is that everything looks super bright. And that is because we're no longer viewing this with the ACES color profile. And by default, After Effects is trying to do this directly with sRGB, which is not correct. So let's make sure our project is set up properly. Click down here where it says the BPC. We need to be using 32 BPC. Our working space needs to be sRGB. That's fine. And then we absolutely have to linearize. Otherwise, the results that we get are not going to be correct. So click OK. And as I explained in the, the last video, if I go back to Maya here, what we just saved is actually this image with no display correction on it. After Effects is adding this back on, but V-Ray by default and Maya and everything, everything looks at this image as it is with no display correction on it. And this display correction or display transform is what allows us to see it properly, but we actually only save out that linear file like this. And then in After Effects, we have to deal with that linear file. Okay, so the next thing that we have to do here is create the adjustment layer for the Open Color IO plugin. Let's right click, New, Adjustment Layer. So you can just click Enter and then type in OCIO. And then we're going to grab the Open Color IO plugin and then click and drag this over to our effects controls. So for the configuration, click where it says None. Got a custom. And if you don't know where that path is again, just go back to Maya. Click on this folder icon here under display correction. Just copy this path. Then you just paste it in here, enter, then grab the config OCIO file. And what we need is display. For the input space, we go to scene linear, ACES CG. And now this looks like super blown out, and that's because After Effects is, it doesn't know that this plugin here is doing gamma correction or just like a display transform, and it's doing its own as well. So we basically get two, so now it looks super bright. So in order to fix that, we can add a color profile converter effect underneath the OCIO plugin. Our input now is sRGB, because we're viewing this in sRGB now. And then on the output profile, we're still in sRGB, but we need to linearize it like this. So now we're going to get the correct result. So this is exactly what we had in the V-Ray frame buffer. So if we just alt tab this back, now you can see this is what we saw in V-Ray. And this is what we get in After Effects. If this does not look the same for you, and any time that you're ever trying to do any compositing, if it doesn't look exactly the same, you need to sort that out because it's going to be very, very difficult to continue working on this if there's a disconnect between what you do in Maya and what you see in After Effects or Fusion or Nuke or whatever you're using or, or Photoshop. Now, I will say for Photoshop, you are not going to be able to composite these properly because right now Photoshop doesn't have a very good ACES management system. So it doesn't have an open color IO plugin that works particularly well. So I'm sure they will fix that, but uh, right now you can't really get the same result in Photoshop very easily. But if you are compositing, After Effects is ultimately a far better tool than Photoshop, unless you need to do painting on it. But then you can always just take this into Photoshop, do some stuff, and then bring in a PSD back into After Effects. So 
After Effects is going to be superior in most cases for doing more advanced compositing. Anyway, kind of got sidetracked there. Okay, so what we need to do now is then break apart this EXR into all of its different passes. So the very first thing that we're going to do, we're going to duplicate this once. Then on the t upper layer, I'm going to call this beauty. So this is our reference file. And then on this file right here, we're going to grab another effect called extractor. So for extractor, you can kind of see how this is named. The E, X, and R are all capitalized because it's extracting channels from EXR files. I'm going to click and drag that over here. And in order to see this, we need to solo this layer. And when you solo this layer, oh, the OCIO plugin is not soloed, so we also want to solo that. Everything that you do in After Effects at, at this point has to be underneath the Open Color IO plugin. So all of your color correction, everything, nothing can go above this layer. Okay. The only exception is your slate, but your slate is never going to be affected by your Open Color IO plugin anyway. It shouldn't be because your slate starts at frame zero, and if we're working on a project and stuff these will actually only start at frame one, like that. But for this, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so just make sure both of these are soloed. And then for Extractor, you select where it says Layers. And if you select this and nothing happens, that means you didn't save out a multi-channel EXR file or you didn't save your passes or, or your passes didn't render or something. Okay, so let's start with GI. And GI is going to be like pretty much completely black, but there's like a few parts where there was bounced light. So we do need to include that. Most of the time when you composite with GI, it's going to be a lot brighter. But remember, our plane is pretty much all metal and all of that information gets stored in the reflection pass. So we're going to call this GI. Just click enter and then say GI. I'm going to do control D to duplicate that. The next pass is called lighting. We can say lighting like this. So we're seeing a little bit more information there. And then we're going to duplicate this again. We can do reflect or reflection. Then we can grab the reflect. Now this is where the majority of our information is going to be because we are using that metal. Got a specular. And then duplicate this one more time. And then we're going to do refract. So I like to keep reflection and specular next to each other because specularity and reflections are like almost the same thing. And in, and in physics, like, is this a reflection? Is this how it reflects that kind of differentiates it? But for us as artists, it's much more useful to have specular type reflections in a separate pass than it is inside the reflections pass. Okay, so then how do we actually combine all of these together? Well, one easy way to do it we unsolo all of these now. On GI, we're going to leave that with a normal blending mode. And just to review here, if you don't see your modes here, if you see toggle switches, you can click that. Or you can right click up here, columns, and just make sure that your modes and switches are both checked. So GI is always going to be normal, but most of the other passes are actually just going to be additive. And I just realized that the beauty also got turned back on. I'm going to turn that off now. And if we just go layer at a time, so we say GI, and then lighting, and we can grab lighting, and then we're going to add lighting. So in After Effects, there's two ways you can do this. You can do add, or you can do linear dodge. You will find certain people saying linear dodge is correct, other people saying add is correct. Really, it's just how it fills in color when you're not at 100%, but at 100%, add and linear dodge are exactly the same. So in this case, it doesn't really matter. So you can just click add. And now you can see that's a little bit brighter. You can solo on reflection now, and this is going to add a, make a big difference. You can say add. And now you can see a little bit more information popped up there. Now for specular, solo this on, add. And now you can see if we toggle this on and off, now we get the specular reflections. Same thing for refract. We're going to say add. And basically, we just add everything. There will be some certain passes where we don't. So when we do ambient occlusion, we're not going to do that, where we multiply ambient occlusion. But everything else, we just add or linear dodge it, and we're usually good to go. So now I'm going to turn all these layers off. Okay, 
So the last thing that we need to do is grab the sky. And this is going to lead us into kind of an issue with compositing like this. And that is the way that the extractor works is not going to take into account what the background was because we had an alpha channel. So just to show, we don't actually have a pass called alpha, but if we wanted to create an alpha pass for this, we can do control D again, you can type in alpha. And in order to see your alpha channel, you can simply go to on the red, green, and blue, you can just say A, A, A. So then we don't actually add that, that would be just normal. And that is what our alpha channel looks like. Now keep in mind that the ACES color profile is making this look a lot dimmer. So if we were to solo this, then it looks like we would expect, you know, black and white, but we need this OCIO plugin on and it's going to make everything look a little bit more dimmed and that's okay. That's the way that we're going to composite. All right, so that's how you grab your alpha, but we still don't have our sky. But if we click our toggle transparency grid here, you can see that one of these layers is blocking the alpha. So all of these layers by default don't really preserve that alpha channel. So then we could use this alpha channel that we just created and use it as a mat for every single one of these channels. That's a little bit cumbersome. We could pre-compose these, but that kind of screws up how we're going to do the rest of our compositing. So we're not going to do that. Instead, what we can do is go to each one of these passes and make sure the alpha channel is being used. You can do it this way. And now you can see that with the alpha transparency turned on, now we finally have transparency. So to get our sky back, we can simply go to our beauty because that included the sky. We could duplicate that, call that sky, turn that layer on, pull that underneath GI and hey, look, we got, we got our sky back. So this is gonna lead us into the next section where we start talking about render layers. And render layers is gonna solve this problem so we never actually have to do that because that is really cumbersome to have to do. But if you didn't need render layers and you did wanna have like, you know, full control, that's one way that you can do it. As always, there's lots of different ways that you can use to kind of extract the alpha from an image and stuff like that. But that's one way of doing it. And I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so now let's compare this to the beauty again. So if we turn this layer on, so we're toggling this on and off, we have now the same image. Now there is one nuanced difference here, and that is around the edges. This is a problem that often occurs, and it's how the image is extracted from the alpha, and it can lead to some fringing, and sometimes that's problematic. Usually though, it's not that problematic. There are ways to mitigate that edge if it becomes a problem, but it's very, very subtle here, like that. So we can talk about ways that you can alleviate that issue. And sometimes it's as easy as unmultiplying your EXR passes or going into your interpret footage and interpreting this as, as pre-multiplied, just depends. So that is how you can get back to your beauty. Now, I wanted to show you some other things that you could do with passes before we move on to render layers. So let's go into our render settings again. And this time I want to look at glossiness. So I'm going to go down to reflection glossiness. So reflection glossiness is not actually part of the beauty, but this is the same thing as roughness for us. So let's just render this. And this is really useful for us if we wanted to use this to control parts of our image. So I'm going to just leave that and then I'm going to click and then I'm going to click this button up here again to save it. And then I can simply overwrite this Razor Crest Passes EXR. Click yes. Go back to After Effects. Right click reload. And then we can add another pass. So we can go up to Refract, duplicate that. And then go to Reflection Gloss. So we don't actually composite with this directly. We can just leave this as a normal blending mode. But instead, we can start doing some kind of creative stuff with this. Because of metalness, a lot of our information and our reflection are kind of stuck in reflection here. If I wanted to kind of extract 
parts of the rough reflection versus the kind of glossy reflection, I can do that with this pass. Let me call this roughness. Now this is just going to be a mat for us. Now I can pull this underneath reflection. And then if I solo reflection, solo the OCIO layer, and then I say, all right, reflection, but I only want to show that where it's not rough, so where it's brighter. And then I turn off my transparency here. We've kind of extracted part of that metal now. If I do the opposite, I can extract just the parts that are rough, which is kind of cool. So just by simply using that roughness as a mat, I could duplicate this. Switch this one to Luma. Unsolo all of these. This is still the same image that we had before, but now we have a little bit more control. Now we have reflections for the parts that are rougher and reflections for the parts that are shinier. And I can start doing some interesting things with those. I can turn this layer back off. And I could do something like, hey, on the areas where it is, you know, shinier, I could grab a curves effect. And then I could say, hey, I want to make those even brighter or just those areas. If I zoom in on here, see how we're making that part brighter. Or I could say, hey, you know what? I don't want to use that. Instead, I want to reset this. I want to make the reflection more saturated. So I could grab hue and saturation. Then I could say, hey, let's make that the reflection a little bit more bluish. I wanted, I wanted more blue in the reflection. And now I could do that. Or I could do that, you know, down here. And I could say, hey, on the rougher parts of that reflection, do the same thing. I actually want that to be even grayer, desaturated. Or I could do the opposite and say, hey, I really wanted the rougher part to have more color. And then on the reflection down here, I didn't actually need that at all. And I just wanted to maybe really, really saturate that. Now there will be some crossover here because the rough parts do kind of mix a little bit with the non rough parts. It's not a simple black and white mask, it is grayscale. That's one thing that we can do with a utility pass, such as the glossiness pass or roughness. But we can do the same thing on regular passes as well, like specularity. So I could say, hey, on the specular parts, I actually want those to be a little bit tinted. So I could say, all right, I want to make these for some reason red. And I could make our, my specular reflections a little bit more reddish. Or I could reduce the red. I could make them a little bit greener for some reason. Okay. Or I could say, hey, you know what? These weren't bright enough. I want to make them even brighter. So we are going to get some kind of false color areas if we don't go, if we go way too hot, hot with that. So we don't want to do that. So we don't want to have that go completely clipped. I'm going to do something like this. But doing that makes our specularity a lot brighter. So you can begin to be creative with this. And at this point, since it's left Maya, you can do whatever you want. You're not breaking PBR or anything at this point because you've used PBR to get a rendered result that is physically correct. And now when you're in compositing, you can kind of do what you want. Now, of course, there are going to be certain rules of what looks good and what you should do. And it's going to be scene dependent, but it just offers that level of flexibility or on the refraction. I could say, hey, I want to brighten that glass up. It's way too dark. No problem. Grab a curves. I'm going to crank those values over. And now we can see through the canopy a lot more clearly. And this is a really, really good example of something that's, it looks great. It looks fine, right? But if you had to go and re-render like an entire sequence of, let's say, something that took an entire week to render just because you accidentally used an incorrect refraction setting inside Maya and it's now too dark and you can't see through very clearly. Well, if you have the refraction pass, you can easily fix that. So that is the benefit of using passes. So it's not always required in your professional life that you would have to use passes, but I always recommend it because even if you don't really make that many adjustments, 
And even if you didn't want to do something like change the roughness reflections versus the glossy reflections or stuff like that, there'll be one instance where you're like, oh, I wish I could just tint just that one aspect of it, or I wish that I could blur that one section or something like that. It's always good to get in the habit of using passes or AOVs, whatever you like to call them. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. So next we're going to talk about render layers. So I'm going to clear all this because we're going to do it all over again because practice makes perfect. Okay, so back in Maya, I'm actually going to get rid of this glossiness pass. And we can leave all of this as it is for right now. Later on, we'll go through what all of these things do. But for right now, we really don't need anything except for changing the resolution. So we will change that a little later. All right, guys, thanks for watching. The next video, we're going to be taking a little bit of a detour and going over VDB sequences. So I'm trying to build up a scene that we can use render layers for a more complex scene. So I'm going to be loading in some VDB clouds. And if you're interested in how to do that in V-Ray, stay tuned for the next video. Welcome back to the Razorcrest series. And in this part, we're going to go over how to load in a VDB inside a V-Ray volume grid. This is going to be the same methodology for loading in sequences, but in this video, I'm just going to be showing you how to load in clouds. Now check the link in the description or where you can access some clouds. The one that I'm going to show you in the video, I'll try to find that one as well and link to that. But Embergen, which is some software we'll be previewing later, just released a whole bunch of VDB sequences for clouds, which look pretty cool. So you might be interested in using those instead. All right, let's get started. Okay. So what I'd like to show you now is what a render layer is. But in order for this to make more sense, we really need a little bit more of a complex scene. On Canvas, there is a cloud VDB and a VDB is a volumetric file and it's called high altitude big cloud flat 14. This is from a cloud pack, but this was their free one just to see if you liked their stuff. And it's a really good use of a VDB. So instead of having to simulate clouds or use clouds only as an image, you could load in a VDB of a cloud and you can get volumetric clouds very easily inside of V-Ray. So in order to use that, what we're going to do, we're going to go up to V-Ray and then we're going to go to volume grid. I'm going to say volume grid. Basically gives you a stock bounding box. And this is also related to Phoenix FD, but you can use this just with V-Ray. So under input, where it says preview and render path, click on the dots there, go to browse. And I would recommend saving that file in your assets folder. Really, you can save it wherever you want, but just keep your project folder organized. I'm going to have that in assets, double click. And then right away, it's going to say, hey, what, what, what do you want to do with this? Where did this come from? And if you don't know, it doesn't matter to say no preset, doesn't matter. So by default, it's going to preview the cloud in the viewport. And this is fairly large, pretty cool. And then to move this around, we can simply just move it like we would any old object. And it's really cool. So to see what we've got, we can go to the viewport IPR for V-Ray. And we got a really, really dark cloud. So to fix that, we can go down to rendering. And then we can go down to smoke color. This is considered smoke. I'm going to crank up the color all the way up to the maximum value there. And when we do that, nothing changes because unfortunately changes to VDBs, either their transform or their color doesn't really update. So we do have to keep refreshing it, which is kind of annoying. And it's a little bit more annoying to do that in the viewport. So I'm going to open back up the IPR. We can go to the V-Ray frame buffer and we'll just do it here. So we can rotate around and we can kind of see where those clouds are. So this is going to be a little bit tricky to see. And I actually want to change the lighting a little bit. I want something a little bit more interesting to look at. I'm going to take this sun. I'm going to move it back here. Do something more like evening. So we get some nice highlights on the ship. Something more like that. And then that's going to make our clouds kind of orangey. Kind of picking up some of that reflection of the sun. Honestly, though, I, they look like storm clouds. So to change the thickness of them and select our VDB again, go down to smoke opacity. We have a color slider, so you can change the color slider. 
go back to startup IPR again. And at white, it's going to be very, very thin and wispy. If we back that down a little bit, we can see we, we get the clouds back again. This is just going to be kind of a game going back and forth just to see, you know, what what difference that we get. You can also just go down to the simple smoke opacity here. You could do something like one. And this is going to be really, really thick. Like kind of ridiculously thick. It's like an explosion's gone off. Or you could do something really, really thin and wispy, like point one. Something kind of like that. So it really just depends on what kind of clouds that you'd like to do. And using the constant color here and the simple opacity, they kind of counter each other. So you can use both of them, but if you just wanted to use one or the other, that's fine too. I personally think the smoke opacity is a little bit easier to work with than the constant color. This is very useful though if you have a texture and you want to kind of paste texture over everything. It's kind of useful to do that. So I want this smoke to be a little bit more dense. And unfortunately, we just have to keep stopping the IPR and going back. Uh, but we can do something like that. If we don't like the color, we can change it later. We can, we can do some color correction of that in post. OK, so what I'd like to do now is kind of just make a scene that looks interesting. So I'm just going to hold down the Shift key there, kind of drag that out drag out a copy of this. We're just going to make some interesting clouds. And I want to get rid of this grid. I'm going to get rid of that by clicking the grid icon. And I want to pull another one of these down underneath. So these files are great. There's a lot of things that you can do with these VDBs. And you can actually make it look like there's a lot more like variation of clouds, even just using the same VDB over and over and over again. So really, we should be instancing these, but we're not, but it's fine. Doesn't really matter for this. It's not going to be super heavy. Once we have something that we're happy with, we can begin setting up our render layers. Let's see what we have here. So it always looks way thicker in the viewport than it does actually in the IPR mode. So I'm going to pull this under here, just add a little bit more depth there. Back to the viewport IPR. You can use this or you can use the other IPR. It doesn't really matter. It's whatever you prefer. And on some of these, I actually would like to make these a little bit thicker. Change that to 0.5. Makes those a little bit thicker there. And I think I'm going to do the same thing on these as well. So something like this is going to be pretty interesting. Thanks for watching. In the next part, we're going to go over how to set up your V-Ray cameras. And specifically, we're going to be talking about focal lengths and the focal lengths that are going to be appropriate for an aerial aviation shot such as this. If you're interested, see you guys in the next video. All right, guys, welcome back to the Razorcrest series. And now we need to talk about focal lengths. So I'm going to insert a snippet about focal lengths from a previous video that I made. But the gist of this video specifically is how to set up focal lengths for an aerial aviation shot and why it is important that you choose the correct focal length. Let's get started. When light rays hit a camera lens, they converge at a focal point. And the focal length refers to the distance from the focal point of the lens to the camera sensor. In older cameras, uh, instead of the sensor, it would be the film. So as the focal length increases, the angle of view, or what you can see through the lens, decreases, and the foreshortening decreases as well, and vice versa. For example, with an ultra-wide angle, a small focal length, the angle of view is large and therefore more of the subject can be shown in the frame. Foreshortening is also increased, meaning that objects closer to the camera look much larger and more distorted than they do to the human eye. This is especially noticeable with vertical lines, which appear to angle inwards or outwards if the camera is tilted up or down, respectively. 
With a super telephoto lens, or a lens with a large focal length, the angle of view is much smaller. There's very little foreshortening here, and the subject will appear to be flattened. So let's have a look at these images here that I created in Maya. And with these various images, I have specific focal lengths. And notice what happens as we go through each one. So starting off with a 10 millimeter lens, this is considered an ultra wide angle lens. We can see all the way down the street, and we can see two distinctive vanishing points. So if you remember from like a drawing class, you might have learned how to do two point perspective. When you are practicing two point perspective, what you're basically representing is an ultra wide angle lens. Otherwise, you would need a very, very large piece of paper and your focal points would be very, very far apart. Looking at this first one here, the viewer or the camera is basically at that intersection and we can see all the way down both streets. So next, we have an 18 millimeter lens which is slightly further back. And as we increase the focal length to a 24, which is a wide angle lens, we have to step back from the road. We no longer can see down the street and their vanishing points are further apart. Notice also what happens to the building. It appears to be slightly more flattened. There's less distortion. Now, as we increase that to a 35 millimeter lens, which is still wide angle, the vanishing points are much, much further away and we have to be even further back. So as we increase, we're magnifying the view. Our angle of view decreases, so we have to stand further away from the subject to keep it in frame. Otherwise, we'd get something like this, where we're just zooming into the shot. Next, we have a 50 millimeter lens. This is going to be closer to what the human eye will see, and notice how far away we are from the subject. We also have an 85 millimeter lens here. And lastly, we have telephoto lenses. So we have a 120 millimeter lens, which is a short telephoto lens. And then we have a 300 millimeter, which is considered more like a super telephoto lens. So as we increase the focal length to a 600, then a 900, and then finally a 1200 millimeter lens, we get to the point where we could almost mimic an orthographic view, which has equal foreshortening in all three axes. So this is very, very important for 3D artists, especially for visual effects artists, because it is vital that you match the focal length of the plate when setting up a camera in a 3D scene. Otherwise, 3D objects composited onto the plate won't look correct. So you either need to know exactly what the focal length was of the plate, or you need to create objects that match objects in the scene, and then make a camera that seems to line up with everything in the scene. Sometimes this is quite tricky to do. In some of the tutorials of this channel, we have discussed how to set up a scene like this. If you take a look at the sniper one and the one about the, the plane. So in the last tutorial series, I discussed the importance of focal length when setting up a camera for an aerial aviation shot. And in this, I discussed that the focal length needs to be increased. Otherwise, if it's too wide angle, it's going to look unrealistic. And the reason is with a wide angle lens, you physically have to be closer to the subject and if your cameraman is in another plane filming the subject plane, it would be way too close. And this is something that we, you need to keep in mind, even if it's a full CG visual effect shot. So in summary, as the focal length increases, vanishing points move further away, field of view decreases, foreshortening or distortion decreases, the subject would appear to be flatter in this case, and the subject appears to be larger in frame and more zoomed in. So unless you stand back, it's going to be magnified in frame. Likewise, as the focal length decreases, vanishing points move closer together, your field of view increases, foreshortening or distortion increases, the subject in this case would have more depth and then the subject appears to be smaller in frame or more zoomed out. So you physically have to get closer to the subject in order to fill the frame. Right, so now I'm actually going to create a new camera. I'm going to say camera and then I'm going to right click over the viewport camera icon at a camera one. And now we're inside the ship. So that's not what I wanted. But I'm just doing this so we have one camera that we're going to, you know, kind of keep. This is going to be our render camera. And the other one is going to be just for, you know, moving around the viewport. So for this camera, we're going to select this little icon here, the resolution gate. This is going to show us our aspect ratio. So we're just going to use 16 by 9. That's fine. And then another really important thing is to think about the focal length. If you were to really film another plane, even if it's kind of a, a sci-fi story, you still usually want to make it look like it was filmed instead of just being completely fake like a video game. And even video games tend to be more cinematic now. And part of what makes an animation or just a shot more cinematic is using a correct focal length. So if you were a photographer or a videographer or whatever, and you were hired to film some shots of a plane flying through some clouds, you would have to be in another plane, obviously, in order to capture the other plane. Now you gotta think about the safety and how this would actually work 
You can't have that other plane that you're in as the photographer super close to the other plane because that would be too dangerous. So what you would have to do is have a longer lens, something with a longer focal length. And a longer focal length is going to make the image look flatter, but it's also going to make it look a lot more realistic. If you see any pictures of planes online like that are in the air, from the air, like an aerial aviation photography or cinematography, you're going to see a really long focal length. So if I did something the opposite of that, like a 16 millimeter, in order to capture the plane, you know, looking, you know, big in frame, I have to be like super close to it, right? I have to be like touching it or hanging off the edge of it. Like, hey, this is my phone and I'm just taking a selfie, right? That's a 16. Maya by default gives you 35, which is kind of, it's still kind of wide angle. It's like a, a mid tier. 50 is a little bit longer, but still mid. The minimum that you would use for something like this would be like an 80. But notice what happens to the engines. So as we increase this, we could do something like 200. As you get further back, the foreshortening kind of decreases and everything looks a lot flatter. And it looks a little bit odd if you're not kind of used to seeing images like that. But is it going to make your shot look far more realistic if you have a longer lens? I'm just going to do 80 though. I think that's a good length to do. And we'd still be pretty close, but not like unbelievably close, like almost going to cause an accident, basically. If you think that sounds way too much in depth, that is what really goes on for actual film and for actual visual effects. But this also carries over into a lot of other things in, in this entire program, like even, you know, concept design, like, hey, I need you to design a planet. I need you to design some rocks, all right? And it's on a planet that's wet and it's like, raining all the time. Well, what do those rocks look like? Well, they're going to look really smooth because, you know, rocks that have been kind of hit with water for, you know, thousands of years are going to be much smoother than rocks in the desert that barely ever see any rain at all. So they're going to be much sharper usually. Okay. Things like that it just makes your scene, makes your CG look a lot more realistic. Okay. Kind of went off on a tangent there, but just use a higher focal length for this. And to simplify how I'm going to move this plane, I'm just going to select all of these objects here and I'm just going to do control G to group them. And then we can call this group Razor Crest. And I'm just going to rotate this so it looks a little bit more interesting like this. And we're going to leave the gear down for now because I want to show you something that you can do with it. And for this, I will turn on the viewport IPR again. And when you do that, everything's going to be like super bright. So remember, if we're using a sun in V-Ray, we actually have to select our camera, go to attributes, V-Ray, physical camera, and this will add our camera settings. So the exposure is going to be more accurate. So with this, we can, you know, we could decrease our F number. We could do something like F4. That's going to be pretty common for something like this. Uh, if that looks way too bright for you, though, we don't have to do this accurately. This is simply so we can control it if we want. And uh, one thing that we do want to do, though, is go down to the specify focus right here. And this means that when you zoom into it, it's not going to get super dark. So just remember that with that's off, everything gets way darker when you get close to it. If you wanted a close up like this. But if you turn off your specify focus, it brightens it back up. OK. So hopefully that makes sense. That gear really looks silly, but we're going to fix that later. Anyway, when you're ha kind of happy with where the camera is, you can lock it by clicking this camera lock button. That means that if you accidentally try to move it, it's not going to move. So it's a common issue. I'm going to click the space bar key, though. I'm going to go to a different view, right click over that camera, do perspective. And then I can orbit around this as well. All right, so now that we have a more complex scene, in the next video, we can start talking about render layers. See you guys in the next video. All right, guys, welcome back to the Razorcrest series. And now we need to talk about render layers. So render layers are probably one of my favorite things to talk about when I'm teaching compositing because it allows you so much control in post. So much like AOVs that allow you to separate different aspects of your render, for example, your specular highlights, your reflections and shadows, and far more control than that, 
What render layers allow you to do is separate your scene physically by geometry or lights. So what that means is you could, for example, set up your scene so you have your hero ship model, but you might have two of them and you don't really know which one you want to use yet or, you, or the client doesn't know which one they use. And you have a background layer and maybe some environments or rocks or something. And what that allows you to do is first of all, gives you far more control in your composition. So you don't have to rely on things like Cryptomat to select different pieces of geometry just from a mat. It allows you a physical layer to deal with. And more importantly, in my opinion, is that it allows you to render only the parts that you need with specific render settings for those objects. For example, if you know a background is going to be completely out of focus, there's no need to spend time rendering it with really, really high anti-aliasing or a lot of really sharp detail. It doesn't really matter because it's going to be completely out of focus. In fact, you can just turn on a denoiser and render that part of the sequence very, very quickly. It also would allow you, if you make it a mistake on something like the ship, you can just render out the ship again. Now, there are some limitations and you do need to be mindful of how you set up render layers. But in this video, I want to give you an overview of the concept of render layers so you can begin to apply those to your own scenes. We're also going to be going over some basic compositing with these render layers and our AOVs. So if you haven't already, make sure you have the OpenColor.io plugin installed because you need to make sure that After Effects is ready to handle your Aces CG renders. Otherwise, they're not going to look the same. All right, let's get started. Okay, so next the goal is I want to separate the ship from the clouds, from the background. So with passes, we can separate elements of a specific layer or specific scene just based on the properties of the shader and how lights are reacting with it and other utilities. But if we want to physically separate objects, we use what is called a render layer. So render layers in Maya are accessible in this window here. It's like a clapperboard with a layer. It's going to be render setup is what this window is called. So render setup is something that I usually dock right here. And of course, this does kind of reduce your viewport, but I use this all the time. So I like to have that right here. And then for outliner, what I usually do, I click and drag this off and then I dock it underneath one of these. So it's like this. And this is kind of finicky, but this is the easiest way to do it. And you take your property editor take that off, drag that on right here. So then your render setup stays together and your outliner stays together. You don't have to do that, but that's how you get this type of view. And I think this is going to be easier than having that as a floating window. So render layers in Maya are incredibly useful and is one of the most powerful systems that I've ever seen in a DCC. 3ds Max doesn't have anything even remotely like this. Uh, Lightwave doesn't have anything like this. And Maya's is really good. I've just started learning Houdini, which has like a take system, which is a little bit similar, I think. Or if you've ever used Cinema 4D, I think it has something similar. And it makes Maya really, really powerful. Hopefully other DCCs get something like this too, uh, because it's really, really hard going from Maya to other things without a render setup. Anyway, so what we have right here is what is considered our master layer or our default layer. And that is displayed right here as your scene. Then we get a little visibility, or this is whatever you're selecting. And then a clapperboard icon, which says, hey, do you want this to actually render if we batch this? If you're using the PLE, you actually can't do any batch rendering. But at school, we have the full version of V-Ray, and you can batch render. So I'll, I'll show you that when we start doing the project. But for right now, we don't need to worry about this at all. But usually, you disable this because you never actually want to render your master layer. Your master layer is where you do all your setup. So you're just, everything is visible here and you're just adding, you're importing stuff, you're, you know, you're playing around with lighting and stuff. But when it comes time to render, or you want to extract different objects and change different settings, then you start creating new layers. So the render setup is going to use the term AOVs, not render passes or render elements. Just bear that in mind. And by default, any type of light that you have in your scene will always affect every single layer. So just bear that in mind as well. So the first thing that I want to do is that I want to have this ship on its own layer. So what I do is click this little button here 
and this creates a new render layer. And then I can just type in Razor Crest, or you could call it ship or something like that. And when you create a layer, it doesn't actually do anything. And if you were to click on the eye, you can now see the layer is like empty. The only thing it has in it is the sun. So we go back to our master layer here by clicking the eye. We right click over this, then we create a collection. So a render layer can have any number of collections. And later on, we'll go into a little bit more depth of what you can do with collections. For right now, we just want to simply add geometry to a collection. I'm going to pull this window out a little bit so we can see all of the buttons on the side. And we don't need to name the collection. We can just leave it collection one. That's fine. If we wanted to say ship, that's fine too. But we're, we really only need one collection for this. So we can just leave it at the default. Okay, so next I want to select the ship. But because the ship is in a group, I either have to go up to the hierarchy mode here and then select it. Or I can go back to object mode and then simply have the group selected down here in the outliner. And you can middle mouse click and drag from the outliner into this little include window like this. Or you can just click on add. And by default, all of your collections are going to be what's called a transform. So these are going to be basically just geometry that's attached to a transform node. So a transform node allows you to kind of move it around. So these are usually considered transforms. So now if I select the eye, it's only showing us the ship, which is really, really useful. Okay, so I'm going to create another one. And this one's going to be for clouds, type in clouds, right click, create a collection. I'm just going to leave that as collection two. I'm going to select all of these V-Ray volume grids. These are the clouds. And then I'm going to add them. The so next when I go back here, it's now added all of the clouds. And since the clouds are essentially in the background and they never go in front of our ship, it's very easy just to have all the clouds as a separated asset. So later on, we'll talk about what you do if you have like a, a like the razor crest going from behind a cloud, because that does change how you set up your render layers a little bit. But it's possible to do and is very, very common to do as well. OK, so now we have razor crest. Now we have the clouds. And the last thing that we need is simply the sky. So for this, we're just going to create a blank render layer and just type in sky. So that is just going to be just the sky right there. OK, so let's go to IPR. If we render just the sky, there's nothing there, just the sky and our horizon. If I go to clouds. I do have to stop the IPR and by default it, it should stop, but sometimes it won't. So it's always safer to stop it first. We can start here and now we're only getting the clouds. And if we go just to the razor crest, we just get the razor crest. But now the problem is we actually have the sky in every single layer, which is not what we want. We want to be able to have just the ship just the clouds and then the sky by itself. But there's a solution to that, and that is what is called an override. So anytime that you have any type of render layer in Maya, you can use what is called an override to change a specific setting on that layer. But in the master layer, it's going to be whatever it was before, whatever the default state was. So let's do this on the razor crest first. So on this layer, minimize that. I can go up to render settings go to overrides, go to environment, and we have this background texture. So if we click on the input connection to this, we can see that is the V-Ray sky. But I don't want to break this connection because if I break the connection, then on every single layer, we're going to get rid of the sky. So even our sky layer is not going to have it anymore. But what we can do, we can right click over where it says background texture, and then click create absolute override for visible layer. So when we do that, the channel turns orange to say that we've changed something. If we look in the razor crest layer here, we can see that render settings has an override on it. And now that it is overridden, we can change it. So we can select where it's gray and then just say, hey, we just want that to be black. So then we can go back to our IPR. And now you can see that the sky is gone. But we still have an alpha channel, so that's what we need. And next, if we go back to our sky layer, we can see that the background texture is not overridden. 
go back to IPR, and then we still have our sky. So that's a really, really useful use of an override. So next we can do the same thing for clouds. So I can go back to the clouds layer, right click over background texture, create absolute override for visible layer, click on the swatch, say it's black, and then an override has been created. Go to IPR, and now you can see that there's no sky. So once again, Razor Crest has no sky. The clouds has no sky. And then if we go to the sky layer itself, the sky is there. And it's useful to keep the sky layer on for your master layer as well. So when we select that, the sky is visible there. So the way that this works is that any additional layer that you create mimics the master layer. And any changes that you make on those layers, if you don't create an override, will affect all layers. If you want to change something, but only on that render layer, you have to create an override. And on the master layer, if you try to right click over a channel, like background texture, you'll see that there is no option to create an override because you can't override the master layer. So that is what the overriding means. You're overriding what the master is. So you can override nearly any channel inside of Maya. So for example, let's say for whatever reason, we had some backgrounds of something that only rendered in Arnold. I could right click over the V-Ray rendered using, create an absolute override for the render engine, and then say, hey, I want to use Arnold for this render layer. Really, really cool to do that. I could also do something like on the Razor Crest. I could say, hey, I don't want the landing gear to show up on this render layer, but maybe I want to show it landing somewhere else. And because this is not rigged, it's static. If let's say I just wanted to get rid of it and maybe just like paint out that section in Photoshop to make it look like the landing gear was retracted, I could say, all right, so go to the shape node and then go to object display. And then I could override visibility. So I could right click over visibility, create an absolute override for it, and then uncheck it. So now it disappears here, but on the master layer, you can see the landing gear extended. So it's really, really useful. You can do all sorts of things with it, and it opens up a lot of opportunities to simplify the compositing process and also your animation process as well. So I really wish that this feature existed in 3ds Max because it doesn't, and there's third-party plugins that pretend to do something similar, and they're just not as good. All right, so one thing that we did earlier, we go back to our render settings here. We created render elements. This is one specific thing I wanted to point out that by default, render elements or render passes or AOVs, they carry across every single render layer. So on the master layer, this is where they were created. Every other layer references your master layer and this copies it. But the only layer that we actually want to have any of these passes on is the razor crest layer. But if we go to the clouds layer, we don't really need any of these passes there. And then on the sky, it's just wasting space to try to you know, render out GI lighting and reflection and all of this because it's never gonna be used. There's nothing, nothing useful there. So you can click on any one of these on any pass, and then you can go to extra V-Ray attributes, and then you have what is the enabled or disabled. So if you click this, this changes from a yes to a no. If I click it here, they all change to no's. But this changes for every single render layer. So instead of what we're going to do on the Razor Crest layer itself, I'm going to select this layer. And we could either delete the passes and, and redo them. And by default, that would automatically create overrides for us on just the Razor Crest layer. Or we could manually override all of these passes right here so they don't show up on anything else. So I'll show you that way because it will allow me to show you something else as well. So on every one of these passes, we're going to select this under extra viewer attributes, right click and create an override. And we don't actually need to change anything here. We just want to make sure that enabled is set. So this creates a whole bunch of AOV overrides for us. You can see that they're all enabled. So on something like this, like specular, I could disable it here and you can see it disables here as well. So now what I can do on any layer that's not the Razor Crest layer, 
for example, our master layer, I can just click no, 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 no. And then if we go back to the razor crest layer, they're set to yes. If I collapse that, go to the clouds layer, they're set to no. And then on the sky layer, they're also set to no. That's really, really useful. Okay, so next I'm gonna go back to our camera and I'm gonna to go to our razor crest layer right here. I'm going to unlock this just so I could you know, get a final view of something that I'm happy with. Something like this. And really we probably would wanna do that on the master layer and we're gonna to have to start and stop that again just so we can see the clouds. I think actually I wanna make this a little bit higher up. So let's say that I'm satisfied with how this looks. All right, so now what we wanna do is render out all three of these. So later on, I will go over how to set up what is called batch rendering, even though I think the majority of you are probably just gonna use the PLE. If you are on campus, you can use batch rendering. And unfortunately, if you go back to, if you go to your rendering shelf, render sequence render, it's not really gonna do this properly but we're only dealing with a still right now, so it's not very important. Okay, so it doesn't really matter which one you start on, but we don't need our master layer. We can just start on the razor crest. And I'm gonna go back to render settings really fast. I'm gonna change our resolution to HD 1080. So this is going to be full HD. The renderable camera does not mean anything in this case, it's only for when you're batching and nothing else really, really matters for what we need. Uh, I did want to point out one thing that we are we are going to talk about this later. We are going to go under color mapping and I'm going to disable color mapping just by going to mode don't affect colors. I'll explain this in more depth hopefully later on. Uh, we can also change the type to linear multiply. This also just basically means there's no tone mapping. So either one of these does it, but really do this just to be safe. Never clamp your output, by the way, always leave that unchecked. And next I wanted to briefly show you the difference between progressive and bucket rendering. So progressive is what we use in IPR, so it does multiple small passes really, really quickly. So you can see your image very, very quickly. Bucket kind of does the opposite. So for bucket, I'm gonna clear the image here so you can see this how it works. The bucket, by default IPR, is only gonna use progressive. So to do bucket rendering, we actually have to click on this icon right here by default. But this, is, you're gonna see all the different threads of your CPU and what each thread is working on in like this multicolored array of squares. So the reason why you would ever choose bucket over progressive is A, if you have very little memory, but honestly, that's probably not a very good use anymore because you usually will have enough memory Bucket rendering does require less memory than progressive, but the main reason is progressive is dependent on your hardware where bucket is not. So progressive has a timeout feature by default and bucket just has a noise threshold by default. So if you're rendering on a render farm and you have computers of all sorts, so you have really old ones, really new ones, well, the really new one is gonna render really fast and the old one's gonna take forever but bucket ensures that they're all gonna be the same, that each, each image is gonna be the same quality. Whereas by default with progressive rendering, you have what is your maximum render time limit. If it's zero, it means it can go forever, so it would do the same thing as bucket. But where progressive becomes very useful is if you were on lower end hardware or you just really want to kind of force your render to finish within a certain amount of time. You can say, I only want this render to take a maximum of one minute or 30 seconds. This is in minutes, by the way, so you have to use decimal points. Or you could do, or you could do 15 seconds or something like that to get really, really quick renders that are gonna be very, very close to that amount of time. If you don't care, you can just say zero. And if you don't care with that, you may as well just use bucket rendering. But for this, we're gonna say something like, I want this to be a maximum of one minute. So after a minute, it doesn't like suddenly stop. It just tries to hit that target instead of trying to hit just the noise threshold. So on bucket mode, you only have a noise threshold 
And uh, this is this is fine. You can go even lower than this. It will take a lot longer. So we're going to say progressive one minute, and then we we're going to render out each of these images. We're going to start with the razor crest and click render. So even though the IPR kind of makes it look like it's done really quickly, we can see it is actually still rendering. It is working on specific parts. I'm not sure exactly which parts it's working on. It's kind of hard to tell with progressive where buckets very, very clear what it's working on, but we just need to let this finish. So this is going to take probably about a minute to do just because I said it could take a minute. So usually it's, it's going to be around about whatever you set it to. Okay, so now that it is done, we're going to confirm that our passes are here. So they are here. And next we're going to save this out. So we're going to make sure that you do save all image channels to a single file. And then this time I'm going to say Razor Crest Layer. Minimize that. Go to the clouds. And then the clouds are going to take the longest to render. And as you can see, this is really struggling to try to get this in under a minute. As you can see, this is going over a minute. If we had denoising enabled, this could be a lot faster, but we don't. So on the clouds, we're just going to let it work. So I will explain this for projects and exercises, especially the, the next thing that we do, because it will be very apparent of why we're doing it. Whereas this is just kind of a, a lecture, which hopefully you guys are following along. If you're not, I think you will find the next assignment to be very tricky because I'm not going to explain everything again. Volumetrics actually take quite a long time to render. If you are trying to follow along though, and this is taking forever, what you can do is just lower your time even more. You can also go to bucket. So if I show you this, you can also try doing bucket and then doing a much higher threshold, like remove this zero and just do 0.1. It's going to be much grainier, but much faster to render with bucket. You can try the same thing with progressive as well. You can lower the noise threshold, but I'm just going to let this render out so it's not super grainy. So if we scroll up to the top here, you can see this one took nearly seven minutes to render. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will always be able to hit this goal. Now, what we probably should have done is lower the threshold, but um, it's just for an example. Okay. So for this, it doesn't really matter if we want to do save current channel or save all channels because there's only one channel, really. So we can click that. And then for the next one, this will be the fastest by far. Just select sky and then click render. So this one will be pretty much instantaneous. Uh, does a little bit of stuff there, but it's now ready. And we can click this. say sky layer, and now we can go back in to After Effects. So we're going to set this all the way up again, just so we get the practice with doing this. So I'm going to open up the layers. So we get clouds layer, razor crest layer, and then our sky layer. This is not the a typical convention for naming files like this, but we'll, we'll do that later. There's a specific way that we're going to do it inside of V-Ray. And then I can actually just start with the sky layer there. And by default, it's going to be black because we have to right click over it, go to interpret footage main, and then say, hey, we're ignoring the fact that there's an alpha there. We want that alpha. I'm going to maximize the view here. And then I'm going to grab cloud layer above the sky layer, and then the razor crest layer like this. Hooray! So now we've got three separate things. And now we need to do our ASUS color profile. So right click, new. Adjustment layer, this kind of goes off the screen for you guys, sorry. Pull it up. Adjustment layer. Open color. Usually it will be the last place you save this, otherwise go back to the V-Ray frame buffer and grab the path there, like we did earlier. Display, input space, scene linear, ASUS CG. Good to go on that, but then we need the color profile converter. SRGB, SRGB, linearize. All right, a lot of steps, 
but just get in the habit of doing it because it is what is required. I can call that ASIS, I could call that OCIO, whatever. That's good. Okay, so now we had the same image that we had inside of Maya, but we have these separated into different parts, which is really, really cool. So if we'd be like, hey, the client decided that they don't want clouds anymore, we can just swap out the clouds. Or as you saw, the clouds took a really long time to render. So if you had to render everything together just to change the clouds, like if you look here, you'd be like, oh, hey, it's grainy. Great, now I need to re-render it or something. You could just re-render the clouds layer and it's completely separate. So it saves a lot of time. If you had everything in one layer and then you were like, hey, all right, so now we need to change the ship for some reason, or uh, we needed the landing gear to be down in this sequence. All we have to do is re-render the ship render layer and then everything else is good. So the clouds that took, you know, that could have easily taken 15, 20 minutes of frame to do a really high quality version at 4K. We don't have to do that. We only have to do that once and we can render as many different ships as we want to. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. This also allows us to do things like changing the color of the sky. So for this, I could grab what is called a Lumetri color effect. And this is the only way in After Effects by default that you can get your color temperature. So on color temperature, we can do things like make the tones cooler, make the tones warmer. So that's kind of overkill on both there. But if I want to just they give like a, a nice glow to the sky, I could do something like that. Or I could say, hey, it's supposed to be way darker. So in the elementary color, we could also have curves here. And then I could say, hey, I just want to darken the sky down. Do something more like that. And let's get rid of the uh, get rid of some of the temperature there. So it's not so ridiculous. The uh, horizon makes that kind of hard to use. We really want to hide that. We could even swap out the sky layer completely for something else. So like an, an HDR or something like that. Then for the razor crest layer, we do have all those embedded AOVs or passes. We can grab our extractor effect and do the same thing that we did before. So here we're going to grab GI, all that GI. This is going to be pretty much black here. There's like barely any bounce light just from itself from this angle. There will be lots of cases though where GI is like the most clear, but it's just because this is metal. We have lighting, change this to lighting. Then we're going to add lighting. Again, you're not really going to see anything here just because of the fact that we're using metalness. So you still have to do it though, because there will be certain cases where you see like, a, like you, see, you can see here a very thin amount of highlight. And if I click on this button right here, you can kind of change the exposure. So really, there is quite a lot of detail there. You just can't see it from your current exposure. So it is important to include it because certain angles will see it. And if you do some crazy color correction, you will see it too. So this is just a quick view transform thing. I can click that again to make it go back to normal. And then here we can do reflection or reflect, whatever you want to call it. This is going to be the most prominent of them all. Duplicate this. Refraction, grab our refract layer for the glass, which is going to be very, very pale right now. And then duplicate that one last time for specularity. All right, there we go. We have now composited the same thing that we just had, but now we have tons of control. We can change the sky independently from the clouds. They're completely independent too. So if I'm like, hey, I want the clouds to be a little bit brighter. Boom, no problem. Or hey, I want the clouds to have more contrast. I want them to look darker. You know, I can do that too. Like that. It's always better to have the ACES color profile on so you can see what you're doing more properly, but very easy to, to make changes like this without having to go back and re-render. And then I could do things like, hey, I wanted to change the specularity, maybe completely get rid of it. I don't want it to be shiny. <laughs> I mean, it's not physically accurate, but you could do something like that. Or you could say, hey, I'm gonna click T for opacity, just lower the opacity here. 
Now, if you do lower the opacity past 100%, you can use what is called a linear dodge instead. Um, certain times you will see a difference, but they're very similar. So I can also do really cool stuff like create a new adjustment layer. This kind of goes off the screen for you guys again. I'll just do it up here. New adjustment layer. Pull this underneath our ASUS color management here. I can go to effects and presets, do exposure. And on the exposure, I can increase the exposure like this. And it's going to get a really, really filmic or, or how the camera would, would see the exposure. Is it going to never completely clip? Like, yeah, that's really bad. It's blown out and everything. But the values here are never above one. And that is what is so great about this profile right here. It is great. I could change this to untone mapped and it's going to, that's clipped. That's really bad. But the values here never go above one. But this is still a clipped value. So the values that are around this highlight are still kind of maxed out at one. So even though that it doesn't let you, it doesn't let those values go beyond one, because beyond the sRGB 8 bit range, it's still clipped internally. So we always want to have that SDR video on. It's a really nice response. Anyway, I hope you guys found this lecture useful. We're going to be expanding upon this as we go throughout the course. And we're going to be hitting a lot of things that we've just talked about, but then actually doing something kind of more useful where we're, we'll actually create an entire scene. So this was kind of leading up to an assignment. And then in the next videos, we're going to be creating that assignment. And we're basically going to do a landing sequence for the Razor Crest. So make sure that your Razor Crest is all ready to go with all of your textures and everything. If you have any other questions, I'm always happy to help. And I'll see you all in the next lecture. All right, welcome back to the Razor Crest series. And now we're going to be starting our landing shot. In this video, we're going to be going over referencing and why you might want to consider using referencing over importing. If that sounds interesting, let's get started. Now, from this point forward, you probably want to follow along because this is going to become an assignment that you will turn in eventually. We're going to be creating a landing sequence for the Razor Crest. And this is going to go over some very specific things for creating a VFX shot completely in Maya and then compositing it in After Effects. We're not going to deal with any live action plates for this specific assignment, just to focus on the Maya aspect of this visual effects class. Okay, so what we need to do to begin with is set our project. So I have the project set here. Remember, if you don't have a splash screen, you just go to File, Set Project. Hopefully this is not new information at all. And you've always been setting your project, but I, I do get a lot of students that don't. So it's vital for this class that you do. Otherwise, all of our output and all of our references and everything are not going to work. So make sure you've set that. And next we need to load in the previous save that we had. If you have version one and you didn't make any changes to the Razor Crest, it's fine just to use version one. If you didn't have a version two though, and all your clouds and everything that we did in the previous lecture were also in version one, I'm going to show you what to do on that. And if you made any changes to the Razor Crest and the materials or anything, you would probably want the latest version. So I'm going to show you what to do with version two. So we're loading up version two, but the only thing that we need in this is the Razor Crest itself. And we're going to use this as what is called a reference. So just like we used an Alembic file, an APC file, to import this originally into Maya, for our visual effects shot that we want to create in Maya, we don't want to actually import the model. We only want to reference it. So I'll explain what that is in a moment. But in order to show you that, we need to clean up this scene and set the Razor Crest on its origin, just so it's a little bit easier to work with. Okay, so I'm going to go to a different view here. Go to my perspective view. And then we're going to start cleaning this up. So the very first thing is we don't need any of these clouds. So in the outliner, we can select all of those V-Ray volume grids and simply delete them. For the Razor Crest here, we want to reset the rotation. If you did any transforms, you'd also want to reset those. Basically, everything needs to be zero except for the scale, which should be one for each channel. You can also do that from the channel box here, but I prefer the attribute editor. Now for the Razor Crest, now the Razor Crest is grouped, so we could leave a group, but I'm not going to use a group for this. So I'm going to do edit, ungroup, 
But we will need some kind of hierarchy for this. So instead of using a group, we're going to use a locator. So we can do create locator. And we can scale this up just so we can see it. The locator basically is going to be our transform node or our transform controller for this. We need to figure out where we want it in relation to the, the hull of the ship. So usually what we do is for objects that are really large or like a plane that's very large, we want to have the center point a little bit lower down. So when you animate it, it looks like it's a little bit heavier. It, it just looks a little bit more sluggish. If you want it to be super fast and nimble, you can pull it up to wherever the wing is or the engines are like this. Now I know that the Razor Crest is supposed to be pretty nimble, but it's also, you know, it looks pretty bulky. So it's really up to you where do you put this. I'm actually going to put mine a little bit lower like this, just so it looks a little bit weightier when it's moving around. Once you have set that, we can take all of our objects and then middle mouse click and drag them into the locator one. And when you do that, you can see there's a little plus sign, open up that hierarchy and you can see all of the Razor Crest objects are in there. For locator one, we're going to double click on this and then call it Razor Crest Transform. This is what we'll be using to animate the Razor Crest. So everything will just fall into place there. The reason that I'm not using a group is when we reference it, groups can cause some issues depending on how you do it. So it just is a little bit simpler not to bother with groups on this. Okay. Some other things that we don't need, we don't need any of these render layers that we set up previously, so we can delete those. And then in render settings, we can go to overrides, environment, and then we can delete the sun. Now you could have deleted the sun from over here as well, but we also need to delete the sky because you can see the sky is being used for the background GI reflection. So we want to delete the sky. And when you do that, all of those channels get removed and then there's nothing to override anymore. Okay, so now we are good to go. All right, so now I need to save this, but we're going to do save as, and instead of doing a scene, we're going to do an asset. And you, you could put this in scenes, but we want to treat this more as an asset than an actual scene in this case. So we're going to do Razor Crest textured version one, and then click save. All right, so basically what we're going to do is use what is called a reference. So before we we did file import to import this Alembic file into the scene. So an import actually takes that geometry and then it loads it into the scene, but then it becomes part of the scene. And every time you save your Maya file, it's saving the geometry inside the Maya file. So if you take a look at video editors, for example, or anything that you ever do with programming, if any of you have, have dealt with programming before, you usually don't save files all in the same thing. You actually have separate files and you reference them. So much like After Effects or Premiere or Resolve, but for example, with After Effects, you have an AEP file, but that project file is actually pretty small. So instead of saving in all of those video files, we simply tell After Effects where it needs to load those in, and it's just going to save that location. And every time we open up After Effects, it loads in what is needed for the project. If you were to save everything inside the After Effects file, well, your After Effects files would be, you know, tens of gigabytes, or in some cases, hundreds of gigabytes, if it's trying to save in entire video sequences that are like really, really large. So it's much more efficient that way. And it makes sense just to keep your files lower because you don't know what you need until you've done your edit. And that's all the After Effects needs to worry about is what you are doing in that scene. So this means though that if you send your AEP file or your project file to somebody else or you switch computers, usually After Effects has no idea where those videos are. And if you didn't supply the video files, then it won't be able to load them up. So that's what we're going to be doing with this scene. And in order to drive the point home, basically, and show you some like real advantages of this, basically what we're going to do, open up, we're going to open up a new instance of Maya and I want to show you what the referencing does. All right, so I have a new version of Maya here. You also want to make sure this is set. And then I'm just going to do new. And for this, instead of going to file import, we're going to do file create reference and then click on the option box. This is going to be pretty important for references. I click on this and then we're going to scroll down and there's going to be a few options here. And I'm actually just going to open up this window. It's a lot of information there. Let's expand the whole thing. By default, it's going to rename any node that you import from a referenced file. And the same works for importing as well. 
If you've ever noticed that if you import an object from another Maya scene, it has this really, really long name on every object that you load in, it's going to be the same as the file. So this is kind of irritating, especially if you have a really long file name. So for example, on this, I have Razorcrest textured version 1.mb. Well, this entire thing up to the extension is going to be a prefix for every single node that you load in from this file, which is kind of irritating. For example, let me just show you what I mean. So if I load in the textured reference here, we can see that this is the same thing that we saw here, it's the same object with that locator and everything. But every single node has Razorcrest textured version one, colon, and then the same name. That gives huge names. And if you have even longer names, this can get pretty unwieldy. Like you have to open up all your hypershade windows to see everything. It's a little bit cumbersome. So instead, I'm just going to create a new scene again. We're going to do file, create reference, option box. And we're going to say use selected namespace as a parent and add a new string for anything in front of it. You could also do this one sometimes, but this one is going to be problematic with the render layer editor. And this seems to be a new thing with Maya 2022, but this is not going to be what we can do anymore. So anything that had the same name, for example, def default light set, it would do, it would put that prefix on only the things that had the same name. But in this case, it's going to mess everything up. So we're going to do this instead. And this is going to be really, really useful because it's going to be very clear to us what is referenced and what is not. So in this case, we're going to do reference underscore, and that's going to be a prefix on everything that we reference from the other file. There are some other options here, but these are all defaults and we don't really need to change anything else. And next we're going to do reference. So this is not going to be in our scenes folder. This is going to be assets. Razor Crest textured version 001. We're going to reference that. And the first thing you need to do when you load this in is make sure that your render setup, you see these icons, because if there's a problem, you won't see these icons and then you'll have a lot more work to do later to fix this. So once again, that is accessible on this button right here. So render setup, you need to load that in. We're going to be using that frequently now for everything that we do in Maya. All right. So when I loaded in this reference, you can see that we have a few referencings here that we probably didn't need. We don't need this reference perspective or reference camera, so we can delete those later. And then here on the Razorcrest transform, we have two things. We have that prefix, the reference underscore, and then the name of the transform object, and then all the objects underneath. But then there's also a little blue diamond in the upper left-hand corner of that icon. This indicates that it's referenced as well. Okay, so let me show you one of the biggest advantages of referencing. So for this, I'm going to grab the transform locator. I'm going to make sure the auto key is set on. If you don't like the auto key, that's fine, but I, I can only animate with the auto key. And I'm gonna pull this back. I'm gonna rotate this around. Click S to set all our keyframeable channels. They go all the way to the end at 200. I'm going to have it do a spin. It's going to fly forward. And it's going to do something like this. So it's basically doing a spin and then it's going to stop right there. Cool. So one of the most useful things about references is the fact that an animator can start using assets before they're finished. So let's say you're a modeler or a texture artist and you have not finished that model, well, the model doesn't have to be done for the animator or the layout artist or the lighting artist to work on it. So if you are at a much larger studio, you will see people specialize in specific fields like lighting, animation, rigging, all of that stuff. But if you're the modeler, well, modeling takes a long time and, and you're not just going to model it once and it's going to be done. There'll be changes or the client will decide, hey, we actually want to change the design. We want three engines instead of two or something. Well, if you had to wait for the modeler and the texture artists to finish, you would never have time to animate anything if you're an animator. And further down the pipeline, you have less and less time to work on it. So instead, you just work on whatever they have available at the time, which in this case, let's say we have this model. This model is you know, pretty much done, but there might be some minor things that have to change. So this is where referencing is very useful. So let's say I'm the layout artist and I just did a quick rough animation for the animator to then make this look a lot nicer. The modeler can keep working on this and then the animator can just update this model when they're done. 
So let me go back to the previous version here and just show you that example. So in this case, let's say that we wanted three engines for some reason, or the client did. They're like, yeah, we love this new design. We're like, okay, cool. Let me just delete that. And then for this, we'll say, all right, we, we made a version two. So I'll make a version two of this. So in your other Miocene, instead of having the problem of, well, I've already animated the object and now I have a new object, so what am I going to do? Well, I could still do a file import. I could reset all these channels on like a frame zero, for example. Like I could go frame zero and then have a new keyframe where I reset everything to zero and then hopefully all the animation, I can copy those keyframes over. It's, it's cumbersome, okay? Sometimes it's, very, it's pretty easy to do, but it still takes time. Other times it's almost impossible to update that model without having to redo a bunch of stuff. Instead, since this is referenced, all that I have to do is go to File, Reference Editor, and then instead of version one, I can right click, Reference, Replace Reference. So now I can load in version two. And now we have a third engine. But all the animation is still the same because that didn't change. That is one of the most useful things about referencing in Maya. The other really useful aspect of referencing is if you have very, very heavy geometry, let, let's say this was 3 million polygons, which for like film it is not, that's not that high, honestly, especially if you have a lot, a lot of deformations or you have a massive scene that that's probably on the low side. So let's say you have that and it's, you know, let's say you have a bunch of really high poly objects that you have, you know, entire landscapes and everything in your Maya scene. Well, every time you save that Maya scene, if everything was imported, well, your Maya scene could be several gigabytes large, which that might not seem like a lot, but after you have, you know, let's say 10, 20, 30, 100 iterations of that project and you're incrementing and saving or you're saving different versions, you're now using a massive amount of hard drive space and every time you save it, it can take longer and longer and longer to save. So referencing also keeps your file sizes much smaller because you don't need like 20 different copies of the same Razorcrest model in every Maya file. You only need one or however many versions that they created of that, but you don't need to keep importing that over and over and over again. So it keeps your file sizes low. Another really useful thing about your reference editor, once you have a lot of references in your scene, Let's say I, I was done with the Razorcraft and it's really heavy in the viewport and I just don't want to look at it. I don't want to load it. I don't want to waste system resources for something that I don't need to look at. You can simply uncheck it and you can see in the outliner here, you get a little X and it gets grayed out because that just means that you, you can't do anything with this. It's not, it's not even loaded anymore. Okay. So it's going to keep your scene really, really responsive. So it's not even there anymore. And whenever you need to render or you need to reference it for something, you can just turn it back on. That's really useful, especially if you have a lot of them. So with a reference, you can still do changes. Like you can still do things like, oh, oh, they messed up something here. Let me fix that. Or I, I need to redo the textures or I need to swap out a material or something. You can still make those changes. Although the, the main idea is you, you don't really make the changes there. You do them at the root of whatever you imported. That's the safest way to do it because sometimes you can mess things up depending on what they are. Later on, you might have to worry about that if you import a new reference, but for the most part, it's, it's okay. Some things you cannot do with referencing though, like you can't decide that you're going to completely change all of the geometry and expect everything to be fine. Now, since we only animated this locator, technically, we could swap out the Razor Crest for any ship. It wouldn't even matter as long as it has some kind of locator and you could change anything underneath it and everything would be fine. Like any of these objects would be fine. Now the problem would be though, if I started animating things like the gun turrets and if I merge the gun turrets to the hull in what we're referencing, well, that's going to screw up the animation here and certain things are going to break. Same thing with rigging, for example, like Let's say you started completely changing how this thing moves, but you've already been animating using another rig. Well, that would be a problem. So you do have to think about how you're using references, but referencing can be very, very useful, especially for you as a student. If you have large scenes, it's very easy just to put all your assets, like 
like you would in Unreal, for example. You have all your assets, and if you want to replace it, all you have to do is you know replace that that asset with a new one. And then your main file, everything is just you know on the origin, and it's very easy to make modeling changes instead of saying, oh, okay, well, my ship's like this, but I wanted to you know add a part here. Well, it's very difficult to make make changes to the UVs or the textures or the model if the object is not is not zeroed at the origin. This is harder. So that's another advantage for referencing for you guys. Okay. Hope that makes sense. I know this was kind of a long explanation, but I feel like it's an underused thing in, in our program that I think you guys should, should start using. So a couple of things that you might run into though, if you start using references, is if you don't set your project or you move wherever that reference is, Maya might not be able to load it. So you'll probably get a little error when you first launch Maya that, hey, it can't find the reference. So what you can do is simply right click, reference, replace reference, and then just go find wherever that is. Okay, right, so I hope that makes sense for references. Now we're gonna do it all over again in a blank scene, just so you remember what to do. So file, create reference. We're going to go to the namespace options, use selected namespace, and put in some kind of tag. If you don't want it to say reference, you don't have to do that. You could simply do an underscore but do something that makes sense. Like I'm gonna do reference underscore, then do reference. We actually don't need that version two. I'm gonna delete that one. And we're just gonna load in version one. Now for these cameras, we need to go back to the scene that we were referencing, which was the one with three engines. I don't actually wanna save that one. So I'm just going to load in version one again. No, don't save that. And this is now the same thing. I can also delete these two objects here, but the perspective and the camera, save this, go back to our new scene, file reference editor, right click, and now I can do what's called reload the reference. So it's, it hasn't been upversioned, it's still in the same file, but we're simply gonna reload it. And now you can see those two cameras have been removed. The important thing to note here is though, in your render setup, you need to make sure that you can see these icons and when you create a layer, it is actually going to create a layer. If you can't do that, then you need to make sure that when you reference it, you don't merge the selected namespace, okay? You might also get some errors over here saying that, hey, this is, this is read-only because some, some things in references you cannot change. For the most part though, it's, it's okay to change things like the model or make some changes to it, but certain things are locked because it could screw you over, okay? Right, so we wanna make sure that that is referenced because later on we might swap out this model or I might give you a different ship or something that it would be important if it's referenced. If you have any questions on referencing or anything else that we've done so far, please feel free to leave a comment. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, guys, in this next part, we're gonna be going over some basic layout going to need to do some rough animation of the Razor Crest landing and this is going to be useful to you and it's going to be useful to your supervisor or maybe even the client so they can get a quick read to see if this shot is going to be working. So even if you are just working for yourself it's always a good idea to establish the camera angles that you want and some rough areas where your hero model is going to be and some basic environment just so you can understand if that is going to be worth your while continuing. So that's what we're going to be doing here. The end result is going to be pretty rough, but we will be refining it throughout this series. I also wanted to mention a quick disclaimer. As I progressed through making these tutorials, I realized that I didn't make the scene to scale. And this is pretty embarrassing. That's something that you should always do. It's definitely a noob mistake. But I was just tunnel visioned on making these tutorials and just getting on to one section to the next completely escaped me that I never made it to scale. So if you are interested in following along exactly, it doesn't really matter. You can still have it really small. But if you want to make sure that you are working at real world scale, I would highly recommend looking up dimensions like real world dimensions for the Razor Crest or whatever ship or vehicle that you're using and base your scene around that. Later on, we're going to be doing stuff with dust. And for the dust, I have to make the dust really tiny so it fit the scene. It doesn't really matter and you can't really tell, but it's definitely unprofessional not to make your scene to scale. So I made a mistake and I wanted to warn you in advance that uh, I will 
figure that out later, but I'm not going to correct it for this series. All right, so before we continue, we need to save our scene. So to save this, we're going to use a typical VFX convention. This would be the project name. So in this case, we're just going to use our class, but usually it's a three letter or four letter prefix and then the season and then the episode number if you're doing episodic television. For film, I'm not sure. I've never really worked on film, but I've, most of my stuff is being for television. So usually that's the convention. Next, we would have the sequence name, which is usually just a bunch of numbers. And then we have the shot number or shot name. So in this case, it's just landing, but usually it would be numbers and sometimes letters. Then we have the version number. So once that is all good, we can click save. And the next part of this is what is called staging or layout. So if you are at a bigger company, there'll sometimes be dedicated roles for this. The idea is quickly get something together, someone who knows a little bit more about what the scene is supposed to look like, and then can pass that off to an animator. So the animator can look at how it's staged and go like, okay, let me, I'll make that look a lot better, but I get it now. Okay. If you are at a smaller place or you just don't have the time, often you will not have that. But even for you guys, this is a useful technique to use to quickly iterate through versions and, and establish what the shot is going to look like. Sometimes you'll have a storyboard, which in my case is very rare. Like I very rarely got a storyboard. So sometimes a storyboard is never done. Or sometimes if it is done, by the time it gets to you, it's changed so much that it's useless and they never updated the storyboard. So sometimes they'll send you one, but more often than not, the client will just say something like, hey, we want the razor crest to be landing and it's going to have some like cliffs or cave or something behind it and it's going to be landing into this like crevice and then there's like a cave or something. I, I don't know, like some kind of environment, but we know that it's going to be about eight seconds long. The camera is going to be pointing up and then it's going to track the razor crest landing. Okay. And then you're like, okay, uh, eight seconds, it's about 200 frames. So I'll just do something that's 200 frames. You can take a look at it and see if it's in the right direction. What you don't want to do is spend 20, 30 hours working on a really beautiful shot that's rendered to perfection. And then the clients say, that's not at all what we wanted. So usually you do these quick mock-ups just so you can kind of block out how everything is going to work. This is very useful for you, very useful for a creative director or you're a team lead or something like that. Sometimes the client will understand what they're looking at as well, but usually the clients are like, it's not really going to look that bad, is it? So it just depends on the industry, but it's very useful before it even gets to the client. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing at this point. All right. So in order to do that properly, what we're going to want to do here is first, we want to kind of create some very, very rough geometry for where our environment's going to go. So I kind of imagine that the Razor Crest is going to be surrounded in like a cliff or something or cliffs on either side or just rocks or whatever. So to mimic that, we're just going to grab a cylinder on the cylinder. We're going to drag this out thing like this. I'm going to go to face mode, select just the top faces, pull this up, and then I'm going to delete the top faces. And because our camera is going to go inside this somewhere, we probably want to Maybe make that just a tad bit bigger, like that. And then we want to flip the normal. So on the modeling shelf, you want to go to mesh display, reverse, like that. And then this is not necessary, but just so we remind ourselves, and if a client did look at this or our creative director looked at this, you can see that, hey, this is not actually going to be a perfect cylinder. It's not like a man-made object. It's going to be some kind of cliff or something. So we're just going to roughen this up just a little bit, just so it doesn't look so perfect. I'm going to lower this part because our camera is going to be closer to here. And I don't, I don't really know what's going there yet, but something like this is perfectly acceptable. Maybe we'll make that a little bit spikier like that. Okay, cool. Looks a bit awkward, but there you go. Next, we need another camera. So we can, so for this part, I actually want to have two views open. So I can right click on this right here, and then I could do two panes side by side. So you get your screen divided in two sections vertically or stacked. So they're on top. I'm going to do side by side, and this is going to duplicate our view, which is fine. But on the right hand side, I want to do a new camera. So I can do create camera, camera, 
or I could simply right click over this camera icon and then just do a new perspective camera. So on the new perspective, we can name this camera one. I just think that's a little bit easier rather than having a new camera at the origin and then having to reposition it every time. It's a little bit more efficient just to do this. Okay, so next what we're gonna do, I think the best way to do this is do this in reverse. So we're gonna find where the ship needs to be at the very end and find where our camera needs to be at the very end and then we'll go the other direction when it's gonna be in the air. I think that's usually the best approach. If you try to do it the other way around, like starting as the ship is coming down, like in the air there, it can be a little bit harder because the most important part of the composition is gonna be where the ship is at the end. So I'm gonna to switch to my camera here. I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna click on the resolution gate and then I can just orient this in a position where I'm where I'm happy with it. So in terms of in terms of composition, we want to make sure that the ship is well centered in frame in this case. Because it's going to be occupying so much of this, the frame, we we don't really need to worry about rule of thirds and all that. You could start to break the image down a little bit and be like, well, the cockpit would intersect a rule of thirds, and so would the engine. The main subject here is is the ship and for it to be kind of well balanced, we probably want the the engines to be, you know, screen right or screen left or whatever. You could flip this around; it wouldn't matter if you if your ship was pointing screen left to screen right. This is going from screen right to screen left in terms of where the guns are pointing and the cockpit is. But a composition is is not that difficult. But there are a few few rules. Like for example, you wouldn't want to have anything that's near the edges or touching the edge. Like you can see the engine there is touching the edge of the frame. That looks really bad. You never want to do that. You also don't want to make it so interior forms like the gun, for instance, you wouldn't want that to be like right at the edge of the ship, like right here, because that looks really, really awkward right at this section there. So you want to make sure that everything is far away from an edge, like where the main forms are far away. This allows you to zoom in with your camera or cut in in post if you needed to. And it also allows you to do things like camera shake. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about camera shake later. We'll be doing that in After Effects. We won't be doing that in Maya. Okay, so I, I think this is going to look pretty good. I think actually what we might want to do is, I think I'm just going to tilt the camera down just a little bit. The Razor Crest looks a lot more intimidating, more impressive if we, if we kind of look up. And because we're going through the floor here, I'm going to just lower this whole thing down a little bit. And then we'll we'll add some rocks or something so it's landing on like some kind of platform. And then for the focal length, should have done this earlier, but if we select our camera, go to the attribute editor, I think 35 is a little bit too zoomed in. So I'm going to do 24. Now in the previous lecture, we talked about if you are shooting a plane that's in the air, you'd have to be in another plane or some other aircraft would have to be filming it regardless of whether it's like a, a drone or an actual cameraman hanging out of a helicopter or whatever, or in another plane. Because this is simply landing, you could just put a stationary camera there. It's not really going to be in the way of harming anyone or anything. And I'm thinking about this again, if this was a real life shot, like an onset thing where a real aircraft was landing. Doesn't tend to happen very much anymore, but it can still happen with like helicopters and stuff like that. But a 24 is going to be a very common focal length and it's going to add quite a bit of distortion to the Razor Crest. So we're going to get a bit more foreshortening and I think it's actually going to be to our advantage here. I think it's going to look pretty cool in the frame and I'm happy with that. Okay, I'm going to select the camera, click S because we want to make sure that is keyframed there and I'm going to click S on the Razor Crest as well. And one thing I, I just realized is we probably don't want that to end right at frame 200. Let's move in like a second or so. So we'll do something like 76. Let's move that keyframe over. And on the camera, we'll do the same thing. So we have like one second of a lock off. And a lock off means the camera is not moving. And then we can go all the way to the very beginning and grab the razor crest. And then we'll just lift this up. I'll go to my channel box so I can see all of the transforms. I'll lift that up just a little bit. And then I think I might rotate this round.
something more like that. And then we've got the, the ship kind of landing down. Something, something similar to that. But now, of course, the, at the beginning, we don't see any of that in frame. So let's take our camera. And at the very beginning, we're just going to rotate that up like this. And I think what I'm going to have to do is actually lift this whole thing up a little bit. But we'll, we'll see how this goes. So that, that looks good there. It, it goes out of frame, but that's fine. But the, in terms of the overall speed, I'm pretty happy with it. I think we are going to actually have to lift this up a little bit, rotate this back down. All right, so now we're going to go to the point where the ship gets pretty far out of frame, and that's going to be our cue to where we need to add another keyframe, much like we did with the rotoscoping or just general in-betweening. We're going to pull this up, and now that will be in frame for the whole time. And then we could add some extra adjustments after we've kind of played around with how the Razor Crest is actually going to land. So for the Razor Crest itself, we could go to something like 50 frames or so in, and then we could just make some tweaks to it. Like we could just have it tilt a little bit more. Maybe we can tilt forward a little bit. We want to give it maybe a little bit of turbulence, and we could do that with an expression. But we might be able to get away with it get away without having to do that on this. We could either tilt the nose down a little bit as it's coming in, and then at, just before it lands, what we probably want to do is either have it almost hover for a little bit before it hits the, the surface. Have it just go up a little bit, like maybe a little bit more. Flare it back just a little bit. I'll move this keyframe over. And then here it's going to flare up and then it's going to hit back down. All right, so now let's play this in real time to see how this looks. So if you were to play this directly, it's going to go like super fast, which is not following uh, 24 FPS. And we can only see one view at a time. So if you go to your animation preferences button, it's like the guy running away from the gear. For the playback, let's do 24 FPS times one. And then for the update view, we'll say all. So now when we scrub, all of the views update. And then if we play it, it's going to play in real time. If you have a very heavy scene, sometimes it will jump frames and not be able to hit them all. So that's why the play every frame button is available. But for this, there's not a lot going on in the scene. So this should be pretty manageable. All right, so this is it looks it looks fine except for this part here where it kind of pops up it's a little bit awkward so i'm going to stop the animation select back on the razor crest and it's this part right here so let's just let's actually pull all of these out this way because i want to have a little handle at the end where it's just going to be pretty still something more like that and then as it comes in it kind of eases in but we can imagine that when the camera starts rolling but when the shot starts, the Razor Crest is already going down at a pretty fast speed. So let's go to Windows, Animation Editors, Graph Editor, and then we'll go to the Translate Y. And instead of easing this, we're, we're just going to have that linear to begin with. So it's already coming down pretty quickly. And then it can land. If that looks a little bit too fast, what we could do here, we could ease that a little bit more. So we could pull this down. So it's gonna slow into that. I think that might look a little bit better. So just scrubbing through that, that looks a little bit better. And now the camera gets a little bit out of alignment. So at frame 96, we need to just rotate that to keep it in frame. And we want to actually keep a little bit more on the top than the bottom. So notice this more, we would be able to see more sky or more cliff or whatever we have there. All right, so that looks okay for like a super rough draft. And then you would play blast this, show it to somebody, and then they would be like, oh, okay, yeah, it looks good or whatever. And then you could do, you know, extra 
extra motion as the ship lands. So for example, we could detach these, something that we probably want to do back in our reference. I think I might actually want to do that, just to detach this part from the gear. So then we can actually show the gear kind of like pushing down a little bit. I think that might look kind of cool. I don't want to go as far as creating a rig for it. But like as the ship comes down, I want it to kind of do like a little bit of a bounce right there. It's very subtle. But the way this, the hierarchy is set up here it doesn't really lend itself to be able to do that easily. Let's go back to the scene that we're referencing. So we can take the windows, main engines, the guns, the top engine covers, all of this stuff except for the gear essentially. And then we can attach this to the main body. So attaching that to the main body means that we still can move everything around just like we could before, no problem. But now we can take the entire Razor Crest and just do like a little bump, thing like that. So some things that we probably would want to fix, we'd want to fix the fact that this should kind of react a little bit. All of this should be rigged. But for the purposes of this assignment, let's not worry about that. And we're actually going to be compositing some dust over this. So we're probably not really going to see it either. Let's just see if we can get by without having to do that. The important thing is though, we do want to have this main body include all of the extra bits that are attached to it. That's going to make our life a little bit easier. Let's save that. And we'll go back to our main shot here. Go to File, Reference Editor, and then we'll just right click, and then reload the reference. So now when you select it, you can see that the whole thing has been altered a little bit. But nothing else changes, like the rest of the animation is still good. So as this comes to land, and just so this is a little bit more clear, I'm going to grab another cylinder. And we're going to place a cylinder where the Razor Crest is going to be landing on. It could just be a raised piece of terrain or some extra rocks or something. Not really going to be a perfect platform, but it does need to be on a level like this. Some kind of like higher part because we want the camera to be allowed to go a little bit lower without having to worry about clipping through the floor. All right, so as the Razor Crest comes down like this, I actually pull this forward a few frames. Then we can select the Razor Crest body itself. Go to frame 172-ish, click S. We can go forward, let, let's say four frames. We could even tilt that down just a little bit like that. There goes, that's actually a lot of, that's a, a lot of rotation. Didn't mean to do it that much. Something like that. And then we'll copy this keyframe. Just shift select it. Right click, copy, and then we'll go forward, say 184, paste. That looks a little bit fast. Pull this one out a little bit. And then maybe this one will have that pretty slow. And that looks a little bit like it's, it's easing into it, but really it shouldn't ease into it. It's going pretty quickly. So it needs to be ramped up at the beginning. So we'll go back to our graph editor. We can go to the rotate X, grab that keyframe, and then just rotate this up like this. So now notice that when it lands, it doesn't ease into it. It's already going pretty quickly. So as soon as that goes down, that's also going to bounce a little bit. We could actually take all these keyframes and just nudge them over by a frame or two. And I think I might actually want to just extenuate that just a little bit more. We could even just give it a little bit of a rock motion to that. One thing that helps if you if it's making if it's going way too quickly is to drag your mouse over and then you have a little bit more control if you if you your mouse is further away from the gizmo when you rotate so you just need to play around with it and find something that works for you
go back to our camera here. And we can see it does that little rock. That's still a little bit too much. I don't want to go. I don't want to go that crazy with it. So on the rotate Z here, I'm just going to do negative one. And it's still a little bit laggy, like we would expect that to be a little bit quicker. Let's move that back by just a few frames. That looks better. Something more like that. Now the Razor Crest as a whole is going by pretty slowly here. And at this point at around frame 96, I think I want a different view of this. I think I want something that's like this. And then here, I, I think it could be flared back just a little bit more. It can hit the ground like that. Like that. Okay, so something like this I think is pretty good for a rough draft. You would basically just play blast this out if you were doing this for real. For me, I, I don't need to see this ever unless you want to show me it. It's just, uh, it's basically just for you, just so you can get something that looks pretty good. I am going to make one more adjustment before we move on. And I'm going to take the camera and then just rotate that down just a little bit there. So it's kept more in frame. And later on, we can smooth out this animation. But I think for right now, I think this looks this looks OK. It's enough for us to move on to the next part. All right, so let's save this. And now let's do some really, really quick lighting just to get the overall idea of what this is going to be. So for a lot of lighting, it's really nothing that complicated. It's just an HDR or a sunlight. You can also use a combination of the two. In this case, I am going to use a sun because I, I do want this to be sky and I think that would be more useful. Now it's up to you if you want to use an HDR or if you want to go do something with uh, sunlight. I don't really care for this as long as it looks good, but I'm just going to set up a quick V-Ray sun. And before we do that, we do need to change our renderer from Arnold to V-Ray. So don't forget to do that. And then in overrides, I'm going to go down to environment. I'm going to create a sun and create sky. And then for this next part, I'm going to I'm going to turn off this button right here, which is the gate mask. So this is useful to see what the camera is going to see, but I also want to see more of the viewport as well. And then I'm going to turn on the V-Ray viewport IPR just so we can see this kind of work in real time and close to real time. Uh, before we do that, though, we don't forget we need to change our camera to a V-Ray physical camera. So attributes. V-Ray physical camera. And then in the extra V-Ray attributes, we have those controls there. In this case, I don't really care about any of those other settings for right now. I just want to move the sun. OK, so the idea for this, we want to create some kind of dramatic lighting or just something that's a little bit more interesting. I don't really want to see it in the viewport. And it could be fairly low. I'm not really sure how wide we want this to go. And honestly, we could actually make this, this cave area or this, these rock areas just a little bit larger. Let's space that out a little bit. That's going to give us a little bit more room to play with. And pull this up a little bit. Scale that up a little bit more. Just so we can see what the light would be blocking, basically. So let's progress this a little bit further into the animation where the ship turns. I think I'll raise that sun out. But basically, you just want to place this somewhere just to get a good idea of kind of what you're thinking. We could do something more evening. That would be fine, too. We don't want to have it super dark, though. And we don't necessarily want to see the sun. It just depends. But something like this would be pretty useful. I'm going to trim that off now. And then later on, we will do a lot more with the lighting. But for right now, I think we are in a good position. All right, in the next video, we're going to actually make our environment look a lot nicer with proper assets. All right, see you guys in the next video. All right, welcome back to the Razorcrest series. And now we need to make our environment look 
a lot nicer. So in the previous one, we just had some basic block out of where we wanted geometry to go, but now we need to actually make that into proper geometry. Now for this, I am using some third party assets. You will need to find your own for this, but this is hopefully going to give you an idea of how you can begin to make your environment look a lot better. We're also going to be going over V-Ray displacement. So if you're here just for displacement, check the chapter links and you can skip ahead to that section. All right, let's get started. Okay, so at this point, what we need to do is start to set up the scene to make it look just a little bit more like the end result. So instead of using this kind of crappy cylinder, we are going to replace this with actual assets, like some rock and cliff assets. All right, so the first thing that we need to do here is either template or reference this placeholder geometry. And we can do that by creating a new layer. And this is a display layer, not a render layer. And then selecting either the template, which is this, or you can click it again for reference. What that's going to do is still going to be visible in the scene, but it's not. you're not going to be able to click on it. And this is going to be a useful guide when we start placing our proper rock assets. Now, speaking of some rock assets, the ones that I used for this were available on CG Trader. They were paid, but they are very good. So if you're interested in using the same ones, these are the ones I used. If you're not interested in this one, there are quite a few other ones on CG Trader. There's also Turbo Squid, and you can find similar types of assets. You could even go for ones that are not a collection, but are just singular assets and then copy them out. Another really popular choice is Quixel Megascans. So on this site, if we just type in cliff and go to 3D assets, nature, rock, cliff, and there's quite a few very good assets that you could use. Now to use Quixel Megascans for Maya, it does cost money. It's not free like the Unreal one. So if you're interested in, in that, I would highly recommend that. Otherwise, just keep some placeholder geometry until you have some assets that you think would be usable for it. You can also model this yourself in Maya or go into ZBrush or however you like to do it. And perhaps you don't even want a cliff. Perhaps you want to do something different, right? So that's up to you. You could even do this on an open plane. The rest of the concepts of this course are going to be the same. It doesn't really matter what the background is because you're still going to be able to apply all the skills and knowledge to be able to do this for whatever scene you like. Okay, right. So hopefully in the future, I will be able to provide you with my own assets. I just don't have the ability to do that right now. In terms of the photo scanned aspect of this, I don't really have any that I can give you and I don't really have any time to make them. They are, they are quite intensive, but uh, it's something I would like to do in the future, especially for some other ideas I have for content for this YouTube. But uh, yeah, just go and check out these if you are interested. As I said, this is the one that I'm using and I'll put a link in the description. All right, so whatever you choose to use it as your environment, make sure you download it, put it inside the assets folder. Make sure the textures are in the source images folder. And then we can go back to Maya. To access those, we're going to go to File Import. Now you can reference these if you want to, but I know for sure that we're never going to be changing these rocks. Whereas the Razor Crest, at some point, I might give you a different model, or you might want to use a different model, like you might want to use a different ship or something like that. So let's go to Import for this. Then we're going to go to Assets. We can import this first Cliff OBJ object. And all of these objects came in really small. Something we should have talked about which is setting your scale up properly. The Razor Crest though, never really had a scale that w when we imported it, I don't believe. So everything is gonna be pretty small. So if we just created, let's say a box here, this is one centimeter. So going however many meters that is across, I think that's actually way too small for what we need. Something we should have addressed, but uh, kind of forgot about that. Uh, regardless though, these objects also come in small so we can just scale everything up. We're just going to place a few of these around here. So I'm just going to move this one over here. I'm going to import object number two. We'll drag that out. And then number three. We also have some rocks as well, just regular rocks. And these actually come in pretty small. One thing I am going to just do here just to clean this up, I'm going to select my razor crest, create a new layer for that. 
I'll just type in Razor Crest for that display layer and then turn off the visibility just so we, oh, we're not constantly looking at it. So we can scale these up, do what we want with them. But basically, we want to create a shape that kind of goes around this perimeter here. But before that, let's actually assign some materials. I'm not going to show you all of these, but I'll show you just the first one and then you can do the rest yourself. So we're going to select the Cliff 1 mesh, right click, assign new material, V Ray MTL. Let's call this Cliff 01 mat. On the diffuse color, I'm going to grab a file. I'm going to load in the Cliff 1 albedo. And if we turn on our textures here, you can see this kind of update. So we got some nice textures there. For the reflection color, crank that up to one. For the reflection glossiness, uh, this is actually going to be roughness to change that, but we're going to load in the roughness. Oops, clip one roughness. Color space, we're going to do utility raw. And then we absolutely have to change this to be used roughness, otherwise our rocks are going to be super shiny. For the normal map, we need to change the type from bump to normal and tangent space. And then for the map, we're going to grab cliff 01 normal, color space. Now this one, it is important that it is raw and it's not sRGB color, so that's important. All right, so what you need to do before we get too far into this, Go ahead and texture all the rest, and then we'll finish up placing our assets. So now I've got all of those textured there. This collection also comes with like a bonus map or just gravel. So I'm just going to create a new plane here. I'm going to add a new material for this. Let's call this gravel. But the gravel one's going to be really useful for us. We're going to grab that. Use roughness. And then lastly, for the normal map, one thing that I wanted to show you here is that every time that we make a change, like we say, hey, this is raw, but then we say reload, it changes back to sRGB. So you can always click ignore color space file rules. But then you have to do that on every single node. So I want to show you how you can do this globally with a color space file rule. If you go to Windows, Settings and Preferences, Preferences, go into Color Management. And I spoke in a, one of the previous lectures about what a rule is, or that you could create a rule. And rules set up what the color space is going to be. So let me just show you an example. And let me add a rule here, and we'll call this normal so for normal maps and for normal maps anything that has the word normal in it what we want to do is say automatically change it so it's raw well for the image extension this could be for literally any type of file so we could just say anything that's what the little asterisk is and then to say normal we would simply type in normal so this means that your texture has to have normal spelled like this somewhere in the name and if you do it like with two asterisks, it's anywhere in the file path that says normal would automatically be changed. Now, the problem is, though, that this might be a lowercase normal, but on the razor crest, it could be a capital N. So if we go back to, if we go back to source images, RC textures, and have a look, these are capital Ns for normal. So that's kind of a problem. So instead, what we want to do is do this notation. So we do bracket. And then we'd say like N, then capital N, close bracket, normal. So this means any file that has either lowercase or uppercase that has a normal in it, that's going to look for both of those. Kind of a, an odd syntax, but that's just the way it is. And then what we do for the input color space, we would say, hey, this is going to be raw. And then you say reapply rules to scene. And notice what's going to change here for the color space. 
changes to raw. So now if I change this to a different file, like I do, uh, let's say, oh, let's say I accidentally put displacement in there, changes to sRGB, right? Then I go back to gravel and I say gravel tileable, automatically gets changed to raw. That's useful. You can set these up for anything that you want to. So you could do roughness or displacement or anything. So it's, a, it's a useful thing to do. Uh, we could quickly do one for roughness. No roughness, any type of image, lowercase r, capital, capital R, roughness. Now you do need to be kind of careful with this because sometimes you may not have actually named the file but what you thought you named it. So this does say roughness, but if you said rough, well, that's not the same thing because it's not going to find it. So you can set this up so it's like anything that has rough in it would be tagged, but is an odd syntax, I will say that, and you do have to look it up. Uh, Maya does have a page on that if you're interested. Now the input color space for this would be raw. And then we're good to go. So then we just say reapply rules to scene. And now if we go back to the gravel mat, reflection roughness, it's changed there. If I try to change it back, it will change. But if I reload it, it'll get reset. Okay. This is a useful thing. I should have probably shown you that in the previous video. But something that will probably be useful as you progress throughout the course. I wanted to show you some quick texture tricks on this. So obviously, if we, if we increase the size of this, our UVs are completely wrong. So probably the easiest thing basically to do, because we have several channels, so if we go back to the hypershade here, and we graph this. We have roughness, normal, and albedo. I don't know why albedo is all the way down there. Looks cleaner like that. But uh, we have three maps and we have three of these texture nodes. Well, on the texture nodes, it's very convenient to do something like this where we say, hey, repeat. You could say four by four, for example. That will just repeat. We'll just tile that texture four by four. But then we'd have to do it again on this one. We'd have to do it on this placement node and this placement node. And I want to show you displacement in a minute, and it would have to be done on displacement as well. So that's really convoluted and, and not particularly useful. All right, so this is Lyndon from the future, looking at what I'm about to show you and thinking, why on earth did I show you that way? So what I'm about to show you still technically works, and it is a really quick hacky solution that requires pretty much no effort. But I wanted to show you quickly some other things that are probably better practice and give you a bit more control. So first of all here, anytime that you have multiple maps and they each have a separate placement node, that's potentially problematic because if you go to one placement node and then you do the repeats, let's say we're doing four and four, well now you're gonna have to remember to do that here and here. What I show in the video, you can just grab one of these nodes, attach them like this, that is perfectly fine, but you're still losing all the other operations here. So instead, let's just delete two of them. We can also delete these. And if you hold down the control key and then middle mouse click and drag the orange circle into the white circle, it automatically will create the default connections. So now you have a single placement node that's affecting all three texture maps. All right, so that's one way. Second thing that's useful is the UVW randomizer. So if I click tab, just type in UVW, grab the UVW randomizer. So what this does, it will take tiled images and then randomly rotate them. So all we need to do, we can continue to use this placement node. If we click on these little bars here, we can grab the input, take the out UVs, slap it in there, delete the original placement node for the UVW randomizer because we're using ours. And then you can click it one more time and we can take the out UVs and plug them into the UV coordinates of our texture nodes. And what that's going to do is going to automatically do some randomization. If you turn on this stochastic tiling right here, I would like to do another video on this. I don't want to get too far into stochastic tiling. I'm sure other people have also done videos on the UVW randomizer. Really useful. I made one a while back for a custom solution for Redshift. But this is a pretty good solution for V-Ray. 
All right, so let me quickly show you this in action. So this is what we've got currently. Let me just hide the razor crest so we can see this better. We can see there's a noticeable tiled pattern. This is either by expanding the scale of the UVs or just repeating them. And next, if we middle mouse click and drag this onto our plane, now you can see that that pattern is completely gone. So if we zoom in here, there's no discernible pattern with the stochastic tiling on. Just remember though, with the UVW randomizer, if you don't turn on your stochastic tiling, you'll still get a pretty noticeable grid. So you want to make sure that that is turned on, All right? Just wanted to show you that because when I recorded these lectures, that's going back to over six or seven months ago, I didn't know about the UVW randomizer, but it is a pretty useful node. So this is probably a lot better than what I show you in the next part here. But uh, based on our camera angle, it's not really important and we're not going to notice any tiling. But if you move your camera down and you pull back a bit, you will probably notice tiling. So I would recommend this workflow if you are looking for a quick solution for doing some randomization. Just remember to turn on stochastic tiling. So now we're going to go back to the original lecture and I'm going to show you a technique that does not require modifying the placement node. So what we can do, we can do something like this. We, on the placement texture, we can just take one of them as reference and then plug the UVs into all of them. And then when we select the, the gravel tileable, for example, and then we go to the texture node 17, you can see, hey, look, been added. And we select this one. And then we can see, hey, texture 17 has been, placement node 17 has been added. And it's four by four. Same thing on this one. It's been added. But the problem with doing that is if we add displacement, you have to remember to do that. It's fine to do, but if you like that method, I'm going to reattach these though, because I think the majority of you don't care about that and would rather just do it with the UV editor because you're probably more familiar with that. So that's what we're going to do and that's fine. So I'm going to put this back. This is really useful though, if you already have everything UV'd and you can't change your UVs, all right? If you wanted to have something that kind of went over the top of your existing UVs and just tiled the specific texture over it, this is very useful to remember that these repeat UV nodes and offsets and mirrors and everything exist. So instead, we're just going to go and just do this kind of a cheap way in the UV editor and simply just take our UVs and we'll just make them way bigger. Really cheap to do that. Not something you can do for like a lot of game stuff or something where you have to have specific texture sets, but that's a really easy way to do it there. Uh, the UV tiling though is pretty cool. There's also other things called triplanar, which it's just going to automatically like box map it for you, which is pretty useful. But uh, what I want to show you now though is displacement. So this looks fine, but if we get really close, we can see that it's just going to be like a, a plane. It's not going to look like it has any roughness at all. And I think I may have made that a little bit too small, but uh, so I might need to make that just a little bit smaller here. You can still really see where that tiling is, but uh, we don't need to walk around this environment. We're only going to be seeing a specific angle. All right, so displacement. There are two ways to do displacement with V-Ray. One is on the shader level and one of them is on the object level. The one on the object level tends to give you a lot more control and is more useful but it's really finicky, like how you get there. So I want to show you that. So you go up to create V-Ray. Then you go down to V-Ray displacement. Then you say apply single V-Ray displacement node to selection. So select that. And then we can delete the history of this. Say delete history. And then you can see there's a V-Ray displacement node that's been added. And then it gives you a material. So if we, give, if we select the input connection to that, we really don't want a material, we just want a texture. We'll say texture, back to the file there, and then for the image name, we'll say rock textures, gravel tileable displace. Color space would be raw, and then we're good to go. So you'll never see anything in the viewport change, but if we go to the viewport IPR and turn that on, you'll be able to see there's now rocks added looks pretty cool. Sweet. So if you wanted to change the amount of displacement, you can then select your plane, go to attributes, V-Ray, displacement control. 
And then here, if you open up your extra V-Ray attributes, you can change stuff like the displacement amount. So if you say zero, it's going to be completely flat. So you can kind of see the difference here. That doesn't look good at all. Now this looks pretty good. Like all that detail is already, already done for us. Now we do have some issues around here that looks pretty bad, but uh, we're not going to worry too much about that. So we're not going to get super close to this, but it's going to be okay. We could increase the displacement, do something like two. Uh, for this, I think it looks pretty good. If you had the camera zoomed back really far and you just really couldn't see the displacement otherwise, you could increase that. But as you can see here, there's a lot of a lot of tiling going on, which doesn't look great. It would be really cool if there was a like a, just a texture class here at the college that we could really go into a lot of the like a lot of things that you can do to quickly make textures not tileable. Something I really enjoy and something that I think a lot of you would benefit from. But unfortunately, we don't really have that time to to get so lost and sidetracked on that. But for this, I don't think it's going to be a problem because the camera is going to be so low. Next part is you just want to basically place these assets where you think that they should go. You can add as many as you want and you can make them look as you want. And you want to keep the camera kind of, you know, you want to reference where the camera is so you can you know, see how these things are looking. Like some of these, like this cliff here, it looks pretty good because it has a nice, uh, nice slope. But these don't really have much of a slope and they're, they're kind of open there. So basically you just need to place these assets where you think that they would look good. And you can have some overlap and I don't think you're really going to notice if there's a lot of overlap. You just want to make sure that there's no planes that are casting a shadow or lights coming through them. We probably want to set this one back a little bit, something more like that. And on this one, we might want to make this a little bit bigger. We might want to pull both of these forward. We'll pull this one out. Like that. Maybe make this one a little bit bigger like this. But this is basically how you do a lot of asset placement. And I'm sure you, if you've done the game art class, I, I never ever, I've never taken a class like that, but I'm assuming you're doing stuff like this. It's pretty common type of industry thing. But we're just going to reuse these assets a bunch of times, kind of place them over any of the gaps and rotate them around so they're not as, you know, it's not as apparent that we're using them over and over and over again, but stuff like that. And we actually might want to pull all of these in a little bit. I think we've added quite a bit of excess space that we don't really need around here. We could definitely pull those in. And then we can start to copy these elements over. And we kind of just want to go around that perimeter that we created earlier with that sphere. So this might look a little bit more square-like, and that's okay. It doesn't really matter for this. If it looks too dark later on, we can we can make some adjustments, but we do want to have reflections on the ship. So it is important that we do surround this area, even though that we can't see what's behind the camera. We do want the reflections on the ship. So it's important that we're going to have something there. I probably didn't need to worry about that gap at all. So this is something that you could blend with an HDR if you wanted to go that route and not have to worry about you know, having all this excess geometry loaded and saved in your scene. And again, this might be a really useful thing to use referencing for because we could just reference the same object over and over and over again instead of having that in the scene. But I just want to show you different techniques so you can, you know, you can choose what you want to do. So sometimes when I'm going through these in my head, I'll realize like halfway through the lecture, I should have shown you a different way of doing it. There's a lot of right ways to do things. Also, uh, definitely wrong ways to do them as well, but I think in this case, it doesn't really matter. Now, here we have a little bit of a problem, and that is that we don't actually want this cylinder to be here. So what I want to do in this case, I want to select all of this except the sun. I don't want that. And I don't want the cylinder or the camera. I'd like to have this just in a group. So we can do control G or edit group. We can just call this rocks. And for the rocks, just pull this up. And here's another really useful thing. If your pivot point is off screen, 
the last axis that you used, so in this case it's the Y axis, you could be completely off screen, you can't even see where that gizmo is. You can just middle mouse and click and drag that up, and it's automatically going to remember that was the last axis you used. It's a little random bit of Maya trivia. And delete that cylinder, I don't need it anymore. And then let's go back to our camera. I'm going to go turn the Razor Crest layer back on, display layer. These are not render layers, they're just display layers. I have this come in. And I think that's, look, that's going to look pretty interesting. Let's see how the entire scene looks. So this, this is a problem. I think we're getting way too close to some of these rocks over here. We're going to need to make the scale way smaller. Some gaps over here that we need to deal with. That might be as simple as just simply pulling down that a little bit. So I'm just middle mouse clicking, dragging that down to close that gap. But this right here, the plane, that's, that is a problem. So we're going to go back to the UV editor and then I'm going to make this even bigger. I kind of wish we'd, we'd stuck with the tiled one, the tiled method, because I think that would have been a lot better to do. But uh, I'm kind of committed now. I don't want to go back and redo all of that just for the sake of making that a little bit more tidy. So on this plane again, we can actually just call this round. And then on the attribute editor, V-Ray displacement, let's lower that disp displacement down by half. You can see what that looks like, maybe by another half, something more like that. That's more reasonable. I think that's going to look better. It also doesn't look like there's a lot of clearance at the other side of this cave or this kind of rocky rocky section. So I'm going to get out of that and then yeah we've gone way too far with this. So now we can just pull that way back and we could rotate this around. We can do whatever we want with the environment. We want some of those rocks closer. We can do that. If we wanted to even scale everything down a little bit we could probably do that too. We want to have that a little bit tighter but I think I think for the most part this is going to look this is going to look okay. Yeah, that looks okay for like some rough work. This is all going to be out of focus, so we don't need to worry about the stretching right there. It's going to be fine. If it was a problem, we could we could change it later, but we can always play around with the V-Ray displacement. I think in this case, I'm actually going to increase that back up just a little bit, so it's a little bit more bumpy, a little bit more rocky. And then we could even grab assets like this and then decide, hey, I want to move a copy of that closer just so we have something in the foreground. I'm going to turn on my resolution gate there just so I can see that a little bit more clearly of what's going on. We could try playing around with some rocks. These might be a little bit large though. And we could actually change this. We could change the, we could actually lower some of this terrain here if we wanted to. We could kind of make this come down a little bit. Uh, we want to be careful that we don't lower where the gear is supposed to go. But these are things that you can, you could do later if you wanted. Like we could, we could actually lower some of these vertices down. Give it a little bit more of a slope. Or over here, we could ha we could raise some of these up, just so it's not super flat. Some of them over here, like three for the uh, smooth shading, just to add some variation. I think I might actually want to make all of those cliffs even taller as well, so we see them at the very beginning. So yeah, this is never ending. You could keep tweaking this forever, but I think we are in a good state. I do want to change one thing with the camera though. I want to zoom out just a little bit. And it looks like we have a, quite a few keyframes here that we don't need. So remember to delete unused keyframes. You can go to edit, delete by type. 
static channels, first of all, to remove anything that's not moving. Uh, the rotation looks like it changes slightly here, perhaps, on the, on the camera. Let's go into the graph editor, though, and then just have a look. Like, that doesn't do anything. It's this keyframe. We can just delete that. And then right here, maybe I just want to pull this out just a tad. And then maybe these rocks, I don't want them. I, I don't know exactly what to do with these rocks yet. I'll just put them, put them right here. We might decide to use some pebbles later. Okay, I just don't want to crowd it too much. And then on some of these cliffs, we wanted to make these a little bit taller. The, it looks like the pivot point is at the bottom. So in all of these, could probably stretch these up just a little bit, just to the point where we could see just a little bit of them sticking up here. It's probably not stretched too much that it would be a problem. Cool. All right, let's save this and then we'll begin the next part. Welcome back to the Razorcrest series, and now we need some dust. So for this next part, I'm gonna show you what I did in Embergen to generate some dust. It's some really cool software for doing real-time fluid simulations, and I think that you should check it out if you're interested. If you would like to follow along with the same sequence that I'm using, that is available on Patreon. Otherwise, I highly recommend just grabbing a trial of Embergen and having some fun and making your own dust sequences. So we're going to be loading in a BDB sequence into a V-Ray volume grid. We already went over that in a previous video, but we're going to be doing that again. And I would like to remind you that the scale of the scene is not correct, which is something that I mentioned in a previous video. Embarrassing, yes, but we can still make it work. All right, let's get started. All right, so now we're going to be deviating a little bit from the original lecture material. So in the original series that I gave to my class, I ramble on for about five minutes about Phoenix FD, and I don't think that's really necessary for us to do here. But really quickly, I was intending to use Phoenix FD for this project. So Phoenix FD is a simulation software for liquid simulations or smoke and fire simulations, much like Emergen, what I'm going to show you. The differences are that it's all done inside of Maya or 3ds Max, and you can have unlimited interactions with geometry. It can do a better simulation in terms of quality or accuracy than Embergen can. It's also better at doing simulations over a lot larger area because it can dynamically resize its grid and, and not have to have some massive area, or massive voxel density to be able to show a simulation over a large area. But that comes at the cost of really long simulation times, huge amounts of data. For example, I've had simulations that have being around the 300 frame mark that have been over a terabyte, and it's quite complicated to use in my opinion. So for example, for this project, the lowest quality simulation that I thought was usable using just some primitive geometry as a collision object was over 25 gigabytes, and it took a couple hours to simulate. Not really something that I could easily deliver to my class and say, hey guys, go and do this, or download this sequence, it's huge, right? So what I decided to use was Embergen, which is what I'm gonna be showing now, so the major difference between Embergen and Phoenix FD is that it is real time. So with Phoenix, because it's not real time and there are so many different settings, unless you specifically know what every setting does, in order to find out how it interacts with your simulation or how it changes your simulation, for example, let's say that I wanted to increase the amount of flames. Well, there's quite a few settings that do that. So in Phoenix, we would have to go and then change like the intensity or the, the heat of the flame or whatever, and then try one setting, change that, resim it, render it, and then see what that one thing did. You never want to be changing multiple settings at a time when you output, otherwise there's too many variables to figure out what exactly was changed. But in Embergen, let's say I wanted to increase the flames, go over to simulation, could go down to combustion, and then I could just increase the flame intensity. Maybe that's all you wanted to do. Or maybe you wanted to change the temperature. We could go to the emitter and then increase the temperature here, and maybe that would do it. Or maybe we don't really want any fire at all, and we just want to decrease the temperature, so we just get smoke. And you can see in real time what changing these settings does. And you can also, to some extent, as it's playing, increase them, and you might even be able to simulate what animating those values would be too. 
So that's just a quick look at why that's more advantageous because just doing those simple things inside of Phoenix would take a long time to be able to make the change, simulate it, render it, and then compare it. Whereas with Embergen, we just made that comparison in a few seconds. So Embergen comes with a lot of different presets. For example, we could take a look at this Fire Tornadoes and then just see what that looks like. It's kind of cool there. And it's very quick just to kind of break down what they did or play around with it. Like maybe I want to lower the burst, have that kind of go away or increase the burst, see what that does, or time between bursts, things like that. You can kind of interact with the look quite quickly. If you want more fuel, whoa, less fuel, just smoke, you know? So it just, uh, it's really cool to play around with it and see what they did. Quite a few of these. If you're not really interested in playing around with Embergen itself right now, but you just want to get a, a feel for the types of VDBs and the quality of the VDBs that it can export, they do have quite a lot. If you go to downloads, free VDB examples, and there's a lot of free ones that you can, you can play around with. I showed in one of the previous lectures these clouds here. I didn't actually download them. It just shows you where you can get them. But uh, you can see the, the, the quality, and you can get quite detailed stuff with them too. And then you can break these down and then see what they did to make it. It's not just the VDB, it's the, uh, the, the .ember file as well. So Embergen is relatively new, but the results are really good for what it is. These tend to be much smaller scale simulations, like a little bit of smoke, a little fire, some explosion, some dust like I'm going to show you. Not as useful for multiple geometric interactions, like you can't have a lot of different meshes interacting, I think. At least back six months ago, you could only use one object. I don't know if they've changed that since. But it's also really good at generating flipbooks. So flipbooks are much like sprites, but instead of having just a single image, it's basically a much larger image with lots of different smaller images on it. And then the way the flipbook works is for every frame of the animation of the sprite, it would load in another frame of the sequence. For longer sequences, you can use what is called a motion vector pass as well. So that will try to blend in the motion. So software like Unreal, for example, will interpolate between frames and smooth out that motion. So that allows you to extend the animation without having excessive amounts of sprite images, basically. So most of the times in games, if you see an elaborate explosion or something that's quite detailed, it's not actually in 3D. It's just a sequence running on a plane. Nothing wrong with that necessarily, and you can use that for effects as well. But in our case, we do need a 3D dust cloud, essentially, because it's going to be interacting with the camera. So instead of using flipbooks, we'll be using VDB sequences, which are actual volume grids. So Embergen has been used by lots of different companies, but it's still technically in beta, I believe. But if you are interested, I would go to JangaFX.com, go all the way down to the bottom, and then sign up for a demo. I think it only lasts for two weeks, but uh, as far as I'm aware, it's fully functional. So you can see if it would be viable to use for the kind of work that you would like to do. I do recommend it. It's not that expensive when you compare it to software like Phoenix and they have a good rent to own system. And apparently they also have a student license now. So I didn't see that before. Maybe it's relatively new. So if you guys are students, check this out. All right. So finally in Embergen. So when you first launch it, it's going to start playing right away. I'm going to stop that. And there is one concern about Embergen, and that is the strain that it can put on your GPU. So I have some software called GPU-Z, which is just a monitoring software. It's free, so I would recommend that you use some kind of monitoring software. I have an RTX 3090, which is a high-end card for sure, but I have the Founders Edition version, and the fans don't directly cover the VRAM. So my concern is always how how hot is my memory temperature? So right now it's only at 60 degrees Celsius. That's not that hot at all, but this will very, very quickly jump up when we start doing a larger simulation or exporting the VDBs. And if this gets over like 104 Celsius, that's something to be concerned about. And I have had the computer shut down a few times using Embergen before, so just be mindful of it. But there is something that you can use to mitigate this problem. You go up to settings, preferences, make sure you have a frame limiter set. I have mine at 60, but you may even want to go lower than that. I also go to the viewport quality. I just set this to low because we're not going to be rendering in it. 
We just need to basically see if the shape is correct and, and the way that the smoke or simulation is basically interacting. If, if that looks pretty good, fine. Like we don't really need to have high quality for this. Okay. Right. So the next thing is let's go over to our node graph. So everything in Embergen is node based. If you click and drag the middle mouse button, this is how you pan. And then you can just zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. If you go to the sky box over here, Got a sky atmosphere and i'm going to say non i think this is going to be easier to see our smoke because it's going to be pretty thin smoke you know we just want to be able to make sure we can see it a little bit better next on the ground i don't think the checkerboard is particularly easy to see so i'm going to say noise or you could say uniform color if you just want it all gray i like the noise one so i'm going to leave it at that another thing if you hold down the control key you can zoom in and out on this i have this set to I, I believe I made my sequence for the original one 500 frames, but uh, if you bring up a cross multiplier up here, so we're going to do frame rate over here and then the length over here. So Maya is using 24 FPS, Embergen is using 60 FPS. We know that the length of our animation is 200 frames. I do actually extend that out later on, but uh, that means that at 60 FPS, we would need 500 frames to fit in the same amount of time. Now, we could go and change Embergen so it's not rendering as many frames. However, the VDBs at this export are actually quite small. And if you have more frames than you need, it's much easier to retime your smoke sim, which we do end up doing. And then when I release this again for Patreon, I did tweak the settings. I, I extended it an extra 100 frames so I didn't have to go back to Embergen and re-render stuff. I could just tweak the, the timings of this, basically. And if you want to kind of fade out your smoke at the end, having more frames is generally better, but that's completely up to you. And you don't need to use these calculators if you don't want to, but a little bit of calculation there will just save you a little bit of headache maybe later on. Anyway, frequently what I'm going to be clicking on is spacebar to play or stop. You can also just click this. But every time we make a setting, it's just going to start it up again after it's finished. But this is not really going to finish. This is going to go on for quite a, a while. So if we want to reset it, we can either click this little button here or we can just click R. So if I play it, I can click R and then it will just start over again. OK, so that's what we're going to be using here. All right. So the next thing I want to do is go over to the shape over here. I want to change the type to a cylinder, just a regular cylinder. And then I'm going to make this pretty short. I'm going to make that 0.1 meters. And if we play this, we can see that there's still fire there. So we really don't want any fire at all. So if we go to emitter, we can go down to emission and then just say no emission. So that will completely get rid of the, the, the fire there. Another thing that we could do is set the temperature so the temperature is lower. I want to use something around 300 Kelvin. So that will get rid of the fire as well. But if you just don't want it to do any calculations on it, I'm assuming that's probably a little bit easier if you never want to see fire. I'm just going to say no emission on that. The next thing we need to do is change our smoke rate. So what I need to do now, let me pause this, move our slider back to start at zero, and we need to start animating some values. So what we can do to animate it is just click on this little dot here that will set a keyframe. Always make the keyframe before you make the change if you want to keyframe that value. So I just left that at the default. At the beginning, I'm going to say that is 0% per second. And then we could go forward. I think what I did is around 140 frames, but this is completely arbitrary. It just depends on your sequence. And then I went all the way up to 50% per second. We can see what that does. You can see that it's just less smoke at the beginning, and then it will pop up. I think another thing that would be useful is to not see our cylinder in there. And the way you do that is if you go down to visuals, show emitter, turn that off. And now this is going to be a little bit easier to tell. We can also change the color of our smoke. And I think that will be useful to be able to see this more easily. If we go down to shading and then scroll all the way down here to smoke color. You could, you could even make this like a really bright just so you can see it better. I'm going to do something that's a little bit more, probably more saturated than it really would be, but it would just help us uh, see it a little bit better. Okay. The idea is we want the engines, imagine like we, the Razor Crest is landing and we want the 
force field or gravity thing or whatever it is, the engine or thrusters or whatever you're trying to do is probably something pushing it down. So what I used on this is basically on the shape primitive at frame zero, I animated the radius. So on the radius, I set a keyframe there and the radius at the very beginning at frame zero is going to be zero. And then we're going to go all the way over to around 300 or so and then increase the radius to five. Now, if we play that again, we can see not a lot happens at the beginning, but then it's going to get more and more and more. Still does not really look like the shape that we want, though. So next, we're going to add a force line. So I'm going to right click over here and just type in force, and then you can get the force line here. And we are going to attach the force line to forces of the emitter. So on the force line, there is what's called the push strength and the repel strength. So at frame zero on the repel strength, we're going to say zero, go forward to maybe around that same frame here, 140. And then on the repel strength, we can say 50. So now if we go back and play that again, you can see now the smoke is coming outward. We're also running into the bounds here, so we need to change that in a moment. Actually, we could, we could change that now. If you click B, you'll show your bounds, and we can see that is nowhere near big enough for what we need. So if we go to simulation, we have to increase our voxel count. Type in 256, and we can we could leave the height pretty low, or we could just say everything's 256 for now. Apply new resolution. You can see that's a lot larger. So now if we play that again, not a lot happens at the beginning as it's coming in, and then it gets pushed out quite a lot. And we're still hitting the bounds, but I don't really want to change the size right now even more. But uh, you can get those, you're beginning to get those nice little ripples, which looks pretty cool. Okay. Now, we're not really going to be at an angle where we're going to see that for our shot. But if you were looking for to see more of that, then you can play around with, with um, how that looks. Also, as I edit this, this looks super laggy. I can assure you that Embergen is not usually this laggy. It's just the fact that I was recording at 30 FPS instead of 60, just because everything else in this lecture series was 30. And now you can see it's super choppy. So you should be able to get better performance out of it if you download this yourself. Okay, next, I'm going to go all the way back to 140, back to the force line, and then we're going to increase the push strength. So at the very beginning, I want to set a keyframe here, and the push strength is going to be negative. I think I said 95 on the last one. So it's, it's constantly going to be a force pushing down. But over time, we want to lower that. So we can go all the way to frame 500. And then I'm going to lower the push strength to zero. And we can also lower the repel strength as well. So I think I said five on this one. All right, so for right now, this is not looking as good. We just basically have a ring pushed out, but we need to change some other settings first. I'm going to go down to simulation. And we're just going to scroll down until we get to the combustion section. And for the combustion, I want this to generate 100% smoke. For the smoke dissipation, I want to change that to zero. So now we're getting a, a little bit more smoke there. And keep in mind that a lot of that is when the, the razor crest is coming in. So if we zoom out, we're now getting a nicer cloud of dust. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of other people out there that's going to make a more effective smoke sim than I'm going to show you, but I'm just showing you what I did. For the vorticity, I am going to check pre-advection vorticity, and I'm, I'm going to increase the vorticity intensity to 60%. You can also change the large scale one. So if you want more like larger plumes, like clouds of dust within it to get a lot, a lot larger, you can increase that. I'm just going to leave that right now at 0% for, for right now. Okay, so scroll down even more. Right down here, there's an option called blocking Z ground. So we're going to enable that as well. That means that it's not going to go lower than where the emitter is. That. And now we're going to get more of a shape that is, is what we had before, okay? We're still getting those rings getting pushed out. All right, next is wind direction. I'm gonna add just a little bit of wind and I, I'm just gonna change the direction 
this is just what I did before. I just found these settings to be nice. I'm going to increase just a little bit of wind. And I also want to add just a little bit of wind chaos too, because I think that will look pretty cool. And another thing that I've realized is as we progress through this, I do want to reduce the amount of smoke that's being emitted because there's a lot of smoke that keeps getting kicked up. But as soon as the Razor Crest lands, I want the engines or whatever field is pushing the dust down to, to get less and less and less because it is no longer no longer firing downwards. So what I'll do on that one, I'll go all the way to, let's say, maybe 450, 440. And then for the smoke rate, I'll set that back down to zero, reset that, and then play it again. So now we're getting some nicer dust like that. And this is pretty thin and wispy, but now you can see that the wind is having an effect on it. Looks kind of cool. And then we can go down to turbulence. I did add some turbulence on top of everything else. I said something like 1% advection, 20% for the smoke turbulence. Kind of see, adding just a little bit more variation there. And then for the size, let's add, let's increase the size of that. So now it's a little bit more chaotic. And if you wanted more smoke, like maybe we wanted to have that smoke still kicking up quite a lot until towards the end, we could still, we could just add another keyframe in there. So it's still going to kick up more smoke as it comes down. And then it will die off like that. The masks are pretty useful if you had a ton of smoke and you just wanted to reduce how much smoke was being seen. You can play around with these, but our smoke is fading off fairly quickly though i don't think that's going to be necessary for us if you want the smoke not to go up so high you want it to keep falling down if you go down to force you can decrease the buoyancy or you could increase the weight if i wanted this to be heavier i could increase the the weight of the smoke there and you can see now it doesn't go up as high it just it stays lower or we could just reduce the buoyancy you can see both of those working in tandem, and that's going to be a lot closer to the ground. And then by the end of it, it's going to slowly kind of, it still moves because we have that wind and it still fades out. I think what I did on mine, I left that at 50 and then I increased the smoke weight just a bit. So we still want some of that smoke to get kicked up pretty high because it normally would. We could even increase our buoyancy quite a lot and then just increase the weight of it. We still get some that keep creeps up, but then the whole thing is not going to keep creeping up towards the end. I don't know. These are, are similar settings. Looking back at what I did, I'm seeing slightly different results anyway. So just play around with those values. So in terms of the GPU memory, if I pull this over, we're now hitting 100 degrees Celsius. It's dropping down just a little bit. I am also recording, and I do have another instance of Embergen open, but it's, it's, it's paused. But uh, just be, be mindful of your memory temperature, because if it gets a lot ho hotter than this, it could potentially be damaging to the hardware. Technically, it would have to go quite a bit higher than this, like into the hundreds, like uh, 108 or 110 or something. I can't remember what the actual specs are from NVIDIA, but uh, it, it is getting quite hot, right? The load is also, you know, at 99%. Memory is not actually using that much memory. So yes, I have a 3090 with 24 gigs, which is nice, but not really necessary for what we're doing. We're not really using all that much. All right, so let's say that we're, we're happy with this smoke. If you zoom out and we look over here, this is going to look pretty thin and wispy. Now, when we save this out as a, a VDB sequence, we can increase the intensity by increasing the opacity or the thickness of the smoke. So what you see inside of Embergen is not one-to-one -one of what is going to be rendered out in V-Ray because V-Ray will have its own interpretation of what the volume looks like in terms of the, the thickness or the color 
or the translucency or whatever material you decide to, to use for it. The shape and the overall motion is going to be more or less the same, but it's not exactly one to one with what you see in Embergen. So also keep in mind that the camera is going to be really, really close here. It's going to be like right here. So if we want to see what that looks like, we're going to see dust getting kicked up and then it's going to come towards the camera. We're going to see dust being pushed towards the camera this way too. If you want even more detail than this, you can go to the simulation, simulation size, and you can increase the voxel size. That's fine. This is going to increase the amount of memory that is going to be required for it. Uh, you can also use upscaling. So what I did on mine, I ended up going to X2, I believe, or maybe even X3. If you apply the new resolution, now this is probably going to be quite slow. You can see it's chugging here. It's nowhere near as fast as it was before. But as the smoke comes out, you should see a bit finer detail. So it's a little bit finer than it was before. You can still see those ripples. If you don't want yours to fade off as quickly, I would just go to the smoke rate and just still have it kick up some smoke towards the end. Again, this is more or less what I did on mine, but I, I certainly think mine could be better and more detailed. And at the end, we will end up using the VDB as, as like a copy. We'll have like two versions of it slightly offset. And that's what I ended up using just to add a little bit more detail. You can also do things like in post, trying to add a little bit of a fractal pattern on top of it. Quite tricky. You could blend this with some some smoke elements of like actual smoke too. That's a, a technique that I've used before with really good effect to get some extra detail in there. And then of course, the to get a lot of detail, it's the vorticity that's going to probably get you probably what you want there. So if I wanted to add even more detail to like the smoke clouds getting kicked up, you can increase the vorticity intensity and you'll get a lot smaller noisier looking smoke. So that may or may not be what you want because it's actually quite noisy back there, but it will make this pattern more detailed. So you may want several versions of this. You might have like a large scale version and then a small scale version, and then you could blend the two or have both of them running at the same time. That's up to you. All right, so that's, that went on a little bit long, but hopefully that gives you an idea of how to use it. But then we need to export our VDB sequence. We're going to go to volume, drag out VDB, export VDB. You just choose a file path of where you would like to go. So I have one already set up here and you would just give it a, a prefix and a version number, and then it will add in frame numbers for you. Honestly, these settings are pretty much good to go. Number of frames that you would want. I said 500 for something like this. Frame stride would be just one, so it's just doing every single frame. For the export, we're not doing anything with temperature or fuel, so we can leave those unchecked. Uh, for export velocity, though, this is useful for motion blur, so we would want to have that enabled. And we also want to use the compression. In Maya, the coordinate system is not Z up, it would be Y up. Not really sure what the right or left handed means, I'm just going to leave that on right handed. And the unit length is in centimeters. So did mess up the scale there, which I'll probably go over in a bit, but uh, centimeters is fine. Uh, floor zero is fine too, and we should be good to go. So once you have a file path set, well, let me just make one quickly here, dust version five, and then I would just say export now. And when you click export, it's going to start at the beginning and then go all the way through. Now, this can take quite a long time to do, but if you increase the resolution, like you increase the upscaling even more, this could take over an hour or more. So it really just depends on your hardware. I think this is this number is, is not uh, quite accurate. I think it will take longer than this. But for smaller scale simulations or lower detailed ones, it doesn't take an excessive amount of time. It's still much, much faster than doing this with Phoenix. Okay, right, so once that is done, you will then have a VDB sequence. If you're interested in using the same sequence that I used, you can find that on Patreon. All right, so now we're going to go back to the original lecture, and then we'll be going back to Maya. So this dust is slightly different, but the principles are the same. So the scale of this is a little bit off because we never actually scaled our scene properly in Maya. Like if we go back to that really fast, this is in centimeters, and if we grabbed 
just a cube move a cube over that's like one one cubic centimeter so we did not we did not scale this right and i looked this up the razor crest is supposed to be like 26.5 meters so that's way bigger right it's like a hundred times bigger than our than our scene is so when i was setting up the phoenix sim you do need to do that at scale but phoenix allows you to have like a, a scale multiplier like let's say your scene is not to scale but you can't change it or it's just too cumbersome to change kind of like this you can still simulate as if it was you know real world scale now for something like this it's not we're not actually going to have the proper interaction of the razor crest falling down and actually pushing that snip, that dust away but we can get something that looks pretty good you know i think that's this is going to look fairly decent and the camera is going to be pretty close to it right but it's going to be looking up let me reset this here the camera is going to be looking up and we're probably not even going to see that much detail in it we just need some kind of a cloud of stuff this is way too strong and we'd also like to have a little bit of graininess in there just like this actual like sand or dust or dirt or whatever it is being kicked up and then we also need to probably play around with some kind of debris particle system which we're not going to do in embergen this is just for doing like smoke or fluid stuff but we could do something like that in maya so anyway you can set all of this up to render like a flipbook or just a just a straight up image or you could export a vdb sequence then you just give it a, a location an output location then you say export now and then it runs through it and what you end up with is a sequence of 500 vdb files and the largest file here is is less than 10 megabytes whereas with phoenix ft two three seconds in we're already at like 100 or 200 megabytes per frame so there's a lot more information that phoenix generates we're, and we don't need it so this is why this is such an ideal solution okay so that's embergen i don't actually need to save this so what do we actually do with it that's the next part so most renderers have some kind of vdb import function and the same is true with vray so we've already done this with the cloud so you just go up to vray volume grid then for the volume grid you go into your input and then for the preview and render path browse and then you would just go and find that vdb sequence so this starts at frame zero maya starts at frame one so just bear that in mind so we should end at 499 but I don't know why Maya starts at, at one. It's kind of awkward, but we've already kind of animated this way. So usually we set that to zero, but whatever. We got in this case. And this is going to come in. It's going to be way too big because, as I said, if we never made this to scale. But no matter. We can just simply scale this down. And this is going to come in on the last frame, I believe. So basically, we just want to push this. So it's just about going through the floor like that. And then we want it so as if the razor crest could actually land, you know, somewhere in the middle there. Now, the exact scale of this is up to you. I would do something like this. You could do it a little bit bigger. You could do it a little bit smaller. If you wanted it to be probably more realistic, it would be bigger. But the whole point of this is I want to see detail through the camera. And if we look at the camera, you're just not even going to be able to see anything. It's through the viewport. It's just way too... Uh, way too crowded i can show you quickly how you can uh how you can change that you want to make sure though that that goes through the floor it's not floating up something more like that so if this gets really laggy for you which it probably does because if you try to step through this if you scrub like it might actually go pretty quickly but if it doesn't end up going quickly for you you can go down to preview you can just say don't preview so it will never preview it and you'll never see it in the viewport. You probably do want something in the viewport. Or you can do detail reduction. So you could do say like two and kind of see it reduced that a little bit or three or five or ten. And that's way smaller. So it's going to be a lot easier to view if you want to see something. But if you're trying to look through this view, it's just in the way and it's annoying. There's also the option to use what is called the GPU preview, which is this right here. And this gives you more of an actual cloud, which might be more useful to you depending on what you want. Personally, I don't like that. I think it obscures too much. And I think for the most part, 
I actually don't want to even see that unless it's selected. So I'll say only if selected, then I can click off and then we can pan around this viewport, we can see everything. And if I wanna see it, all I have to do is make sure I click on it and then it pops into view. I'm gonna call this volume grid dust VDB. And then let's see what this looks like in the viewport. And I'm gonna actually render from here first, just so it's a little bit more clear. And for this, because we're using a different camera, you wanna make sure you go to your camera, attributes, V-Ray, make sure you have a physical camera set. Should also be visible down here. Otherwise, it's gonna be completely overexposed and way too bright. All right, so that smoke comes in and it is, and I keep saying smoke, uh, it's dust, but most simulators do either like water-based stuff or smoke-based and, and dust would be, dust reacts more like smoke. Actually, all fluid dynamics, whether it's in the air or in water, kind of react in the same way, but there's, I guess, a lot more involved for liquids because you need like bubbles and splashes so they're usually, usually separated. All right, so if, if we want to make this not so dark, select our volume grid, go down to rendering, which is right here. And then there's a few options for the color and opacity like we did before. For the opacity, we're going to leave that color constant. For the, for the color, let's do something that's a little bit brighter. You probably need to stop IPR and then update it manually to see a change. That's very, very saturated, very red. I don't want it to be that red. Desaturate that a little bit. That looks a little bit better. Maybe it's a little bit too dark. We might just brighten that up a bit. Something more like that is more in line with what I'm going for. It looks a little bit too pinkish right now, but I, we can change that when we get a little bit closer. Also, dust really depends on, you know, how, the, the sediment. Like, you could have sand, you could have just dirt, and then sand has lots of different shades depending on the composition of the minerals, and same thing with dirt as well. So, you could have what appears to be, you know, like a really dark, ro like a dark dirt or gravel, but then the dust get, that gets kicked up is very light gray, or it could be very sandy colored or whatever. So it's up to you what you decide, but we'll try to come up with something that blends in with the environment. Uh, but right now it's a little bit early to start really tweaking this color, although we could just take the hue out a little bit, take that red hue out a little bit, stop the IPR, restart it, and that should hopefully just, you know, that's way too much green now. We need to use very subtle controls here. We need to move these very subtly to be able to change this. But this is something that we can control in post later. Having like a closer result in camera is always a good idea. Okay. I also think it's a bit thick. So what we need to do is go down to the smoke opacity. We'll just half that number so we'll do 0.25 again stop the ipr start it up again and then we'll we'll just see what happens with that okay so that's how you load in the vdbs all right so now that we've seen how the dust renders we actually need to figure out how to time it so in embergen this was set to 60 frames per second and we outputted 500 frames but in Maya, we're using 24 frames per second and our shot is 200 frames. So 200 frames at 24 FPS is going to be the same amount of time as 500 frames at 60 FPS. But when we load in that VDB sequence and you step through this, you can see that every time that we step forward, we're just incrementing one frame of that VDB sequence. It's going to take one frame and whatever frame you're on, that's going to be the frame that it starts on. So there's two things here. Because Maya starts at frame one by default instead of zero, it's going to start one frame into the sequence. And at the very end here, it's only going to be on frame 200. So if we want to play back that entire sequence as it was in Embergen, we want to change your playback mode to cache index. 
If you wanted it to loop over and over again, you would do loop, but we're going to do cache index. And at frame one, we would say, all right, it's actually going to be starting on frame zero for that VDB sequence. So we set a key. And at frame 200, we would say 499. So that will play the entire sequence. And every time we step forward now, we're going to be on a higher and higher frame. Now, if we go into the graph editor, the animation graph editor, by default, Maya will also ease in your keyframes. Well, that would not be what we wanted if we wanted it to look exactly as it was. We, we would want to linearize those tangents. And then we would be seeing the correct interpolation. Now, with that said, you might actually want to tweak this because if we go to the very end here, like at frame 200, you can already see from the viewport that a lot of that smoke has dissipated. And if we render this, you can see that, yep, most of that smoke or dust rather is, is gone. So what we probably want is a little bit more lingering dust. And at the very beginning, we actually, we're, we're not going to see any of this because the camera is aimed up and the, the ship is so high. So really we could delay the smoke just so we get more of it visible when the ground is visible essentially. Okay. So this is a little bit up to you, but what I'm going to do is first of all, I'm going to ease this in. So I'm going to, I want to ease this in. I can select this keyframe and then do this button right here, which is plateau tangents. If I wanted to create this myself and add an, a new custom curve to this, if you try to pull out this tangent, you can't do that. So if you go up to curves, weighted tangents, this allows you to pull this out and you can make it a lot slower at the beginning and then it could speed up, you know, midway through the shot. If you want to set that as default, you can also go to curves, default tangent, weighted tangents. I prefer this and I think it's better to have weighted tangents. It gives you a lot more control. And likewise, you could ease out the end. Or you could just say, hey, you know what? I want this to be a little bit slower because I don't. I want it to start slower, but then I don't want it to speed up too fast so the smoke looks ridiculously fast. I could just say, all right, let's do something like 248 frames. So we're just delaying everything by two seconds and we'll never actually reach the end there, which is fine. And we can just pull that up if we wanted to, or we could just do like a regular ease like that. Or you could just say, just keep it linear. So it's up to you. So we actually need to see what this looks like in camera first anyway. So we will probably be adjusting that, but just keep that in mind. So some other things you might want to scale this down even more. You might want to scale it up a little bit. It just depends on exactly where your camera is. But if we just go to our main camera view and then just have another look at this, we can see that this, this dust is looking pretty good. I think that's the right amount of dust. But again, we really need to see how this looks in motion because it might be going too fast or it's too slow or whatever. All right, so that's how you load in the VDBs because that's really going to be an important part of the compositing. So make sure you get that in there. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions about Embergen or anything else that we've done so far, please just leave me a comment or join the Discord server and ask me there. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use the prescale feature on a Maya camera. This is perfect for a situation where you've already animated your camera and you just need to add just a little bit around the edges, but you don't want to change the physical position of your camera and you don't want to have to redo the animation. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. All right, really briefly, this was part of a much longer lecture series, and I'm going to be rambling on about other stuff that's nothing to do with prescale. So if you are interested in just prescale itself, have a look at the chapter links or just click on your camera icon here and then go directly to prescale. This is going to allow you to zoom in or zoom out. I use a setting like this and you can see that's how you can change the scale of your camera. So you can basically just leave the camera in the same physical location, but you're essentially just adding on more to the edges. So you are kind of doing like a, a zooming effect. So essentially you are changing the focal length, but you don't actually have to change the physical location of your camera. Another thing is this is not the same thing as overscan. If you clicked on this video with the hopes of learning how to do overscan, click on the, your render settings. You'll need to change this value here. And instead of using prescale, I'm going to set that back to one. You would change your camera scale up here. This tends to be the, the best way to do it. So for example, if you wanted a 10% overscan, you would say your camera scale would be 1.1. So we're zooming out by 10%. 
And then you would also need to increase your resolution here. Otherwise, the whole point of doing overscan is because you might need to add some lens distortion in, or you might need to do some camera shake or something where you are going to end up with less resolution in post. So you do need to compensate for that here. If we increased our camera scale by 10%, we also need to increase our resolution by 10%. So this is not done automatically for you, so you do need to compensate for it here. So for example, at 1920, you do 1920 times 1.1, and that would give you the resolution that you need to render. That would be 2,112. Okay, that's how you do overscan. So if that's what you are looking for, that's how you do it. For me, instead of camera scale, I use prescale. It tends to be better to use camera scale. It doesn't really matter for what I was trying to do, but I'm not trying to do overscan anyway. I was just trying to fix the composition basically without having to redo the animation of the camera. If you are trying to use prescale though, and it, for whatever reason it doesn't work, try using camera scale because that may work with more renderers. But in our case, it works fine with V-Ray. All right, so now I'm going to continue with the rest of the lecture in its original form. All right, some other things that I wanted to show you. First of all, well, this animation is not final. I might be making some tweaks, like this kind of nose dives right here. Let me go down to another view. It's like a little bit awkward. But moreover on the composition, I realized when, we were, when I was showing you the composition that after I'd done it, I was like, well, I really wish there was a little bit of extra space on the edges. But then I thought, well, since Star Wars does not use a 16 by 9 aspect ratio for the most part, I can't remember what the Mandalorian is. I think it's more of a cinematic aspect ratio. So you might have your letterboxing on the, the, the top part and the bottom part. 16 by 9, if you full screen this, would fit on most monitors unless you have an ultra wide, usually it would fit. But I think it would look a little bit nicer compositionally if we just expanded out the edges a little bit. But how do we do that without changing the camera? So this is actually a two-part thing. First of all, go into render settings and we need to set the resolution. So this is all default. We haven't even talked about any of these yet, which we will do shortly. But what we need to do right away is we want the width to be 1920. So 1080 is what is considered full HD, even though this is kind of low resolution now. This is, this is not very high. Even though a lot of companies still want stuff in 1080, I think even more want it in 4K, which is which is significantly higher. So it would be 2160p instead of 1080p. Then the P just stands for progressive. It's just a sampling. So it's it, you don't even need to put P at the end. 1080 or 2160 or whatever that indicates the full resolution. Now with 4K, there's two different types of 4K. Or for the most part, there's two types. There is double this, which is called 4K UHD or ultra high definition, which is like this 3840 by 2160. And then there's also DCI 4K. And DCI 4K is the full 4996 pixels horizontally, but this changes the aspect ratio a little bit and just adds a little bit to the edge. So if you notice, notice if I put this back to 3840, you'll notice that it's not going to be quite as wide if I put this back. You see, we get more space on the top now. For this class, though, 1920 is what we're going to be using. So for most assignments for our classes, it's just going to be 1920 by 1080. But for this specific one, I thought, well, let's put this in a 2.35 aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio for a lot of anamorphic film or lenses is 2.35 to 1. So if you wrote that out in full resolution, that would be... 2,350 pixels. We have to uncheck this button here to be able to add in a custom height by 1,000. And notice we get a very, very thin image now. It's, like, it's much more cinematic. We've also cropped this way too far, and this would be very bad composition right now because the landing gear is like almost touching the edge of the frame. But I also don't want to have to render out even a higher resolution here. So instead, we can now click on maintain width and height and then do 1920 again. So this will do 1920 and then it will automatically give us the height of 817 for the height. That is, that is fine. Okay. So the device aspect should say 2.35. There's lots of different aspect ratios out there. This is just a 
standard like it's not even the exact thing but it's just what a lot of people use as we're using anamorphic boom just put it in this okay it is one of many and i think for this it will be nice because we also will have fewer pixels to render this is actually a bit less so it's a bit will be a bit faster to render okay but now how do we solve the fact that our camera is now way too zoomed in well there's a few things that we could do we could re realign the camera but i don't want to do any of that stuff so instead if we click on our camera up here if you go down to the film back tab there is an option for what is called prescale so prescale allows you to zoom in or zoom out and it doesn't really change the position of the camera, it just adds in more stuff. So we could do something like 0.8. So we kind of pull back like 20%. And now this is a much better composition for us. We still probably need to adjust this part here. It's also very foreshortened. I know I wanted to use a 24 millimeter lens, but because we're looking so far up, it looks pretty distorted, but I think it's probably okay. If this was actually shot on set, you would have to use a wide angle lens just to capture everything. Let me turn off this grid here. But I think that's going to look a little bit better for us. Okay, so I'm going to save this, and you might want to up version this at some point. I'm not going to do that until we start rendering, but uh, if you guys want to increment and save, if you want to keep version 1, you could do version 1.1 or 1-1 1 or something every time you increment. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to do a little bit more with the lighting, but then we're going to render out our first kind of draft of this, a pretty low resolution, just so we can start playing around with values. Because when we render in Maya, for the most part in this class, we, you're never done when you just click render once and walk away. Like you, you have to render out in stages, like render out a few frames or render out a very low res sequence. And then you can see if it's comping properly because more often than not, after you've got everything ready and when you're testing in the comp, something will be wrong or you'll want to change something. So that's why we always start at a really low quality and then we work our way up. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next part. So continuing on with the Razor Crest series, we now need to set up our render layers. This is going to be far more advanced than what we did in the previous video. And we're going to be using a lot of overrides, and we're also going to be using the V-Ray Material Wrapper, which is going to be very useful for us as we set up our different layers. If you have any questions as you're going through this about your specific shot, just let me know in the comments. All right, let's get started. All right, so the next thing that we need to do is set up our render layers and set up our passes. So this is going to be a faster paced part because we've already talked about render layers and we've already talked about passes. But just a quick rundown of what we're going to be doing. I want to be able to separate the sky from the rocks and the ground plane, basically the environment. So I want the sky separate from the rocks because I might want to change the color of the sky. I might want to add clouds to the sky or something like that without having to re-render the rocks. Then I also might want to just change the color of the rocks individually or change the blur of just the rocks. I also want to be able to have the ship completely separate and I want the dust to be completely separated. So it's very easy to do with render layers. But where this becomes a little bit more interesting is we still need the rocks to cast a shadow and reflect in the ship. So those have to be visible in reflections and visible as shadows, but not visible to the camera. So this is what render layers are going to be even more useful for. A lot of this is going to be review, but we're going to do more with collections this time. And after we set up all our render layers, then we'll do the passes or AOVs. Okay, so let's go to a frame where we can kind of see everything like this. And we'll start off with creating a render layer for the ship. So I'm going to create a new render layer there. Let's type in ship. And then on the ship, we're going to create a new co collection. And this is just going to be our ship. And we're going to grab the entire referenced object, the hi entire hierarchy of the Razor Crest, and add that to our ship render layer. If I select the eye, it's only the ship that is visible. So if I go into the IPR, it's just the ship and also the sky because the sky is going to stay in all of these by default. So if I want to make sure that the sky does not show up, what we need to do is we need to go to our render settings, go to overrides, environment, and we want to change the background color just on this pass. We right click, create an absolute override for a visible layer. This 
automatically add a render settings collection up here. You can select this color value and just say black. If I go back to the IPR now, you can see the sky is going to be black, but we still get the reflections and everything. And then we still have an alpha channel. Got to stop the IPR there. But what we also need to consider is that we still need the reflections of the ground and we still need the shadows cast by those rocks. So now we're going to create a second collection on the ship. And this time we're going to add in the rocks. And we also need to add the dust in, in a moment too, but we're just going to start off with the rocks. So we'll add this, adding those rocks right there. So we can just type in rocks. And on the rocks, we don't want them to be visible, but we want them to cast a shadow. And we actually have quite a lot of rock elements here, but Maya's going to take care of all of the primary visibilities at once, because by default, if you create a second collection and then make an override on that collection, it will automatically apply the same override to all elements of that collection if we do it like this. So let's go into any one of these rocks. We'll go into our shape node and then go into render stats, and we need to turn off primary visibility. So you probably dealt with primary visibility at some point before. In this case, if you want to just click the override button for that, and then we want to turn it off. So if we turn this off here, you'll notice that a second collection has been created, and this is all the shape nodes. So this is a transform. So our transform is actually this rock element right here. It's our group. This is called a transform node. And because we are adding an override to a sub element of that transform, Maya assumes that we want to include all of the sub elements of that transform, so all of the different rocks. And it's going to apply this little asterisk to the include list. And it's going to apply the primary visibility to everything inside this transform group. So now if I click on any one of these, go to the shape node, you can see the primary visibility on all of these objects has been turned off for this layer. So you don't need to go one by one and create them if you don't want to, because it's a transform and because it's a group. Now for this, if we grabbed the dust, and then we also added that to the collection rocks over here, we added that. Notice that the VDB does not automatically get added to that visibility because it's not part of the same group, and we didn't add it at the same time. In this case, we do need to create another override for the VDB. So we're going to right click over this and say, create absolute override for visible layer. This will create a second absolute override it's a different one. And then we'll uncheck that. So if you think that something is overridden and it's not orange, you need to go back and double check that it's actually listed in that collection. If it doesn't show up here, sometimes there's a bug where it doesn't actually highlight orange, but if you click on another node and then go back to it. Like if I click the ship, for example, and then I clicked back on the dust, sometimes that will trigger it. I actually haven't seen this bug in Maya 2022, but it was sometimes there in, 20, in, in 2020, and it was there in 2019 and 2018 sometimes. But if you ever notice that, just check to make sure that the override is listed in the collection. So I'm gonna add the name rocks and dust. Okay, so now what we need to do is go back to the IPR. And I know the position is different here. So this is now cast, this is darker than it was before. If I stop the IPR and let's say I just delete this entire collection now. So those elements are not in the scene. Go back to the IPR, let this render. You can now see this is way brighter. If I AB these two things, so I can say this is the one that I did. This is now and this is the previous one you can see the difference of adding the reflections and the shadows. This is very, very different. This would be much harder to composite if we didn't already have the shadows and the dust reflecting in the ship. In fact, it would be pretty much impossible to get accurate without that information. I'm going to control Z that just to get my collection back. And now we are good to go on this layer. Okay, let's do that again because that's a little bit confusing. So we'll just do that for the environment this time. Also, before we move on, I just wanted to say, if you go back to the master layer, you should see that these are back on on the primary visibility. And if you do a quick render, you should see that the ship with the sky and the dust is visible altogether. But we're actually only using that for reference purposes. We're not actually going to be using that for our composite. 
Okay, so next we're going to create a new layer and we're going to call this environment. Click on the eye for that. We're going to right click, create a collection, and then we're going to go to the rocks and then add the rocks. And we could consider for this adding the dust. And because the dust might be really thick, it would kind of occlude a lot of the light that gets in here. So if we didn't include the dust, we might still be able to composite it so it's close, but then it's not going to match the, the, the master scene, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But if the whole purpose of what you're trying to do is just separate out all your elements and then recreate the master scene, just like AOVs are used to, to recreate the beauty, at least until the point that you want to start changing things, well, we would need to add the dust to this in that case. So sometimes it's really easy to have all your render layers completely independent from one another. And if you're going to do like a lot of like customization and do a lot of compositing inside of After Effects or whatever, especially if you are creating your look inside of After Effects. But if you already establish your look in Maya, it's safer just to recreate it in the same way. So I'm going to call this collection Rocks. Then we're going to create a new collection. And then we're going to call this one Dust. And then we'll go down to the Dust VDB. And then we'll add the Dust VDB. Then on the Dust, we're going to go to the V-Ray Volume Grid. Go down to Render Sets. And then we're going to right click over Primary Visibility. Create an Absolute Override and uncheck it. So it's still going to be casting a shadow on the environment. So if we go to the IPR, it looks a little bit darker. So if I, if I stop the IPR, and then remove the dust, and try this again. So if I A, B this, you can see that there is shadows now from the dust. That probably isn't that important for this, but it is a nice touch and I think it's probably worth it. Sometimes when you separate out render layers, it prevents you from having to re-render it, like re-render the environment, let's say, over and over and over again. This is going to be a little bit tricky to do that though. So for example, let's say that you knew your ship was going to change, and you, but you knew the camera was not going to change. Well, you could just render out the environment pass once, and then you could render out the ship layer over and over and over again, and that's the only layer that you have to keep re-rendering. Well, in this case, if the dust changes, you are going to have to re-render out the environment. And we might also need to cast the ship shadow on here, although we could go back to the ship layer and do it there. That actually might be the best thing to do. But for right now, let's just leave that as it is. I think that will be pretty good. Let me control Z that to put the dust back. All right, so the next thing that we need to consider is where the ship's shadow is going to go. Now, I don't think based on the camera angle of my shot that we'd even see the shadow because there's too many rocks in the way. But if we want, we basically have three different ways that we could do this. We could decide to just create a brand new render layer just for the ship's shadow. That would be the easiest solution, but you're going to have to render out another render layer. We could cast the ship's shadow on the environment layer, but if we are happy with the environment and we know the environment is not going to change, then any change that we make to the ship or the animation of the ship would require the environment layer to be rendered out again. So that's a little bit cumbersome. So probably the best solution would be to take the ship render layer and instead of using the primary visibility, on the rocks, we could use a V-Ray object property node in order to basically still have it not visible, but still receive shadows, but don't affect the alpha channel. So that gets a little bit more confusing. I'm going to show you one way that might we might need to change later, but it just depends on the shot. I think we'll be okay with that. So let's let's try that. All right, so let's grab the ship, which is right here. So we could right click over the environment, create collection, call the ship. So this is another easy solution, but it's probably not the most intelligent way to go about it. But I think for our purposes, it will be okay. I might show you in a later video how, what to do on the ship layer, but let's just see how this ends up in the composite. We probably will have to go back and change some stuff. 
for the second time that we render this. So keep in mind that we will have to render this at least twice. And usually the first time that we will we might notice some issues that we didn't think of before. So on the ship, we can select any element of the ship, much like we did with the rocks. And then we can right click over primary visibility, create an absolute override, uncheck it. And once again, because the ship is in a transform, basically has a hierarchy here. It's going to create a collection of shapes. And then on the shapes, it's going to use that wild card. And every object of the ship has its primary visibility turned off. So let's go to, I'm going to go to a perspective view just so we can look down and see the shadow. Go to IPR. I'm going to turn off the AB thing here. We don't need that anymore. And now you can see that the ship is now casting a shadow on the environment. So if I lower the camera down, you can pro you probably won't even be able to tell from our view. So it's probably not particularly important at all for this. But if your camera angle is looking down on the ship, then it might be a better option to put the ship shadow on the ship layer. But that's going to require us to remake our ship layer, basically, which let's let's avoid that right now. OK, so let's close up the environment and then let's go to the next layer, which is dust. So I'll make a new layer called dust, click the I. And for this, we're going to need the dust. Create collection. Call that dust. Add the dust. So the first thing that we need is the ship, because th there's a problem if we just try to render out just the dust as it is. And that's because the ship is going to be in the middle of the dust. So if we didn't include the ship's geometry, we'd just be seeing right through the dust and we'd be seeing parts of the dust that's actually behind the ship. And when we composite the dust on top of the ship in After Effects, we're going to be seeing too much dust and it's not going to, it's not going to look right. For the ship, let's make a new collection for the ship. And then we'll grab that transform node, add that here. Now, unfortunately for this, we can't just use primary visibility because that's going to just remove the visibility. And while it would still cast maybe a shadow on parts of the dust, which is fine, but we just want to occlude anything that's behind the ship. Like just don't even render what's behind the ship. That's what we're going to be using. We can use what is called a material override. So instead of having to put on a different material, like manually assign a material to this just for this layer, we can just do that on a collection basis. So we can right click over the collection and then say create material override. So we select that. And then for the override material, we're going to grab something called the V-Ray material wrapper. So it's V-Ray material wrapper right here. So basically what the material override is doing, it allows us to coat every object of that collection in the same material. And the material wrapper comes with what's called the matte properties. And the matte properties allow you to either make a surface just a matte object, so it's just completely black, or you can make it matte and also not show up in the alpha channel, which is what we want in this case. So we just basically want the dust to render around where the ship is, but any part of the dust that's actually behind the ship, just don't render it at all. And we don't want the alpha channel to be solid because if we tried to composite it over it, it would end up being black, which we don't want the dust to be black where the ship is because that doesn't make any sense. So what we do on this, we click on matte surface, and then we say for the alpha contribution, you say negative one. So if I go back to the IPR now, you can see that the ship has been completely cut out of that dust. You can also see the skies here, and we need to go back to the environment and remove the sky as well, which I completely forgot, but we'll need to do that in a moment. But here you can see that the ship has been cut out, and if we go to the alpha channel, the white areas mean the alpha is solid and the black areas means it's transparent and we want it to look like this basically basically like the ship is being cut out from the smoke okay now there is one slight annoyance with this and that is if we have to change the animation of the ship at all we just change the object of the ship we change anything about the ship that would affect its silhouette we have to re-render the dust layer as well so you do have to keep in mind that Render layers are great and they offer a lot of control in post, but changes to them does increase your, the amount of time that you have to spend rendering. 
So you do need to think about exactly what you need and if you necessarily need a render layer for it. In this case though, we do. Dust is something that is a lot easier to control in post and clients sometimes are like, make it slightly darker or make it slightly brighter or make it slightly thicker. Very easy to do that type of stuff in post and dust can take a long time to render. So it's, it makes sense to do it in a separate render layer for this. Now we do have a, another problem here. And for this, I need to go into probably back to our master scene just so we can show this a little bit more clearly. So we can see all of this dust down here basically, but down here, it's just clipping through the floor, the ground plane, which is absolutely not what we want to have happen. So we also need to include the environment plane as a matte object. So you can see this part completely blocks like the ship as it's landing here, but it's also blocking the dust that's clipping through it. So basically we just need to create another material wrapper for all of the rocks. Uh, there might be cases though where a material wrapper is not appropriate or you just can't use a material to override something. In V-Ray, there's a node called V-Ray Object Properties. So if you go up to V-Ray, V-Ray Object Properties, if you add this node, it basically gives you the same type of functionality as the wrapper material, but you're not actually wrapping it in a material. You simply have the option to do your alpha contribution, matte surface, and then on top of that, you also have visibility options for primary visibility that are separated from the render stats one over here. So in this case, we can just go ahead and use the, the, same, the same material wrapper for the entire collection. And that will be more convenient because we can do it on the entire collection. Whereas a V-Ray object property node, we would have to do it on every single object individually, which is kind of cumbersome. But this is a very useful feature where it offers, a, it offers the same functionality, but then a little bit more than the material wrapper for a lot of use cases. In this case, though, a, a material wrapper will be more convenient. So on the dust, we can right click, add a new collection, type in rocks. We'll add our rocks again, then right click on that collection, add a material override. And we could have actually done this on the same one as the ship but it's sometimes useful to have them separated in case you want to do something different on that object because the environment and the ship are different. Like you might want to do other things with them later on. You might need to, you might realize you need it to cast shadows or something like that. So in this case, we'll just leave it on a separate collection, even though we're basically adding the same material wrapper and we're just going to V-Ray material wrapper, matte surface, take the alpha contribution down to negative one. Uh, this option here would allow us to cast shadows directly on the ground plane, basically. But we don't really want to do that in this case. We don't necessarily need the shadows to be cast on the environment from the dust because we have already done that in the environment layer. So you don't want to double up on shadows. Now, if you wanted the environment to be 100% completely removed from anything else except for the environment that you only ever wanted to render once, then both the ship and the dust shadows would have to be on their own layers, or you'd have to make new layers just for the shadows, which is a little bit cumbersome. I think the way that we've done it is going to demonstrate the purpose of render layers and the immense amount of control and customization that you can have. The way that we're doing this is not necessarily the only way to do it. I just wanted to, to throw that out there. All right, so for the dust, now let's just check to make sure that this is as we expect it. So I'll go back to the dust render layer. I forgot I was not on that one. And then go back to IPR. And now you can see we get, we get the displacement of the ground, but it's also just not showing up in the alpha, which is exactly what we want. You can double check that the alpha channel is looking correct, which it does look correct here. So on that, we are good to go. Uh, we also need to remove the sky. So to remove the sky, this is going to be the same thing that we did in one of the previous lectures. Let's go up to render settings. We'll go to overrides, environment, and then we need to override the background texture color. So we're just going to right click, create an absolute override, and then we'll set this to be black. And then double check that. 
So now we don't have the sky in there, that looks correct. Just double check that the alpha channel is also looking correct. The only part that should be white is the dust. Alright, so next we have to do the same thing on the environment, because I forgot to remove the sky from this one as well. So right click over the background texture, create an absolute override, set the color to black, and then just double check this one worked as well. Every time you start making changes, it's a good idea to run the IPR again just to double check. And I suppose it would be useful to go to a frame where we could actually see the sky, which you can there. So that is now black. Perfect. So then the next thing we need to do is go back to the master layer. Go back to the IPR and there should still be sky here. If you go back to your master layer and you realize, hey, something's completely disappeared or something's not showing, then you probably accidentally didn't create an override. Okay, so that is the basic setup of what we're going to be do using to render these. So when we do the render, we're going to have those three layers. And then we also need one for our sky. I can't forget the sky. So the last render layer, we'll just type in sky. And we don't really need to do anything at all on this one. We just need to make sure that only the sky is showing up. So just make sure it's not black. And if it is black, that means you probably didn't create an override and it's black on everything. So just check that. And if it is black on everything, you would want to reattach your V-Ray sky to it. So let me just show you that. Let's, let's pretend that you accidentally did that. You, you broke the connection. You change the color so it's black on everything. So every layer now, it's completely gone. So on the master layer, it's gone as well. You're like, oh no, what did I do? Let's go to the hyper shade. And then we want to look for the texture node, I believe. And it's the V-Ray sky right there. And we simply middle mouse, click and drag that into the background texture. And that reapplies the connection. So that is pretty simple how you do that. But uh, I can imagine that would be a point of concern if you accidentally did that and you were like, oh no. What did I do? So just to double check that that worked, IPR, you can see, hey, sky's there. Good. On the ship. Still no sky, even after reapplying that connection. Okay, because the overrides were already in place. All right, so that is the basic setup, as I said. But now we need to add AOVs to just the ship render layer. We don't want to do AOVs for anything else just yet. All right, so we want to create AOVs specifically for the ship. We might also want to do it for the rocks. It just depends if we feel that that's necessary. But we'll set it up and we'll render out with AOV set, and then we can extract them later if we need to. Okay, I do want to stress the point that it's not always necessary to render with AOVs, but for the point of this class, it is necessary, so you learn what to do. You should always strive to get as close as you can from Maya or from Blender or whatever DCC you're using. Get it as good as you can, but rendering out AOVs allows you to change a lot of things and just be more creative with it. But it's usually the most important thing to do it on objects that you probably need to change. Like you probably want to be able to change the main subject, for example, which in this case is the ship. The environment, you may not need AOVs for. It just depends. In this case, we will need at least the depth for the background, so we will need to do that. All right, so we're going to do this on the ship layer. This is important, so you don't get AOVs on every single layer. Go on to our render elements. So once again, AOVs are the same as render elements and same as render passes, okay? It's all the same name. Render passes in other software is sometimes a very loose term. That's probably why AOVs is very clear and exactly what you mean. Arbitrary output variables. V-Ray calls them render elements. Just remember all three of those things mean the same thing. All right, so first thing that we're going to do, in order to get this to look correct and match the beauty, we need the following. We need GI. We need lighting. This is going to be our direct lighting. We need to have our reflections our refractions for the glass. We wouldn't need it, but we do need the glass here. We need, or well, we would need normally self-illumination, but there's nothing on the ship that lights up. If you wanted to add lights to this, it'd be really cool. You would need self-illumination, but for us, we don't need it. 
We need Specular though. We need we absolutely need those. And then there's going to be some other ones that we haven't talked about. And we're going to start from the top. And we're going to go to one called Cryptomat. This is going to be very interesting. I want to show you what this does. Next, we're going to use a denoiser. This is going to speed up render time considerably. We're going to make our images less grainy. And then we're going to also do extra text. This is going to be for AO. I'm going to scroll down here. And then we're also going to do Z depth. This is going to be important for adding some depth of field. So Z depth. These are the new ones that we haven't talked about, and we're going to be using those in a minute. All right, so Cryptomat, let's see what this does. So if we go to Cryptomat and then open up your extra view ray attributes, there's a few things that you might want to be able to change with this. Let's first go to the IPR, let this set up. Now, because we are adding more elements than what is contained in the beauty, for example, Cryptomat, the denoiser, extra text, and Z depth, this will take a little bit longer to render. These really don't take longer to render because they're already being rendered. We're just separating them out into different passes. So technically, yeah, it takes very slightly longer to do, but these definitely take a lot longer, or they could, especially extra text. Right now, this is completely blank, but we will be adding something to that in a moment. All right, so we can stop the IPR now and then just have a look at what this cryptomat is. So cryptomat is, is pretty interesting, and this is a newer feature in a lot of renderers. And basically it's going to give you specific elements of whatever it's set to be. So by default, this is no name with hierarchy. There's a lot of different options here. Depending on the renderer, there's gonna be even more, like 3ds Max handles what is called layers. And layers are different to how Maya display layers are basically, but you can stack up your scene in layers and you can do hierarchies based on those. In this case, though, it's going to be pretty simple. Every object is going to be a different color. And this allows you to be able to select specific components of your environment or the ship and then selectively change how it looks. Like you could selectively change what the engines look like or the tint or the color or whatever. You basically can use all of these as mats to be able to control specific aspects of your scene. So here's a practical use case. Let's say you have a city and you have all your buildings in one hierarchy, like one group, so they're all selectable on the same thing. Or you can do all your trees, for example, and let's say the trees are too green or something, or like they're just too reflective. You can select all of the trees and control them at once without having to worry about having them on a specific render layer. So sometimes Cryptomat can replace having to have render layers, in this case, though, we do need it because we want to be able to change the blur differently. And we want to be able to, I want to just show you this workflow. But Cryptomat is also another workflow that you can use and have everything kind of embedded if you need to. It's very useful. And we might be using that later. All right, so going down the list here, we have what is called the denoiser. So if you go to the denoiser here, you're not really going to see anything that's different. If you go to the RGB color, though, you should see that this looks pretty clean. This not a lot of noise. If I turn off the denoiser here, you might be able to see there's a few areas where it's a little bit grainy, especially in the shadowed areas over here. The denoiser tries to clean that up. There are a few different types of denoising. So there's the default V-Ray denoiser, which is what we're going to be using. For IPR, it uses what is called the NVIDIA AI denoiser. This one's very, very fast, but the quality is not very good in motion. So there's also a new one called the Intel Open Image Denoiser. I have never used this. It's actually new in the latest version of V-Ray. We're just going to stick this on the default. At IPR, though, is, is perfectly cool to have the IPR with the AI denoiser, but we're just going to use for the actual rendered images this. This is going to clean up your image and just make sure it reduces the grain. There's a few options here. You can do a lot, default, strong, custom, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Just leave that on the default settings and everything is good. You will also notice this thing up here for deep output. After Effects cannot handle deep EXR files at all, but uh, we have to specifically tell V-Ray to save out deep images. Deep images basically save depth information per pixel. And that's very technical. We're not going to talk about it. Uh, I believe Fusion can handle deep compositing, but it's mostly like a nuke thing. It gives you even more control of your scene but it literally makes like every single file like a gigabyte, like every frame a gigabyte. So it's completely impractical for most use cases. So don't worry about that. If it's on, 
If it's off, doesn't change anything. Not for us. Okay, so going back to this, extra text. Well, extra text, if we go to that path here, nothing is here. We still get the alpha, but we're basically coding the entire ship in nothing. All right, so let's change that. So for the extra text, we're going to actually use this for AO. And to change the name of that so it doesn't say extra texture, basically, we're going to just type in on the explicit channel name AO for ambient occlusion. Now, ambient occlusion is not part of the beauty. It is not included, usually, unless you're integrating your AO textures or an AO shader as part of your color map, for example, then it would be, and then you would never need to composite AO separately. But we do want to composite it separately in this case, so we're going to create a pass for it. So this does not have to be just for AO. It can be for anything. Let's say you wanted to code everything in some grunge texture just so you had a little bit more detail and then kind of multiply or overlay that on top of your whole comp. You could do that with this. But for this example, we're just going to use AO. So for the texture, we'll click on the input connection and V-Ray calls AO dirt. And that's because you can actually use this dirt shader for a lot more than just AO. You can use it for creating dirt, for example, around like edges and stuff like that. But basically, it's going to be useful for us to create AO from dirt. So instead of calling this dirt, we'll just call that AO. And the default settings are probably OK, but let's go and check out what these look like. Now, if we start up the IPR again, go to AO, this is going to look way too, uh, it's going to look too gray. And if you are ever used to seeing gray AO with sRGB rendering, this would not be acceptable for AO. You would want this to be a lot better, basically. If I switch this back to sRGB, you can kind of see how your AO is looking. And this is what we would consider to be pretty good. But when you're setting up your AO, you might want to just change your display correction back to sRGB, just so you can gauge what the values are a little bit more easily. Then we will need to change this back to OCIO, but because our ACES color space and tone mapper is kind of pushing down all our values so they don't clip, it also affects AO. So in this case, I'm gonna switch this temporarily to sRGB and just show you what some of these settings are. So as is, this still looks a little bit too dark in places. So on the fall off, we're actually gonna increase that fall off, maybe something like four would be a good value to use. I'll stop the IPR, start this up. For whatever reason, my IPR has been pretty laggy today, so I'm going to keep doing that. And you should see that the shadows are a little bit tighter. The point of AO is to get really tiny, sharp shadows. It is not generally to have like a lot of really large cast shadows. That's what the rest of your lighting and GI is doing. So in this case, we're only really interested in very, very thin shadows. So you could increase your fall off again if you needed to. You could lower your radius to less than like five, for example. And this is highly scene dependent. So if you had this entire scene to scale, these numbers would be very different. So you might notice a little change there. Distribution almost acts as like contrast. So if we increase our distribution to something like two, you should see a change here as that comes back on. The shadows are even sharper now. And especially over here, we're almost beginning to lose those fine edges. I would say for AO, that's pretty good. There's some shadows that might be a little bit too sharp, but we're never going to composite fully with AO anyway, so this is probably okay. I might try just increasing the fall off just a little bit. Just so that's a little bit cleaner around here. That, that looks fine, okay? But remember, we're going to set this back to OCIO for the ACES, and it's going to look gray and washed out, but this is fine, okay? This will be usable. All right, so last but not least, we have depth. So depth is going to render the scene with a black and white gradient. And by default, objects that are far from the camera are going to be white, and objects that are closer to the camera are going to be black. So we want to have a nice range of value. So we really need to see everything at once. Now, to, in order to set this up, we actually need to go back to our master scene here. And when we do that, you can see that all of these are set to off for the master scene. Temporarily, I'm going to turn the Z depth on. And then I'm going to render the entire scene again with that Z depth path being on so we can capture the entire scene. Because we need this 
in order to judge the distance for the entire scene. So I'm going to pull this down here, turn this off. And for this, I really need to go to a different view. So I'm going to go to the top view here, right click at the camera, top view, like an orthographic top view. We're going to go to create measure tools, distance tool. And then we're going to select near the camera right there. It's going to add a locator. And then we're going to go all the way to the edge of our scene here. And this will show us in centimeters how large our scene is. So as you can see, this is absolutely minute. This is like a miniature set. It's 81. We really should have made this to scale. And that's my fault for not setting that up at the beginning. But we just got to work with what we have right now. We can't really change it. So 81 is what we're going to be using for our distance. So let's go back to our pass. So we'll click on the depth. And this is going to be in centimeters. Well, we is nowhere near a thousand. It's going to be closer to 100. Or you could you could put in 81, but it's okay to do a little bit more. And if we re-render that, you should see a lot more of the scene come into view now. So this is a lot more useful as depth. The objects that are getting closer to the camera are going to be darker. You could invert that later if you wanted to. And objects that are f further away are going to be whiter. Now you could tweak these values even more. So the depth black, you could say the darkest this could go is like 20 or something. If you increase this number here, it's going to be darker further into the shot away from the camera. You can see now the ship is completely black. But in this case, we want that to be zero. For the depth white, I'm actually going to lower that again, maybe something like 90. So we can see that there should be a little bit, it should be a little bit brighter now in the background. You also want to uncheck your depth clamp here. That's going to be pretty important. We don't want to have that. But we're going to do for the, for the depth, we'll just say something like 85, probably good. You usually want to go a little bit more than what the total scene is, just so you have a little bit of clearance. But something like that is going to be pretty good. And as I said, we're going to be using this for what is called depth of field. So as the camera is focusing on the ship, the ship is going to be in focus and the background is going to be very slightly out of focus. And that's something that we can do in post to a certain extent. If it's subtle, we can do it pretty well. And it's going to allow us to change the look of the overall, the overall shot. Okay, so we need to make sure that that is working correctly. Make sure you change these settings because if you don't, then obviously you're not going to get the same result because it starts off at a thousand. I don't want the depth to render for the beauty. Actually, I don't need that at all. So if we go back to the ship, all of these are yeses. Now for the environment, if we go to this one, you can see all of these are off for the environment. But we probably want these AOVs for the environment as well. So what we need to do on this, if you simply select these all as yes, because these are not overridden, if we go back to the master layer, now they're all on. So we don't want them on for the sky or the, or the master layer. We only want them for the ship and we want them for the environment. So on the environment, we have to create overrides for them to be enabled. We go one by one and just enable them all. So create override, set it to be on. Make sure every time that you do this, enable turns orange, and then it is good to go. On this file name suffix, the AO, I do want to put an AO there. And on this right here, you could just type in AO, just so it's clear, because you might have multiple extra text elements. Want that to be on. And we want that to be on too. Okay, good to go. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions about your specific shot or anything that we've done in this video so far, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, guys, welcome back to the Razor Crest series. In this part, we need to go over the V-Ray render settings and then rendering. So if you are using the V-Ray PLE or the free version of V-Ray, there is a different step for what you have to do than if you're using the professional or full educational version of V-Ray. We're going to be going over all of that and then finally rendering our first pass 
of this landing shot. All right, so for this, we're also gonna be using After Effects to have a look at our basic composite, just to make sure that everything is lining up as we expect it. So make sure you have the Open Color IO plugin installed. If you have any questions on that, please refer to one of the previous videos where we set that up, or you can always post a comment. All right, let's get started. All right, so now the fun task of setting up our render settings. Now, this is probably a part of the video that you'll need to reference later on if you do another class or something. This is very important and it's very, very powerful what you can do with this window right here. And that first of all is where the image is gonna be saved, the type of file is gonna be saved, the animations, the cameras, all of that stuff, we're gonna set that. Okay, so I'm gonna set my render layer to the ship layer. So without creating overrides, everything that we change here applies to all of our layers, which is fine. And we're gonna start at the top on common and work our way down. There's quite a lot of settings to do. First thing here is the file name prefix. And this is probably not something that you've changed before, but this is very, very powerful. And I'm gonna show you a useful way of setting this up. So for this, I wanna to navigate to the Razor Crest and go to the images folder. This is the images that we created before of those test renders, and we had those EXRs here. But really, we want everything to be in a subfolder for every time that we render a new camera or a new version. So what you could do, you could create a folder here and have Maya save it to a specific folder. But what we're going to do instead is have Maya automatically tell V-Ray to create the folders for us. So we're going to delete all of this. And the way that we're going to do this automatically is by right clicking and then we have these tokens. There are more tokens that you can choose from than what are listed here, but those are very nuanced and specific. But these are pretty much everything that we need for this class. There's a whole bunch of ways you can set this up. So you could say the file name is automatically gonna be whatever your actual file name is of your scene, which is very useful. You can do it based on the layer. You can do it based on the camera, the version number, the date, time as well. So what we're going to do on this is say, I want to have every version that we render out in a separate folder, because you usually don't ever want to render out over the same version, because that's bad practice. And let's say you rendered it out and it was almost good. And then you decided, hey, let me do a version two or a version like 19 or something. And then the client goes, hey, we approved version 18. And you're like, oh, well, I just rendered over all of it. Now I need to render out version 18 again. So that's why you keep your versions until you're done with the project. So we're going to right click on this and then we're going to start off with version. But we don't actually have a version label and we do need that. So for the version label, that should be whatever your scene version is. So we're using version one. We can say version one. Now you could decide just to do this based on the scene if you wanted to. So if you wanted to take your entire file name, you could do that, but that's a little bit long. So instead we'll just see version label. So it's gonna create a folder for us called version if we add a slash. We'll do a slash. If we click off to the side here, you can see that this says ship version one, and then it'll just be a blank PNG. It'll just do, be the frame number. So we can do version, and then inside that version folder, we'll create another folder for our layer. Gonna have a folder for the ship, folder for the environment, folder for the dust, and a folder for the sky. And I just realized that sky is a capital K, not what I wanted. So then we do another slash and make sure that these are forward slashes, not backslashes. Anytime you do a slash, whatever's in front of it creates a folder called that. So we have version one as a folder, the ship is a folder because we're on the ship layer. And then we need to add in the layer again, underscore the version label. So let me uh, explain this again. So we have our file name is going to create a folder called version one, a folder within version one called ship. And in the ship folder, every frame is going to be called ship version one, followed by the frame number and then the extension. So it's set to PNGs right now, but we'll change that. If you are curious about playing around with this and you don't want to use the same setup, I highly recommend you do something just so you can differentiate it. So sometimes you might want to do it based on the date instead of a version number, or sometimes you want to do it based on the scene. And sometimes if you're rendering multiple cameras from the same scene, you'll want to use the camera as well. But use these tokens and it automatically figures out what the name is based on the layer that you're on and what your file is called and what camera you're using. Very useful. So if, this, if you have any questions on this, please reach out. This is very important to use for this class and for the future.
All right, so next, the image format. So for this, we're gonna be using EXRs, and those three options. If you choose this first one, Extractor will not work, and every single AOV will be rendered as a separate file. That's not gonna be very fun to composite. So we're gonna use multi-channel. And as I said earlier, After Effects cannot handle deep EXR sequences, and deep sequences are gonna be extremely large, like to the point where your computer probably cannot handle it. This is not meant for trivial compositing. This is for very in-depth compositing, stuff that we can't even do in After Effects. So we're gonna use multi-channel EXR. There's a bunch of settings here that do specific things, but uh, if you're curious, the only one that's pretty useful is this one, resumable rendering, which means that a new file will be saved for every frame that renders successfully. And that means that if you render halfway and you wanna re-render it, all you have to do is click render and V-Ray will figure out what is already rendered up to a point. So that's useful, but uh, it's gonna give us way more files than we need. So we're not gonna do that. So let's go to image format options now. And V-Ray groups all the image formats in one giant tab, but we are only interested in the open EXR option here. There are different compression types that we can choose. Scanline is gonna be probably the best. It's lossless, but the files are fairly small. If you say no compression, your files will be absolutely enormous. So we don't wanna do that. There's a whole bunch of them here. This one is a lossy compression, DWAB, or DWAA or DWAB. I use this at work because it keeps our files really small and we don't actually need that much stuff to composite at work. But for this class, we're gonna do scanline zip. If you wanna experiment with other ones or you're really short on hard drive space or you don't like to transfer stuff, these ones are almost indistinguishable on their lossiness. They're like really good, okay? But I'm gonna do scanline. Bits per channel, we work in 32 bits per channel. Maya and Bayray render at 32 bit, but we don't actually need all that information. We're just gonna keep this at 16. Render region is gonna be the entire image, okay? You should usually do this unless you are trying to render out, for example, just a specific section. Like you can create these little windows and you could only render that. So let's say, for example, you wanted to change one building that is only occupying this side of the frame the entire time or for a portion of frames. You can do a render region and it was only going to render out that part of the image. But it's very easy to accidentally forget that you leave this on. This is why the whole image is better to, to set this to. So underneath here, we also have an option for what is called a multi-part EXR. Multi-part EXRs is a, an extension of EXR, basically. It's a way of reading an EXR file, kind of like a folder, like a zip file, for example, and only pulling out what it needs. This is a newer format of EXR, and it's a little bit faster to use in most cases because it's just more efficient in After Effects and Nuke and Fusion and stuff like that. If you don't do this, you're probably not gonna notice any difference for this class, but it is a bit more efficient to have these save as multi-part. Extra attributes, well, we don't really have any to add, but you can do all sorts of interesting things. If you had color adjustments saved here that you wanted to bake into the EXR, you could save that here, but we're not gonna do that. So really, you don't need to even go to this option box at all, but if you wanted to see what these are and see what I set mine to, this is what I do. I sometimes do this, but uh, for this class, scanline is fine. Okay, so we can go back out of that, close the IPR again, and now we can go down to animation. So this is gonna be pretty important. If you don't set animation, it's only gonna render one frame. So we wanna do standard probably, but standard is going to render from frame one to frame 10 by default. We're gonna be rendering frame one to frame 200. I don't really want any more frames than this, and I'm sure you don't wanna to have to render more than 200 frames. This is pretty standard Maya stuff. There's not a lot of change here. This option over here is if you want to render like a full production frame, but you don't want it to render the entire sequence, you check this just so you can render like one frame at a time. If you only use IPR, it doesn't matter. But if you click on this icon up here, the main clapperboard, V-Ray by default will just start rendering the entire sequence. 
So that's useful to leave on if you're not ready to render. And also if you're using the free version of V-Ray, the PLE version, the personal learning edition, you have to leave this unchecked to actually render everything out because you don't have what is called batch mode, which I'll be showing you in a minute in case you are on campus. So there's, a, there's two different versions of how you render stuff. So you probably want to leave that unchecked unless you're just still not ready to render. Okay, so next is the renderable camera. This is important. You want to make sure this is set to camera one. If you have multiple cameras, you can add more, but we're only going to be using one camera here. For the resolution, we've already set this. It's 1920 by 817, 2.35 to one aspect ratio. That's good. If you wanted to do 16 by nine, it would be 1920 by 1080. You have to render it at least this though. Well, you need to be turning your comps in at least 1920 by 1080 in the comp. So well, there'll be some letterboxing on our comp, but that's fine. All right, next we'll go up to V-Ray. First of all, there are two options for the renderer. We're using the V-Ray one here. If you are on a laptop or you're on a older computer, you probably need this on V-Ray. So if you have an RTX card or a, let's say a 1080 or above, you might want to consider turning on the V-Ray GPU mode. For something as simple as this, it's probably fine to use. Problems with GPU rendering are usually due to the fact that you run out of memory quite quickly on a GPU. So if you have a more modern video card, let's say at least eight gigs of RAM, you might be able to start using GPU rendering. If you have, let's say uh, 1080, you, you probably can just about get by with that. If you have like a 2080 or 2080 Ti or like a, or a 3000 series, you might want to consider rendering with the GPU. If you're on campus, you also might want to consider rendering with the GPU. V-Ray is getting very, very close to having its GPU mode as complete as the regular V-Ray mode. This one uses your, your processor, your CPU. This one relies more heavily on your GPU. There are differences between these. For this specific scene though, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference, but sometimes the lighting changes. So the, the way that it does its algorithms is very slightly different. So you might notice, especially with dust, you might actually notice a significant change. I'm going to set mine to GPU, but if you do not have a graphics card that's capable of running it, you probably will have to change it back to V-Ray. So if you're on campus, it's up to you. I'm going to leave mine on GPU, but as I said, that's up to you. If you have an RTX card, there is the option for RTX ray tracing, basically. It's an acceleration. You can leave this on, you can leave it off. I honestly haven't noticed much difference if you have GPU mode on. Out of core means if your GPU runs out of memory, it doesn't just crash the whole scene and stop rendering. It's supposed to be able to put some of that memory that was on your GPU and stored on your system RAM. And then when it needs it again, it will grab it. It's a very, very slow and inefficient process, but it prevents your render from failing. So usually you wanna have that on if you're in GPU mode. If you're not, you can't do this at all. So there's no, no option. The rest of the settings here are going to be the same, whether you're on GPU or CPU mode, it doesn't matter. The sampler type, if you are on regular V-Ray mode, you absolutely should 100% be on progressive, okay? Progressive is going to allow you to change your maximum render time like we discussed before. And what I recommend for something like this is that you do something really, really quick, like 0.5. So 30 seconds a frame, that's going to be pretty good. But 30 seconds a frame is probably going to turn into a two hour render because we have 200 frames. So if we said 30 seconds a frame and we have 200 frames, that's going to be, let's say, 100 minutes to render each one of these passes, right? So these are going to take a while to render out. Sky will be super quick. The environment will probably be pretty quick and so the ship will probably be pretty quick too. The dust is going to be what's going to take the longest probably. But I would recommend when you're just doing a first pass, like version one, you leave this at 0.5 or you could say 0.25. So this is in minutes. So 25% of a minute is 15 seconds. Keep it low, especially if you are on a lower end computer. It's going to be very grainy, but we have that denoiser. We have this uh, denoiser right here, which we'll have to come back to in a minute because I forgot to do something with that. But this is going to speed up your render time considerably, okay? It's going to try to aim for 15 seconds a frame or 30 seconds a frame or 
one minute at a frame, it's going to attempt to do that. Bucket rendering is going to take a lot longer. If you do want to use bucket though, let's say you want to render on two computers at the same time and they're completely different computers. Like one is a laptop, which is nowhere near as good. And the other one is a super high end computer that's blazing fast. Well, progressive is going to give you different qualities on both of those usually. So bucket, make sure that they're the same quality, but if you want to increase your speed, you would increase the threshold. You would say something like 0 0.05 or 0 0.075 or something like that. The higher this number, the grainier your image is. So those are the differences. I would recommend leaving this on progressive for V-Ray mode and just doing 0.25 and just see what your computer can do. I'm going to be setting this to GPU mode on mine. And if you're on a GPU, I highly recommend using bucket mode. A bucket tends to be more efficient for the GPU and it gives you a pretty good result. Now for this though, I would say on your threshold, you could do something like 0.1 on your threshold for a quick version. You will need to lower this for a final version, otherwise it will be pretty grainy or very blurry with the denoiser. All right, after that, color mapping. We actually don't want to have color mapping. Color mapping is the same thing as tone mapping, but we already have tone mapping with ASUS. So we don't want to have any of that at all. If you don't want any of it at all, change it to linear multiply. That basically doesn't allow any tone mapping at all. But if you want to be doubly sure, you say mode, don't affect colors, only adaptation. But we're not actually changing anything there. This is important to change. All right, so that's good. For the image sampler here, if you want this to look a little bit softer, you can do Gaussian. This produces a slightly softer image. It's not as sharp, but it's a slightly more filmic look, in my opinion. So this is what I usually use, is Gaussian. All right, GI. GI should be on by default. That's probably fine. For the preset here, if you are trying to use what is called a light cache, it's going to calculate your bounce light, but not for every frame. It's going to do it for either one frame if it's on a still and just use that same cache for the entire animation. But that, that can lead to poor results, especially if there's a lot of motion going on. You can set it to animation, but this is going to increase your render time quite a lot. For this, we're going to leave it on still. But if you're trying to do a final production render, would I do brute force? So it doesn't use a cache. But for now, this is good to go on this. Settings, we don't really need to change anything here at all. I don't remember ever really needing to do anything here. Overrides, we want to make sure viewport subdivision is enabled. This means that if you have something that is smooth shaded inside the viewport in Maya, V-Ray actually, actually will render the smooth shaded. It won't render the uh, unsubdivided version. That's pretty important. Go to the camera here. We do want to have motion blur, so we're going to enable motion blur. And everything else will be good to go. If you wanted to do any volumetrics like aerial perspective, you can do that down here, but we didn't really talk about that. Okay, so one last thing that I forgot to show you with the denoiser. Once you have applied the denoiser, by default, it's going to do it on the beauty, but we really, really don't want it on the beauty. We don't care. We just need to go to each one of these passes and make sure the denoise section clicked on. So just check that on. So V-Ray will denoise all of these. And, and both the Cryptomat has no denoiser and neither does denoise, obviously. And uh, we want to make sure that denoise is set on this one. There is also no, no denoising on the depth either. Okay, a lot of settings there. But that is the quick rundown. All right, so before we start rendering this, I need to draw your attention back to the render setup window. And this is going to be really important if you are batch rendering. So if you're on campus or you have a full version of V-Ray, whether it's the student version or a commercial version, in like in the future, these icons are very important. We already know what the eye does, and that's simply to select the current render layer. But the other icon indicates whether the layer is set to render or not to render. So if it's blue, that means it is set to render. But for the master layer or this, the scene layer over here, we actually want to uncheck that. So this layer is everything that is in the scene. This is what we use to check the lighting and see all the components together. So like the ship, the cliff, the sky, the dust, all of that in one layer. We don't want that to render though, because it's going to be kind of useless for us. 
we are separating these out so we can control them better. But ultimately, all these layers is going to recreate this one over here. So much like how we use AOVs to recreate the beauty, we're basically taking apart the master layer and then we're recreating that with these. So we don't want that one to render. It's just going to take a long time to render and we'll never need it. So make sure you uncheck that. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of wasted time and a lot of wasted space. The same thing will apply later on if you, for example, need to re-render only one of these. So let's say the environment and the sky is really good, but maybe you wanted to reanimate the ship. So you might need to, a, a different ship layer and you might need to re-render the dust again. That means that you don't need to render the environment again and you don't need to render the sky again. So you would only need to do the ship and the dust. Or let's say you just wanted to change how the rocks look. You want to change their height or change the geometry completely, then you could simply do that. And now it's only going to render out your environment. But again, this only applies if you are on campus. If you are not on campus or you don't have a full version of E Ray, which is, I would suspect, the majority of you are just using the PLE, what you have to do instead is go one by one and simply render out each one of these. But I want to show you batch rendering first and then we'll come back. So let's go up to our render settings again, common. So temporarily, I just want to set my end frame to one just so it renders out just one frame and then it will stop. And for batching, there are two options to access batching. First of all, make sure your tab is set to rendering, then go to render, batch render, and this will open up the script editor and it will show you a progress right here. But there's another option which is very useful and it involves closing down Maya completely. Because if Maya is open, especially if you have either a lower end computer or a very heavy scene that's taking a lot of system resources just to run, you can free up the system. You can free up your computer by simply closing down Maya, especially if you're on a lower end computer or have a very intensive scene open. Closing down Maya just frees up some of your system resources so you don't need to see what's in the viewport. For example, it can free up some video memory, especially. So you can simply close down Maya completely. I'm going to save this. And then you can go to your scenes folder, right click over the scene name, and then click render. And as long as all your render settings are set properly, when you click render, it'll open up a command line. And then it's going to basically just initialize the scene. And that could take, depending on your system, a few seconds, a few minutes, just depends on the complexity of your scene and your hardware. But once this starts going, you navigate to the images folder. This is where it's going to start creating images like we set in the file name prefix options. So over here is loading in bitmaps. It's going to give you a lot of different uh, logs basically of what's going on. But you can see that the version one folder has been created. And inside the version one folder, whichever layer you created first is going to render first. In this case, this is the ship layer. If we open up the ship layer, this is where your first EXR is going to be rendered out. And you can see a progress over here it does it in 10% increments. Once that is done, it then has to save it. So you can see the EXR has been added here. If I double click this, anytime that you look at an EXR file, it's not going to have the gamma correction on it. So it's going to appear to be very dark. We can back out of this one. And then you can see the environment folder has been added and it's rendering the environment. And then as soon as that is finished denoising, We'll save out the environment and now you can see the environment right here, which is pretty cool. Next, it will do the dust. Now, the dust is probably going to be blank because we're, the camera is so high up right now. So this is going to be pretty, it's going to be empty on that one. And then it will do the sky right here. And then, of course, the sky is going to be, it's going to appear to be empty because it, X in view by default ignores the alpha channel. So that's that. When the rendering is done, it will close your command window. That doesn't necessarily mean it was successful. It just means it's no longer rendering. So that's how you can batch render. Now, of course, when you batch render, you're going to want to batch render the entire animation. But that, I just wanted to show you one frame of that. Now I'm going to open up Maya again and then show you what to do if you're using the PLE version at home. I'm going to go back to my images folder. I'm going to delete this just so I can show you this. And this time we're going to go right to the very end because after this, I also want to show you how to composite this really quickly in After Effects just to make sure that you've done everything correctly so you don't waste an entire afternoon or 
entire day rendering this, depending on how long it takes. So I'm going to go to frame 200, and if you are on the PLE version, you need to go to render settings. And in this case, I want to set my start frame to 200, and my end frame would also be 200. Of course, we're not rendering a sequence. I just want to show you that last frame in After Effects. So we need to set this up like this. When you're doing your full sequence, it will be 1 to 200. But just for right now, we're doing that. All right, so the way this works, you have to make sure you select the correct viewport because the renderable camera, this is only for batch rendering. It, it doesn't apply for sequence rendering inside of Maya as far as V-Ray is concerned. So you need to select whichever one you want to start with. It doesn't matter the order, but I can just start at the top with the ship and close down that. And then I can click on the frame buffer. And make sure you don't click the IPR clapperboard. It's the clapperboard with no, no text inside. And right here, we start with the ship. And if we go back to our images folder, you can see a version one folder has been created again. Inside that, a ship folder has been created. The same thing with batch rendering, but it's only going to do one, and then you have to set up the next one. So this one is nearly done. As soon as that finishes there, it's then going to do a denoising pass, which is usually pretty quick, and then it has to save it. Once it's saved, your ship will be there. But then notice that it's completely done. The frame buffer will stay open, but it's no longer rendering anymore. And if you see this as a grayed out stop, that means is no longer rendering. So next, you got to go to the next render layer and manually set that off yourself. Not something that you would be able to do at a company, usually. Like you would want that to be completely automated so you could, you could be done for the day and then come back the next day and your frames are ready. You don't want to have to constantly be monitoring the render for when it's done to be able to set up the next one. So this is something that they have deliberately prevented you from doing with the free version, which is understandable, but it is still annoying. All right, so when that is done, we can see that we, we have a folder now for the environment. There's our one frame of the environment, frame 200. Next, we got to do the dust. The dust is probably going to be the longest to render, I would think. If if not, maybe the maybe the ship would be the sky should be pretty quick. But these are rendering fairly quickly. These can be pretty grainy, by the way, for this first pass. So if you realize that the settings that I've shown you are just still taking too long, feel free to increase the threshold, reduce your time limit. It's okay for this first pass. All right, so that's that. And then we'll do the next one here, which is the sky. That hopefully will be pretty quick. And so if you don't have any view selected, it'll be like, which camera did you want? And you gotta click the right one. We back out here, you can see that the dust was created right there and the sky folder is being created. And as soon as that's done, there's your sky. Okay, so let's just check to make sure all of these are working as we expect them to work inside of After Effects. So let's open up After Effects. This is also going to be pretty quick because this is review. We'll just leave that as comp one for right now. And we can leave this letterbox for right now too. That's, that's perfectly fine. We first need to create an adjustment layer for our ASUS color correction. So let's open color IO, drag that over. Configuration, if you're at home, should find the last configuration file. If you cannot remember its display correction, you just grab just grab this path, copy and paste that. Copy and paste that in here. That's what we need. Display, input space, scene linear, ASUS CG. And then we're good on that. Next, we need a color profile converter. sRGB, sRGB, linear eyes. All right, cool. All right, so on the sky, we need to right click over the sky, interpret footage main, ignore the alpha, because we do want to see that, like that. Next, we'll need our environment. There's our environment. Then we'll have the ship. And then we'll have the dust. So, so far, so good. If you notice the dust, 
is just the dust cut around the ship. So all of that is transparent. And you, you might notice one problem here, and this is because the ship is technically on top of the environment, but really it would be behind this piece of geometry right here. So we do need to fix that. Now, this can be done in a variety of ways, but I'm going to show you a cheap solution that probably works for the majority of you because the landing gear is completely obscured behind all of this geometry, all of these rocks. If, yours, if your camera is higher looking down, what you need to do is go back into Maya and include the ship mat on your environment. But in this case, I wanted to show you a different way of doing that. So this is going to depend on how you've set this up. If you have set this up like mine and the camera's pretty low, you can do the following. You can grab what is called a cryptomat. You would go down to your environment, you would duplicate your environment, click enter, and then you would say environment ground mat or just ground mat. And then you can grab the cryptomat on that ground mat. Now when cryptomat is applied, this is gonna give different colors for all of your objects. And the colors that it chooses in After Effects are going to be different based on what the V-Ray frame buffer showed you. This is because any implementation of Cryptomat, like either in After Effects or in V-Ray, it's all the same type of algorithm to do it, but it just randomizes the colors of your geometry. There's no like set pattern of what colors it chooses, so this is why it might look different. But then you just simply click the geometry you want to turn into a mat, go to Output, change that to Mat Only, and then we can use this as a luma mat. So then on the ship, we would drag our environment ground above the ship, turn off these solos. Then on the ship right here, we would say track mat would be luma inverted. That ship can go anywhere except where that ground is. And now you can see it is hiding behind those rocks like that. So that's basically what we would do there. On the off chance that you can see the landing gear clearly on yours, you probably didn't even need to do that at all. But for some reason that doesn't work. You can re-render your environment with the ship matted out in the same way that we did the dust. So review how to do it on the dust and to do the same thing on your environment layer. And as always, if for whatever reason you can't figure it out, just ask me and I'll be more than happy to show you again. Okay. Right, so that is that. Now we need to make sure that our passes are working, or AOVs are working. So we're gonna go to the effects, go to our effects and presets, extractor, drag this on the ship. And we're gonna start off with GI. We solo this, it's gonna appear very dark, but if you increase your exposure here, you can see that there is, there is something there, there is information there. I'm going to click enter and then type in ship GI. And then we will duplicate that, but I don't want to show you the full composite right now. So we're actually going to turn off this track mat temporarily and we'll, it will be sticking on top of the ground, but that's okay for right now. Next, we're going to make a copy of that. This is going to be our lighting. We go down to lighting. This will be additive. We'll just add that on top. Again, this is going to look pretty dark and that's because the ship is metal. Next, we're going to do reflection. This is called reflect. Specular. Fraction. This time, we also have one for AO. We do AO. If this doesn't say AO, Look for extra text because you may have forgotten to change that. So do AO. And we also have one for depth. And AO is going to be multiplied. And depth is not actually used as a blending mode at all. It's just normal. Okay, so we can actually turn both of these off. And then this should match whatever your beauty is exactly. If you want to double check that, to take another copy of your ship over here, place that on top. And if you turn that on and off, the only difference you should see is the beauty will be a little bit more grainy or quite a lot more grainy if you turn on your denoiser because all those passes have the denoise filter applied. But by default, RGB does not have that. That's why it's going to be a bit grainier. 
But other than that, it looks the same, it looks correct. Okay, we can actually just delete that. If we add our AO to the ship, we're just darkening the edges down. So if we zoom in, we're darkening that down. And then on the depth, this will be used with the whole scene when we are ready to do the composite. There's one thing that this is lacking. If we go back into Maya here, I forgot to set up our lens effects. So I'm going to do that really fast. Back to the IPR. And then to enable lens effects, you got to go down to enable bloom and glare right here. And if you get some crazy image right here, it's because the denoiser is kind of interfering with it. So just turn off your denoiser for right now. And then you want to click on enable bloom and glare. And what happens is after that is done, it should apply some glare. And you can see that's pretty subtle. You probably want to increase that though. So we could do an intensity of maybe two. You can increase the size as well. And there's the, those two options, if you recall. There's bloom. If you increase that all the way up, that's just going to be a glow. If you pull that all the way down to zero, it's going to give you more of a sharp kind of star shape. So if I make this ridiculously big, you should be able to see that a little bit more clearly. Like that. That's kind of ridiculous, like a star. If it's at one, if you do that at like one, it's more just going to be like a glowy, glowy highlight. I like the glint at zero. So that's up to you though. You can choose what you want. For the intensity, uh, we can always change that in post. The size though, we can't really change in post. So I, I would do something like maybe 50 or 40. You can even leave it on the default and it probably looks, probably looks fine. Now these are things that we could go back and we could change later for the next pass, but just to get something into After Effects, I wanted to, to show you that. So that's how you enable it. This will automatically create a pass for you. Let me stop the IPR there. And then we just need to render out the ship again. I'll just click on the render icon and just let that render out the ship again. All right, so when that is done, you don't need to save it because it's already being saved. So you can go back into After Effects. The way that you refresh this, you would simply right click over this layer and then say reload. Nothing's going to appear to change, but now if you duplicate the topmost layer there, the ship depth, pop in ship glare instead, then in layers, you should now have a glare AOV. Click on that. And then you have glare that will be added. And now you have glare. I'm going to place this above my speculator right there, but it doesn't really matter. You can place it wherever. And once you've done all that, you would do the same thing for your environment. Your environment also has those same passes. Just check to make sure they're all there. You should have everything like GI, your reflections. You can just flick through these if you're pretty confident they're all set up. If they work fine for the Razor Crest, they should be the same here. The really important one for us though is going to be depth. Depth needs to needs to be working properly. So you, we're going to be combining this with the ship depth and we'll be creating some depth of field with that. Also just make sure that Cryptomat works. Now there is a Cryptomat pass here, but you can't do anything with these really. Not here. So if you click on this, this is going to be black. Because these aren't really, um, the, the extractor is looking for like color information, but they technically have color, but they're not going to be interpreted properly because their values are just numbers. They're not really color values. What Cryptomat does, that is how you view the Cryptomat pass, and this will assign a color for every ID, basically. So that's, that's what we're going to be using for that. Okay, so just make sure the environment works as well. I don't really want to show that in this video because it's already gone on for too long. Okay, once you have got all of that working and you're sure everything is ready to go, then you can go back to Maya and set up your full sequence. So let's go up to the render settings, start frame, frame one. And if you are using the PLE, just click this button one at a time, go through all of these. If you're at, on campus, just batch render it and that will be good. 
One other thing that I wanted to point out here. If you are struggling with this and your renders are taking forever, there's a few things that you can do to kind of speed this up. For now, you could delete the denoiser because that does take extra time. And you could also remove AO. AO is probably the least important part of this entire, entire shot. It is nice to have, but AO does take longer to render because it is not part of the beauty. It does have to calculate that and it does have to render it and it can be quite noisy. So these two things would increase your time a little bit. I would still like these for the final. I, you, you will need to have denoising for the final submission unless you have a supercomputer and you don't need denoising at all. So you probably need that. So if you're on bucket mode, you could increase your threshold. This is a really, really high threshold. You have to have denoising with that. Otherwise, this is going to be too, way too grainy. If you're on progressive, just lower your max render time. You can also try to increase your noise threshold too. And then the next video will be comping our first pass of the entire sequence. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions on V-Ray render settings or rendering in general, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Welcome back to the Razorcrest series, and now we need to start compositing what we rendered in the last video. So for this, you definitely need to have something rendered from Maya. And as we progress through this, you've probably made some mistakes. I certainly found some issues that I needed to correct. And we'll go back into Maya and then just make sure all of those are fixed for the next version that we render. All right. Let's get started. All right, so for this next part, I'm assuming that you have rendered out all 200 frames of each render layer. That's what we need in order to begin compositing this and see if there's anything that we need to change in Maya when we go back to render our final version. So just to clarify, you need at least two different iterations of this while you're working through it. You need like a rough draft and then the final thing. That said, you might need to have more renders as you work through this if you realize certain things aren't working. But the bare minimum would be two. One that's pretty low quality and one that will take longer to render but will be nicer quality. So even with the denoising on here, there will be some issues with that, with the settings that we used last time. So the first thing we have to do is load in the full frames. And there's two different ways to do this. I'll show you both ways. If your render layers over here say a range, so in this case, I rendered out frame 200 in the last lecture just to make sure everything was you know, being composited properly. This says 200 to 200. If yours has some kind of range in there, all you have to do is select the layers, right click and do reload. And then you'll see the full sequence gets loaded in here and everything is good. Now, if this does not happen to you and you see like a little Photoshop icon or, or the icon of the software that is associated with the EXR format on your computer, right click on any one of these. You have to do each one in turn. So I'll start with the dust, replace footage with file. So in this case, we're doing dust. We'll go to the dust folder and you can simply click on any one of these frames in the sequence. So it doesn't have to be the first one, but just make sure that the open EXR sequence option is checked. So if this was off for you, After Effects will interpret these as just individual images. But if this is checked, it will look to see if it thinks it's part of a sequence. So you want to make sure that that is set. Then you can click import and then it would import. Then you would do the next one for environment, ship, and then sky all separately. When they have all loaded in, just make sure that these are going all the way to frame 200. We're actually in After Effects. This will be 199 because After Effects starts on zero and Maya by default starts at one. For clarity, we should have changed that, but it doesn't really matter. Just, but just remember that there's a one frame offset. Uh, just make sure all the layers are there. For some, whatever reason, my dust layer here did not go all the way. So just make sure that that is there. Uh, one other thing I want to do just before we continue is make sure that everything matches what we had in Maya on our master scene. So I'm going to Maya. I'm going to select the master scene, go to render settings. I'm going to disable the animation. And then on frame 200 down here, I'm going to just render out one frame and just check to make sure that this matches up with what we had composited last time. Now, this is something that we kind of did last time, but we didn't actually take in the master layer. So it would be a good idea just to double check, just to see if there's any minor issue that is wrong. In the previous lecture, we should have been able to catch any major problem. Master layer, 
load in the master layer, and I'll just drag this underneath the OCIO save there. So there's going to be a few things that are different with the master. The first thing is, and this is a pretty big deal that I need to talk about, and I, we kind of talked about this last time, but the ground here blocks where the landing gear shows up in the master layer, but in our version, we didn't actually include the ground in the ship render layer, so we have to do that in a different way. There's a couple different things that we can do on that. But if we turn the master layer back on, we can see that, first of all, there's no denoising, so it's very grainy. If we can see here in the hole on the front of the ship, it's pretty grainy. If we toggle this on and off, you can see that the denoising is very smooth, almost a little bit too smooth, and it does kind of average out those colors. So we are losing a little bit of the lightness there. And then you'll also see that the glare has been applied to our passes, but it doesn't get applied to our beauty or our master layer here. So that is also going to be another difference. But for the most part, if you turn this on and off and you see like wildly different values, or you see your dust is there and then it's not there in the other one, then that would be a problem. For us, our dust kind of finishes at frame 200. So it's something I do want to change. There is a little bit of dust in there. So if I turn this off and then toggle the dust on and off, you can see there's a little bit of dust left. Something I want to go back and change a little bit later. Now we need to talk about the landing gear. And this is something that we probably should have done a more complicated mat in Maya to prevent this issue from happening. But depending on how you did it, we could easily solve this with Cryptomat. So in the previous lecture, I showed you this environment ground mat. So if we turn this on and solo this, Basically, I thought that, hey, we can use Cryptomat to select this piece of geometry, and since the ship would be behind this, everything is good. Although, I actually made a mistake when I was doing this. So if I select my ground mat, click T for opacity, and just kind of lower the opacity, After Effects is going to use this outline here to determine where the gear should show up and where it should not show up, and this mat is actually higher to where the rocks are. But let me show you what happens if we try to use this as a mat. But this might actually be a really good solution for you, depending on how the ship lands and how tilted your camera is and how tall the displacement is on your ground. If the camera is looking down, this probably wouldn't even be a problem. But if you were following along with me and did a very similar camera action, this might be an issue. Okay, so what we're going to do, we need to have a mat for each one of these layers. So this is something that we've done before in After Effects, it's no big deal, but this time we want the same mat to be applied to all of these different passes. So I'm going to show you a foolproof but kind of cumbersome way to do it first, and then we'll go with a newer way, which can work a lot of the time, but for certain things it's not going to be a good solution. But I want to show you both things, just to show you that there are multiple ways of doing this, more or less the same thing in After Effects. Because we want multiple copies of this environment ground mat, but we want them to be instanced. So anytime we make a change to one of them, they all get updated. What we're going to do is pre-compose it because pre-comps in After Effects are instanced. So a change to one pre-comp is always going to change the other one. So we'll do control shift C. I'm just going to take off the one there to say comp. We're going to move all attributes into the layer, which will take the crypto mat and put it on top of this layer here. We click OK, and then you can see the crypto mat's gone because crypto mat is now on here. And we're going to copy this layer and then go all the way to the ship GI layer and then just click Control V. So this will paste it on top of it. And remember that mats must go above the layer that needs the mat. And then we'll go to the next one, just paste, 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 and paste. We're not going to worry about ship depth right now. We'll do that in a different way. And then you can go through each one of these passes, just Control select them. And then for the track mat, because this ground plane is white and we actually don't want it to show up where it's white, we would say on our track mat, Luma inverted. And as soon as we do that, we can see that, hey, the gear is now behind the rocks and everything is good, except for the fact that our screen right landing gear, it thinks that the is actually behind the base of the cliff here, which is not correct. If you had a lot of dust here, it probably wouldn't be a problem. And if you had your rocks that were much higher, it also wouldn't be a problem, it would be fine. So this might be a good solution for you, but for me, I need to fix that back in Maya. So that's one way of doing this. I'm actually going to Control Z that and then Control Z a few times to get rid of all of those environment mats. 
I want to show you how you can use this layer on all of these different passes without having to make pre-comp and without having to have duplicates. So I'm going to control Z all of that so it's just as it was before we did anything at all. And we're going to start on the ship GI layer. I'm going to solo this and then turn on the transparency toggle so we can see the whole ship because it's pretty much black. And then on a black background, you can barely see it. So we want to make sure we have some kind of contrast. Next, we're going to grab a set mat effect. And the set mat effect allows the layer to use a mat, but not as a track mat, just as referencing another layer. So a track mat has to go directly above that layer. A set mat effect can go anywhere inside that comp. We'll drag on the set mat effect. And then it says take mat from layer. And then here we select the environment ground mat. Where it says source, we change that to effects and masks in case we have any type of adjustment on the mask, like an effect or something, we would want it to honor that. And then by default, it will use the alpha channel, but the alpha channel is completely solid. And we want to say luminance. And as soon as we click luminance, it's going to say that the ship can show up only where the ground plane is white. So we want to invert that. And now it doesn't show up where it's white. So just to show you where that is, right here. So this is referencing this, and wherever this is, it's going to be off. Okay, now we can grab that effect and paste that on each one of these passes. Again, we're not going to do the ship depth for right now. We'll unsolo this, and then you say, hey, we've got the same thing that we had before. So it's a little bit of a cleaner solution because you don't bloat your scene with a whole heap of basically the same mat. Another option that you might try to use is pre-composing all of these, but I don't recommend that because first of all, it makes it cumbersome to make adjustments to any of these layers if you have a pre-comp and there are certain things you cannot do. So just, I like to have all the passes out here, which would require multiple copies of the ground mat or use the set mat effect. Now, when you're using the set mat effect, the set mat effect must go underneath extractor. Extractor must be the first thing then set mat effect. And if you had a curves adjustment or anything, like we played around last time with doing a curves on the reflection pass, make sure the set mat effect would go above that. But on any of these layers that you had that, it needs to go above curves. Otherwise, you can run into some weird issues later. And you also can't do this, right? You need to make sure that set mat effect is underneath extractor. I'm actually not going to be using the set mat effect and I'm going to be doing my mat in Maya. So I realized I made a mistake in that. I really should have made a more complicated ship layer, but I was trying to get away with doing it just with a crypto mat. But unfortunately for me, I need to take into account the fact that the ground is actually higher than this and we need just the set of rocks. So if your camera is looking down and you can see all the landing gear, you might not it might not be an issue, but if any of the rocks poke up above the landing gear or completely occlude it, like in this one, you would need to have some kind of mat either in After Effects or in Maya. And in my case, I do need to use Maya. If you can see some of the landing gear is in front of the rocks and some of it is behind, you would also need to do it in Maya. So I'll show you that a little bit later. And since we have to re-render anyway, it's not really a big deal, but it's something that we do need to, to fix because you can't turn in something like this. I would take off points for incorrect mats because the shadows don't even line up. Okay. So that is important that they do. All right. So that's something that I wanted to show you is going to be a problem, but we're going to fix it a little bit later and I'm going to leave this in this state right now. But now we need to move on to just prepping our comp and making sure everything else is good to go. Start playing around with the composite and then we'll go back into Maya. So there are a few things that we need to double check and just make sure everything is set properly. Otherwise, if you don't fix this, you will end up ruining your composite and having to start over, or you'd be submitting something that is not going to be visually correct. And if I notice it, which I probably will, you'll lose points for it. So just make sure that you set this up properly. First thing is you need to make sure that this down here says 32 BPC. So recall the lecture on color bit depth, 32 bits per channel gives us a massive amount of color space to work in. It's the highest that's available to us, and it's the highest that EXR support. We rendered out 16-bit EXRs, so you technically could be on this, but we're going to be using effects that are going to take advantage of 32 bits, so we really need to be on this one. By default, After Effects says 8. 8 is not even high enough to be able to show you what the EXR looks like 
from Maya. It's not going to be able to show the correct, correct color information. So we have to be on at least 16, but in our case, we really need to be on 32 bits per channel. Second one is the working space. Now, when I click this, this goes way off screen on the second monitor, but you need to make sure to scroll to the top and make sure this says sRGB. And then the last thing is you must linearize. If you don't linearize, the entire thing will be incorrect. So all three of these settings are critical before we begin compositing. This is something to double check. The next thing is you wanna make sure that every layer is underneath this OCIO layer, but basically just an adjustment layer that we created, adjustment layer one. Quick tip here, if you wanna see what you originally called something or what the original layer is called, like this is the ship, you just click up here where it says layer name or source name and it'll flick back between both. So we're looking at the source name right now. We select it, we look at the layer name or whatever we called it when we renamed the layer. So on this adjustment layer, you need to have the open color IO plugin. Our configuration should, should be set to display. Input space is ASUS CG, display is sRGB, and the view is ASUS 1 SDR video. This is the same thing that we use in Maya, and this is the only way to get the renders to look the same as they did in Maya or V-Ray or whatever, the frame buffer that we used in Maya. After that, you must have a color profile converter. This is what linearizes the conversion done in open color IO because After Effects also corrects the entire plate that makes it look really washed out. So if you look at something like this, it's completely wrong. You need to make sure you have both the input and output profile set to sRGB. But the output profile is linearized. Okay. If you have questions or concerns about what that actually means and you want a more in-depth explanation than what we've talked about, let me know and I'd be more than happy to give you more information about it. The very last thing that we need to do is fix our aspect ratio. So while we will be turning in a full HD 1920 by 1080 render, because that's the, the format that our slate is in, we will just render that with letterboxing, which is fine. While we're working on the main comp here, we don't want to have all of this excess space because this is going to make it a little bit awkward to do certain things like camera blur. And if we have any extra effects that we put on, they might seep out into this black space which we don't want. So we're gonna turn off the toggle transparency grids. You can see these letter boxes. We don't really want to see those in this comp. So you can either right click over your comp, go to comp settings, you can go to composition settings, or you can just do control K. When we click that for the height, we wanna make sure that this is unlocked. And then for the height, just say 817. I'm gonna put it in the correct aspect ratio. If you used a different aspect ratio that was not 2.35 if you let's say did 2.39 which is another common one or there's, there's a, a few of them that you can use you would just need to look at the resolution that you rendered in maya so if i click ok and then i select one of these layers up here it will tell you what the resolution is basically you just want to make sure that these two numbers are the same okay uh, the last thing is the duration so we had so we rendered out 200 frames from maya we'll just type in 200 when we do the final comp, we will add one more frame for the slate, but we're not going to do that just yet. Okay. All right. So that is what we have to do to get everything set up. We also need to save this. So let's go to file, save as we'll go to our projects folder and I'm going to create a new folder called comps. We'll say comps. And then inside here, we'll just label this as, I'll just label this as any 270 Razor Crest version one. You want to make sure the version number of your composition matches whatever you have in Maya. Okay, so anytime you up version something in Maya, you need to up version your After Effects. Let's say you did a whole bunch of stuff in After Effects and you're on version 10, the next file in Maya should be version 10, okay? Because you need to synchronize which ones are using which set of frames. Otherwise, it gets out of sync and very hard to figure out which ones you are actually using. So let's just say NH270. Razor Crest version one. You could also just put in the assignment number here if you wanted to, that would be fine as well. Okay, so there's a few things that we need to do, but the first thing that we really should do is just make sure that if we go to the very beginning here, we render the entire thing out and just make sure that everything is working as we expect or, or find issues. And there's gonna be issues no matter what you do. So we're gonna change our resolution here to half. This is going to make it a little bit blurry, but it'll render faster. You can go up to the preview tab here and just click the start or you can click spacebar. And what this is gonna do, every frame is gonna turn green, which is going to load in that frame into your system RAM. 
So instead of saving it to a hard drive, which is pretty slow to retrieve, it's going to save it on your memory and it's going to be very, very fast to load. So once the entire shot loads, we can watch it in real time and then take a look at some of the issues. But as we go through this, there are going to be some issues with the dust and there's going to be some timing issues. And you'll also notice probably on yours too, that, that the dust is going to be pretty grainy. Like it, it's, it's far too grainy for what we need because I forgot to turn on denoising. So that's something that we need to do when we go back into Maya. We also have a really weird hotspot here. And I'm not sure what causes this, but we're going to go back into Maya later on and try to fix that. That happens for you. Just take note of whatever we come up with. But I think it, it looks like a reflection of the sun, but the dust shouldn't be reflecting the sun like that. But maybe it's a bug. I don't know. But I think, I think we can get rid of it pretty easily. So here the dust is very, very thick. But as you'll see, I, the dust is going to fade away way too quickly, which is something else I want to correct. Because really, as the ship is like about to touch the ground, this should be kicking up a lot more dust. And of course, the fact that the landing gear sticks over the top of here, top of the rocks is a problem. But as I said, we will fix this in Maya. All right, so now we can see the whole thing. And there are some issues with it for sure. But I think overall, I'm pretty pleased with it. There's a weird part where the ship dips. And I, I mentioned this before, it kind of like nose dives. I think I might would like to correct that. But for the most part, yeah, we could spend a lot more time with the animation. Maybe we should, but this is primarily for the composite and how you're doing the lighting. So as long as you're using some principles of animation, there is a little bit of a bounce and it's not just using linear keyframes everywhere or it's not just going straight down with no, no life to it. I think it's okay. So if it's something like this, I'd be happy with that. Okay. It'd be also really cool to have, have the landing gear extend out as it comes into land, but that requires, you know, you to set up a, a basic rig, which I don't really want to spend time doing. So if you'd like to, that'd be really cool if it works well and get a couple extra points for that. But uh, primarily it's, it's basically, can you, can you follow along with the rest of the comp and make something that matches the quality of what we do in the lecture? All right. So first thing I'm going to turn off my dust and we'll just take a look at the ship as it is, because the dust is kind of, it's too grainy to really do any other composite right now. I guess you could leave it on if you're at the end. You could just go right to the end and leave it on. But I'm just going to turn it off. So one problem that I'm seeing is, while this might be correct, if I go to my info tab here, and I just hover over the ship, these values are clipping out at like zero. And technically, Asus CG's SDR video is a tone mapper and it prevents clipping for the most part, but it, it doesn't necessarily prevent clamping. So these values over here are getting very, very dark. If I turn this off, you can see that there actually is quite a lot of value here and that's good. So it's not really messing up anything there because these values are already above zero. But with this on, it is making everything pretty dark. And I do want to fix that because I'm, I'm not satisfied with how dark that is. The front side also looks very dark. And I think that we could kind of make this pop a little bit better. So let's go over to a frame where we, it's not quite landed, maybe something around here. I'm going to do shift slash or the question mark key just to fit this up to 100%. Or you can just click on this button here and that just frames it perfectly in your viewport. Last time we played around with some curves adjustments and I don't believe we did anything on the GI or lighting because it's barely anything here. So we're not going to do anything on the GI or the lighting. So next we'll go to the reflection layer. Because the ship uses a PBR metal material, that is getting the most of the light. So if we select that layer, you can see there's a lot of color information here. If we turn this on, we actually get quite a lot of information back. And just a, a clarification, PBR refers to getting a correct looking material to the point where you render it. But after you've rendered something that uses PBR or uses ACES or whatever, it's physically correct outside of Maya, for example, or outside of Max or outside of Blender, whatever it is. But when you go into After Effects to composite it, you're not really breaking the workflow, but you're just making adjustments. But it's important to make adjustments on materials that were already photo realistically correct in, in the way that they preserve light and color information. But the whole point of compositing is to have some artistic freedom. So let's say I wanted to boost the reflections like I'm doing here. 
that's fine to do, okay? So don't worry about that if you think that, hey, this is too reflective for the scene. Maybe it is in Maya. Maybe you are correct. And you probably are correct in Maya that this is, is incorrect because maybe it is so dark and there's not enough light getting in here. There's light hitting this face and hitting the rocks behind the camera and then bouncing back at the ship. But we don't really have any reference what is behind us in this case. And I think that brightness, brightening up the main subject of the shot is a very important thing to do. So we wouldn't want to go overboard with it and like make this ridiculously reflective like that. That would be, that looks really fake. Okay. We just want to add a little bit of subtlety to this. Okay. So we, we could do something like this. But another thing that we could do is brighten up all of the layers together because it is getting a little bit dark. So what I'd like to do, I'll go up to my ship depth layer, control D to duplicate that, and I'll just call this ship mat. And I'd like to have an adjustment layer that affects only the ship layers beneath it. So all of them at once. So on the adjustment layer, I can call this ship CC for color correction. And on the ship mat, if I turn this layer on, solo it. Right now it's on depth. But instead of using the depth channel, I could go to the red, green, and blue channels and just say A, A, and A. This is the alpha. So we're just saying red, green, and blue, they're all just going to be whatever the alpha channel is. And that just allows us an, a quick and easy outline of the ship. All right, so then we can turn off the ship mat. Then on the ship CC layer, I grab a curves on here and just crank this up. You can see we're affecting everything. But what we want to do is say on the track mat, we want to use the alpha. You could also say luminance in this case because it is white, but alpha is probably safer because we just used the alpha before. So we say alpha and then hooray, cool. I also wanted to show you some weird artifacts that we can get. Even though the ACES is preventing clipping, these are black values, these are negative values. So if I turn this off and then we hover over this area here, we can see that these go to like negative 30. So anytime you see a blue ring and then inside that ring it gets darker and darker and darker and then ends up being black, that's an indication of negative light. It's still clipping. And the area around here, all this white area, is also clipped as well. Like this 1.5 value here, it's just getting so bright it, it is clipping. So ACES does prevent that, but basically it says, hey, it's just zero now. It's not going to be any less than zero, it's just going to be zero. Okay. And then for the blue channel, it's giving it a little bit of blue, but this is still negative light and it's still bad. And the reason it's happening is because we have forced so much more light into the scene that there is no data there. There's nothing that it can do. So it kind of goes in the opposite direction and starts adding in negative light, which is bizarre. So let's not do that. Instead, I didn't actually want to use the curves there at all. I wanted to show you another effect that we could start using, which is the exposure. Now exposure tends to work better if we're using the entire ship at once and not just individual layers, but we could also do it on the entire plate. This is the entire thing if we wanted to. But it curves is great and you can do more or less the same type of, types of things, but ex exposure works much more like a camera does. When exposure on a camera, you have like a little notch and then you can increase the notch, which increases your exposure steps. And we can do something like that. So right away, we could say for the exposure, a value of one. And see how that just brightens up the entire ship right now. If I go back to my reflection layer and I turn off that curves, we can see what this is doing a little bit more clearly because there's not other, there's no additional interactions. If I turn this layer off and on, it's pretty dark here. But turning this on, this gets it to a value that's much closer to what I want. And it's not just affecting the reflection, it's affecting all of those passes. So that even though the GI and lighting are not containing that much data, the data that is there is going to be a little bit brighter. Okay, another thing though is if we go back to our info tab and hover over this, we're still getting very, very dark values. So much like with the curves that we could just lift the black values. So let me show you what I mean. Grab a curves effect, pull this over. Lifting the black values is doing this. That's just going to make that a little bit brighter, or in this case, a lot brighter. This is called lifting the blacks. But I don't want to use curves. In exposure, this is called offset. So here I could do offset 0.1, and it's going to be a lot, right? So instead, we're going to do something like 0 0.025. And now if we turn this on and off, you can see there's quite a bit more light that's been added here, but it doesn't look ridiculous. It doesn't look like we completely blown this out of proportion. 
We could lower that maybe a little bit more, but for now, I think I'm going to leave that. We don't want our black values to get super, super dark, and we don't want our white values to get super, super bright. So if a, if a shadow is way too dark, just lift it up or offset it very slightly. And this is going to allow us a little bit more just information here. We never want that to be pitch black. All right, so moving down here, before uh, we put the ship glare right above specular, and then we had the refraction stuff, it doesn't necessarily matter, but in this case, I do want to place this above AO because AO is going to make it a little bit darker. So AO, we could put AO wherever you want. So it doesn't have to go above your reflections. You could put AO, you could put AO directly above your lighting or GI. And let's see what happens if we put it directly above GI. You can see everything else gets a little bit brighter now that the reflections are allowed to get a little bit brighter. But because this is not part of the beauty, and you are compositing it, you can basically put this wherever it looks visually the most accurate and pleasing. If I put this directly above GI, um, maybe that makes the most sense for you. That's fine. But if you want it to kind of darken down some of your reflections too, put this on the top of all the other lighting layers, except the glare, because the glare is going to be a post effect and the glare is really on the camera lens. And anything that's on the camera lens should be on top of scene layers like the ship itself you can see how that is glowing on top of all of this this also might be a little bit large i know last time i said hey i want it to be pretty large but we may have made that a little bit big but i think for now it's okay all right moving down on the ao make sure this is multiplied and just take note of all of these if, if in the previous lecture you didn't do all of the steps make sure that ship gi is normal it must be normal if it's additive it's going to look very bizarre, okay? This, that needs to be normal. Lighting, reflection, specular, and refraction are all additive. So is the glare that's additive. Then ship AO is going to be multiplied. And we haven't done anything with the depth yet, but we'll do that in a moment. All right, so for the refraction, this is something we talked about last time in one of the previous lectures. You could brighten up the glass if you wanted the glass to look a little bit more reflective there. You can do something like that. You have that control if you want to. So if you want to see more through the ship, as if the glass was perhaps thinner, you can you have the control to do that. Personally, I, I'm pretty happy with it, but if you wanted to add just a little bit more refraction, you could add a curve right there. If you wanted to do something like that. That's that's pretty subtle, but I don't know. Maybe you want to do something like that. On the specularity, grab a curves on this. And you can see we do have that control. We wouldn't want this to get too bright though, because if we made this too bright, then the ground really should be brighter. So we don't really need to do something like that in this case because it's already pretty bright. If you wanted to give it just a slight boost, you could do that. But again, our ground isn't that bright and there is going to be dust here. So on the reflection, I might actually turn on that reflection again. But in this case, I don't want it to be anywhere near as bright. I might just give that a slight boost just to give it a, a little bit more right there. We turn this on and off. You can see we're just adding just a little bit more brightness. And if we zoom out, I think that looks pretty good. So we still have our environment depth to do. And we still have the all of the environment layers to composite, something that we'll need to do a little bit later. Because you'll notice also that the environment doesn't have denoising applied to it because denoising does not get applied to the beauty by default. All right, so a couple other things that we can do just to get a sense of how this is going to look. You can grab a, another adjustment layer at the top called the CC for color correction. And their color correction must go underneath your OCIO. This has to be the first thing, has to be on top. So just make sure that that is on top. And then we'll grab curves. And for the curves, what we could do is just some very, very slight contrast. This is already fairly contrasty. We don't want to make the shadows too dark and we don't want to make the highlights too bright because it already looks pretty good in my opinion. But we can add just a little bit of contrast like that. And I think that will look just a little bit better. We're kind of darkening out some of the background a little bit more. We could go a little bit further and then do something with a vignette. So a vignette would be basically the edges of the the camera get a little bit darker. It's more of a feature that occurs with older cameras 
But you can also get the same type of thing on newer ones if you have what's called a lens hood. So poor quality lens hoods, they basically stop the they basically stop lens flares from affecting the shot. Because quite often you don't want lens flares, sometimes you do. In visual effects, our point is to match what the camera sees. So if there would be a lens flare in a real camera, we would want to add it. Uh, there are certain applications, creative applications, where you might want to add a lens flare. And it would be cool to add one here, but our sun is not really in view. So we could add something, but we would really need a plugin for it, which I have a really useful plugin called Optical Flares, but we don't have that on campus and it is it is expensive. So we don't want to use a cheap lens flare effect. We would want to do it properly. So we're not going to bother with that right now. So we could add just a little bit of that vignette, kind of pulls your eye into the shot, and this is the main point of reference. If you think the reflection as you go a little bit higher up is a little bit wrong, you could turn that layer off, not bother with it, or you could animate your curves. So as we go up and up and up, you can see if you want to include that or not. So if you think that looks a little bit bright, we could adjust that, but we are, we're not done. We're we have other stuff to do, so I'll come back to this. All right, so we have that. That looks pretty good. Now we could also play around with what is called the Lumetri color. So Lumetri color is like an all-inclusive color correction effect of places above our vignette. And you can do stuff like vignettes inside Lumetri color. I personally like to itemize my effects. So I like to have them separate because I can easily turn just a singular thing off, whereas Lumetri color sometimes is a little bit tricky to do that. So if you open up basic corrections, Lumetri color though does have a really useful color temperature gauge. So if you wanted to make it look like it was much colder, you could lower this value. This is going to pull in more blue light into the scene, and it's going to make it look a little bit cooler. Or you can do the opposite, and you can push in warm light, and this is going to make everything look warmer. Like it, the 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 actual temperature of the environment is going to make it look like it's hotter. Now you wouldn't want to do something super saturated like this because it looks very very oversaturated and fake. But you could do something pretty subtle, like you could do something like thirty. And if we just toggle that on and off, we're just adding just a little bit of warmth to the shadows. It's pretty subtle, but a subtlety goes a long way in a lot of color correction instances, something like this, just making it look a little bit warmer. Now I mentioned in the assignment that you could swap out these for like ice cliffs or something or snow or whatever. If you wanted to do something in a completely different biome, I do want something in the background. It has to be some type of geometry, some kind of environment. But you're not tied to using these rocks if you don't want to. Okay, so if you wanted to have a slightly different temperature, or you just wanted this not to look like it's a desert and just swap out the texture for something else that you create in Photoshop for the color map, that would be fine too. And you could you could use something that's less sandy if you wanted to. Maybe something that's more gray. But this option is something that you can use. But if you like that cool tone, that's fine too. I'm going to make this just a little bit warmer. But then I'm also going to lower the saturation. So the saturation here is pretty high, and I actually want to lower that just a little bit. Maybe something like 85. We're just pulling out 15% of that saturation. This kind of makes the scene look a little bit more homogenous in tone. And maybe that's not what you like, but for right now, I, I think that looks that looks interesting. If you wanted to play around with this, you can. Don't do something like this though, that's way too saturated, it looks very bad. It looks like something's wrong with your color. And then you wouldn't want to go the opposite direction, make the entire thing grayscale. Although there is something to be said about compositing in grayscale. It does make you more aware of value because you're not seeing any color. But in this case, I am going to include color. Maybe I'll bump that back up again. And we might tweak these settings as we, as we go through this because the more we look at the shot, the more we want to make some changes. And also, this would be a really good time to look at references of other ships landing. Uh, I just saw the movie Dune, and Dune has some excellent shots of ships landing in the desert and stuff. And I tried to find some from The Mandalorian, but I really would need to like screen cap those. But uh, we're kind of running out of time to really go in a shot by shot comparison for this assignment. And it's more to do with just comping everything and making a reasonable looking image. Well, so I think that we can do that with these effects right here. I might actually just lower the temperature just a little bit so it's not super warm. 
We can also do similar things here with the curves, but also just notice that we, by making these adjustments, we kind of lessen the reflective quality of the sky on here. It's not as blue. But we could also go to the reflection channel. If we turn this off, you can see how much of that ship relies on this pass. And if you wanted to make this not as reflective or not as blue, it would be very easy to grab something like a hue and saturation effect. You could also do Lumetri color and you could just desaturate this. And as you desaturate it, you lose blue basically. So if you didn't like so much blue there, or you wanted later on, you wanted to swap out your sky for something else, but you didn't want to re-render your ship, a very good solution. Or like maybe it's supposed to be on a different planet and it's supposed to be reflecting something that's not 100% blue. So we could crank this up and we can get really saturated just so we can see the colors more clearly. And we could change this. This is gonna look very awful if we have it saturated so much, but let's say the sky was supposed to be green. We could add a slight green tint by doing something like that. Not something I recommend for this. Let's keep the sky blue. It's gonna make it more realistic. But I would like to add some clouds in here and I'll show you what to do on that if you want to re-render out the sky pass with some HDR clouds, basically. So you can combine your sunlight with clouds, no problem. So we'll, we'll do that. All right, guys, thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to be doing depth for our defocusing or depth of field. If that's as interesting, stay tuned for the next video. Right, now we need to composite our depth passes to create some depth of field in After Effects. So this is going to involve combining the depths of two different render layers. Not particularly challenging, but what is challenging is doing this with the camera lens blur effect. So what we need for this series is going to be fine because we only need a little bit of defocusing in the background. But if you're looking to do a much shallower depth of field or a much stronger blurring in the background or the foreground, then you might want to have a look at fast bokeh or frisch luft. Those are going to be effects that give you far better results but they are paid third-party effects, not what you can find in After Effects. So I'm just gonna show you what we have available inside of After Effects, but what we need is all right. But if you do need something a lot more advanced or you just want a better experience doing it, check out those other plugins. All right, let's get started. Okay, so right now this is looking pretty good. One more thing that we need to do before we do anything else in Maya though, we need to set up our rock passes and we also need to set up depth. But I want to set up depth first because the, the rock passes are going to be the same thing that we did for the ship. So for the environment depth, I'm going to take a copy of our environment, which is this. I'm going to reset this curves effect. On the extractor, we're going to select depth. And if we turn this layer on and just look at the depth like this, this is the entire scene minus the ship and minus the dust. The dust is not going to be included in here. It's basically just the depth of everything which is the distance of that object from the camera. Now, this area here is actually transparent, but transparency in After Effects by default is black. If, if we looked at this in terms of black is closer to the camera, white is farther from the camera, then it makes it look like this is right out the camera. So that's something we need to solve. But what we're gonna do, I'm gonna take this environment depth. We're also gonna take the ship depth. So if we turn this one on too, you can see now the ship is included here. And it looks like I already made a copy of that there, so I can delete this one. Pull this here. So we basically have both of these layers together. I'm going to take them both, pre-compose them with Control shift c and I'll just call this Depth. You can do also Environment and Ship Depth if you want it to be more clear. And go inside this layer. We no longer need to solo them. Of course, the ground is going to be incorrect for right now. If you want to use that mat, you would want to grab a copy of your environment ground mat. If you are doing the mat like that, and you would want to say on the ship, it's going to be Luma inverted. Okay, you would want to set that mat in here, but I'm not going to be doing that. So that's why I'm not including mine. And then we also, to fix the fact that the sky is black here, we need to create a new solid. I'll just call this one sky. And then for the color, we'll just make this one white. And click OK. You can also do the same thing with a fill effect. So if I pull this guy underneath here, you could have whatever color solid you want. And you could do the whole thing with a fill effect. And you could just set this one to white as well. Okay. 
So now we got something that looks pretty good. Got this weird edge. And for this, I do need to set this to full so I can see this a little bit more clearly. So this edge though is, is not going to be apparent when we have our mat working. So I think actually this is, this is going to look pretty good. So on this ship depth, I'm going to delete that curves. And then instead I'm going to create a new adjustment layer. This is going to be our depth color correction. And for this, we really don't want to make individual color adjustments for the ship and for the environment because the depths need to be as one unit. So I could make everything darker or I could make everything brighter, but it doesn't really make sense to make the ship brighter or darker because that would change its position in space, which is not really what we want to do. So on this, I'm going to go a little bit higher up and you can see how light the ship is as it begins to come down. And it gets darker and darker and darker as it gets closer and closer to the ground. Or basically, it's not the ground, it's closer to the camera, which is making it darker. So this technically would be behind this rock here, which is fine. We'll have a look at that later. But you can make global adjustments. You can make everything darker or everything brighter. In this case, we just want to make sure that there's a, a subtle gradient. But in order to make adjustments that really make sense, we need to go back into our main composition and then we'll apply our depth and then we'll make adjustments based on what our depth of field is. So I mentioned that we're going to be doing some focusing with our camera with depth of field. And for that, we're going to turn off our environment ship depth, turn this layer off. And then right at the very top, this is going to be above everything except for the CC layer. We're going to create a new adjustment layer. I'm going to call that DOF for depth of field. And then we're going to add a camera lens blur effect. So if we apply that effect on right away, everything's going to look like it's out of focus. And then for this to really make sense, we really want this to be on full resolution. And the very first thing that you should do when you add on this effect is turn on repeat edge pixels. If, I, if you notice at the top here or around any of the sides, there's going to be that fringing. And that's because for blur to work, it has to average all the pixels around it. And there are no pixels around the edges, so they're going to look darker. So let's say repeat edge pixels, and that's going to basically just take the colors that are around the edges and just push them up. Okay, so we need to do something like that. But of course, I don't want the ship to be out of focus. I want the background to be a little bit soft, but not that out of focus. And I want the ground to be a little bit out of focus, but not this much. Okay, right. So what we can do, we can say that we want to use what is called a blur map or a depth map. So for this, we're going to click on layer and then select environment and ship depth. And then we can say effects and masks. We don't even have to go inside the environment and ship depth layer. So we can, we can make adjustments here if there were some clear problems with this, or we could just turn this layer off and do it directly in the comp here. So there are two options for you. I think this one is going to be a little bit easier, but there are cases where you might want to make adjustments to your other layers. If I just put a curves directly on this layer, then I go back up to my DOF layer. Because I say on here effects and masks, it will take note of my curves effect. Okay, so let's see what happens if I make this layer brighter. So I make that pretty bright, and you can see the image goes more blurry. If I turn this layer back on, you can see that basically we've made the entire depth completely go away and everything is white. If I pull this down, we're making everything back to normal. And if I do this, we're going to make everything black, except that part right there. Okay. And if we do that, then nothing is going to be out of focus. Okay. Everything is perfectly clear. Really though, we don't want to make massive adjustments though. So let's go back to our DOF and then we need to click on a focus point. So for the focal distance, in order to really see this with this effect, we do need to increase this to something silly like 25, just so we can see what is in focus. And then you have a blur focal distance. And for this to work, we basically just increase this value until we can see the part of the ship that we want to be in focus. So in this case for us, we want to look at, you can either look at the gun or the canopy. That is what really needs to be in focus. That is what the main point of this shot is. So we'll do something like maybe 0.1. Uh, nope, it's a little bit more, so 0.15. 
something more like this where this is all in focus. That is that is exactly what we need. Okay. We don't want anything else to be super blown out because while the camera lens blur effect is useful for doing this type of work, it doesn't do a good job with edges, as you can see here. If we go back to our environment depth, it's not going to do a great job with the edges here. So this is a case where we might want to go back into our environment depth, go to our depth CC, turn this layer on, and we might just want to add the little bit of less contrast between this edge and usually you don't want curves to look this weird you want to do something that's a little bit more like this in this case though it's going to be pretty okay like this but we just lessen the contrast now before it was like this now it's like this so if i go back to the main composition it's still going to be pretty bad around that edge though. So th those are things that we can do to kind of make the, we can selectively choose which objects are more in focus and less in focus this way, but we're never going to have the blur that high. In fact, the most we're probably ever going to go is something like five. So when the value is so low, it, it's going to look okay. Now, one thing that we can also do to kind of soften up some of this, because we do see aliasing here. So we could make a very, very, high quality render, which is going to fix that. And when we do make a higher quality render, all of this graininess is going to go away. But we do also want to make some of the sharpness here go away. Like you can kind of see aliasing on this rock. So what we could do is add a second camera lens blur effect. And we could place it either above or below. It doesn't really matter. But this one is going to be our, our main one that coats everything. But it's going to code it at a very, very small amount, like 0.5, just so everything has a very soft amount of blur. Turn on our repeat edge pixel. So usually you don't have anything that's super sharp. You can also lower that to like 0.25 or something. Just something to take a little bit of the harshness of the edge off. Like this rock here now isn't going to be so aliased. Some of that really spiky detail here is not as noticeable. Okay. You could also make the floor more out of focus, but I think in this case, the focusing works pretty well for what we need. Uh, if you are really interested in doing a lot more with depth of field, there are a few plugins that are available for After Effects. They are paid plugins. So if you are trying to do more compositing with After Effects in particular, Camera Lens Blur has a really nice blur effect, but the depth functions are pretty bad. There's a plugin called Fast Bokeh, which is pretty good. There's also another one called Frisch Luft, and that one is a lot more expensive. It, it's pretty good, but Fast Bokeh is, is really good too. And that allows you to just like select a point and allows you to blur it. And it also handles the edges a lot better. But we're going to have so much dust being kicked up that looks good, and it will it'll look fine. So if I toggle this on and off, you can see that that really does put a lot more focus on the ship. Now, if you crank this value up even more, it's going to begin to make the set look like you're on a miniature set. You got a lot more blurring here, but that's not really, not really good. It's not really what we want, okay? And that edge is going to be pretty horrendous. So let's do for the maximum value something like 5 or even like 3 or something. Just to get a little bit of focusing, but something that looks pretty reasonable like that. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. If it's about the line of the hard edge that you see in the background, if you increase the blur too much, then I'll probably just direct you to Fast Bokeh or Frisch Luft. So those effects are going to do a lot better job with that issue than the camera lens blur effect. But if you have other questions, I might be able to answer those. All right, see you guys in the next video. Welcome back to the Razor Crest series, and in this video, we're going to continue doing some compositing inside of After Effects, and then going back to Maya to correct some issues before we do our final render. All right, let's get started. All right, so at this point, what I'd like to do is show you the differences now between what we had before and what the master scene beauty right out of Maya looked like. So notice now how we've added a lot more depth to the scene. We've changed the color. We've made the ship stand out a little bit more and more attention now is on the cockpit of the ship. So you can see the power of compositing here. Now you have some artistic freedom that if maybe if you didn't want it to be as bright as this, you can make it darker and that's fine to do as well. 
All right, so I think this looks pretty good. Also notice that adding that blur has kind of got rid of some of that graininess. So what I'd like to do at this point, before we separate our environment out into all the different passes, which we might still want to do, like especially here, we see a lot of that depth of field is causing some hot spots there to be out of focus. We also might want to be able to animate our depth of field. So while this is in focus, we probably want to be able to change the depth of field a little bit. All right, so I'm going to preview this and then take a look at what we have so far. So this is the full shot without the dust. So you can see there's like a weird reflection on the back, the bottom of the ship here as we come in. It's like much darker, but there's nothing there to kind of occlude it. I think that's from the dust, so let's not worry about that. Uh, unfortunately for the cliffs here, it is still really grainy, even with the that blur defocus on it. And there's a few other things that we could do with the depth, but I'd like to do a, a different lecture on depth compositing that we can use with it, because I don't think it's particularly necessary for this shot. But if you wanted this to be very foggy, for example, uh, that would be a good, good um, application of using some atmospherics or depth. But the ship is so low anyway, and it's already pretty much at the height of this, this cliff face here that we wouldn't really need that. It would be cool to show you, uh, but it would probably be better done in Maya anyway. So we'll leave that for a different lecture. Okay, so this looks pretty good, but what we need to do now is separate out the cliffs, or the basically our environment, into all of the different passes. There's no quick way to do this. We just got to use Extractor to the same thing that we did before and just make sure our environment is separate. So I'm going to fast forward through this part because we've done this now several times. But you just want to make sure that you start off with the environment GI and then you work your way up. OK, so now we have our passes for the environment. So we got GI, we have lighting, we have the specular light. Refraction is actually completely black because there's nothing refractive on the environment. So this is something that we can delete and we can delete it from Maya as well. We don't need it to bother saving that out because it is going to kind of waste a little bit of time. But we definitely don't need it in our composition because it is wasting resources having a layer that's just completely black. And if we zoom in here, you can see that there is adding a little bit of shadow to the environment. So it's up to you if you want to include that. I'm going to include it. But I think for the most part, the environment is not as important to change. But it does allow you now, if you wanted to, use a curves or an exposure node or something and increase the direct lighting. You could do something like that if you wanted to. It kind of makes everything just have a little bit more depth to it. Personally, though, I'm pretty happy with where it is. But if you decided later on that you wanted to make this more overcast, it'd be very easy just to drop down the direct light. But you could add a little bit of boost to that if you wanted to. Same thing with the GI. So let's say that you really wanted this to be very overcast. You could take your lighting layer and just basically turn that off. On our global illumination, you could really increase that. Like let's say you wanted to do something that was very, very dark, like almost almost like complete overcast. You could do just your global illumination, because it's not going to be very much direct light in that case if the, if the sun is completely obscured by the clouds. This allows you to make those changes and even swap out your sky without necessarily having to re-render this. So just keep that in mind. Also, for your specularity here, you could turn off those hot spots, and that would also allow it to be, to be a lot more overcast. With that said, you can't make part of your environment look like it's in a completely different lighting environment like you couldn't have your rocks look like it's overcast and your ship look like it's not because we can see the highlights there but it's just something that you can you can now break apart if you wanted to to have a lot more control i'm going to go back to the gi though i don't really want to have any more bounce light you you might if, if very very slightly you could boost the gi very slightly like that and it would probably look just fine like down here if you think that that's getting too lost in shadow you could boost that up a little bit if you want to. Personally, I do think that looks good because we boosted the reflections on the ship. So by leaving this so dark, it kind of looks a little awkward that we're getting a lot more light from here and around the edges here. So it kind of makes more sense like that. So I'm going to leave that 
with a small adjustment on the GI and a small adjustment on the direct lighting pass. So if I toggle that on and off, you can see we've made it a little bit brighter. These are pretty trivial changes though. It's not particularly important for this. The biggest changes that we need to do are for the ship. Uh, and we still need to separate them out though, because now you can see that the denoising has been applied. So if we take any one of these layers, like AO, let's call this beauty, delete the extractor, and then I'll set this to be normal. You can see the amount of grain difference. Probably more evident when it's when it's moving, or when you don't look at the blur. If I turn this off like this, you can see the amount of grain in the beauty. Okay. Now for me, I don't need this environment beauty layer at all. You can use it there as reference if you want, but you have to turn it off. I'm just going to delete it. So I'm going to now turn on the dust again, just so we can see what that is. Let's go back into Maya and then start to make some adjustments to the scene so we can render out another pass and hopefully the final pass. All right, now let's go back into Maya and right away we want to up version this. So I want to say version two, the landing version two, like that. Then the next thing you need to do is go into your common tab in render settings and increase the version label here to be version two. Let's say you did something wrong on your second pass and you completely ruined something and it's too late to turn it in. You want to make sure you have your previous pass that you could use. If there's a problem with that too, then, well, that doesn't, doesn't help you. But there have been so many cases where if you accidentally overwrite something that was actually good and you make it worse, well, now you have to re-render again anyway. So make sure you up version this to a version 2 or whatever version of scene that you're using. This should match. If we had made changes in After Effects and we were on version five, even though that there's no version five of our scene, we would make a version five and we would up version this to version five. So it's okay to have a gap, but the point is anytime that you render out new frames, that should match whatever After Effects is, and After Effects should be using the same frames as Maya, okay? So let's say you go to version five in After Effects and the client likes that one, but it's been a few days or a few weeks and you need to go and double check to see that you're using the right frames. So let's say version five was good. You would say, hey, look, I'm using ship version five. Then you would go to the version five of that scene. Even if there's a gap and there is no version two, three, or four, that's fine. Now, of course, there will be stuff at, towards the end where you will up version your After Effects comp, like I said, and you might have version six, seven, eight. So let's say for version eight in After Effects, you needed to render out a change in Maya. Then in Maya, you would create a version eight of your scene and render out version eight of frames. Okay, so make sure you have that set because the next time we render that out, you wanna make sure that these two numbers are the same. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, just ask me. Uh, we'll leave the animation mode disabled for right now. And then the first thing I wanted to do, let's actually go to the environment, which I happen to be on already. We don't need the refraction channel because there's nothing on the material for the rocks that refracts. So we don't need to pass for it. So what we can do here is just click this button and it will disable that pass. Uh, this will turn to a no. Sometimes it's a little bit laggy. So sometimes you have to go back to a different layer. So check to make sure it's still on the ship, which it is. Go back to your environment here and you can see that that is disabled and this is now no. Okay, so we do need to have that. We also need to make an adjustment on our dust. So let's go to our dust layer. And for this, I did want to enable de the denoiser for our dust layer. So we're going to select the denoiser pass, right-click over enable, create an override for it, turn that back on. So to properly test the denoiser, we want to go back to our V-Ray tab, and then we need to lower our threshold to something a lot more reasonable. In this case, I'll do 0 0.05, which is going to take a lot longer to render, but it's going to be a lot cleaner with the denoising. I'm going to go back to my common tab, just make sure the animation mode is disabled. Then I'm going to render just one frame at 160 because there's a lot of dust on this frame. And then we can see the result of the denoiser. So this looks very, very grainy, even when it started to render here. Although this is better to work with. So by lowering the threshold, we do have a, a lot better looking dust to begin with. And if you wait a few seconds after that, that's going to run its denoiser pass. There might be some weird issues that you see. 
Lowering the threshold will reduce this even more, but uh, I would be fine with this level of quality. Okay, so that works and everything is good to go there. I also mentioned that I wanted to offset the dust animation because it kind of ends too soon. So let's do that really fast. We'll select the dust VDB. I'll go up to the graph editor. And right now we have it set so it starts at frame zero and it ends at frame 248. But I mentioned I wanted to offset this by at least two seconds. So what we could do, we could say we wanted this to start at frame 24. We can just select that frame, have it start a little bit later, and then we could have this end two seconds later. So, so we could end at 296 instead, just to pull those off a little bit more. Uh, we still have it kind of ramping up and then it's going to ease out later, but this part's going to be pretty linear, but it's going to kind of ramp up. If you wanted this to be all linear, that's fine doesn't really matter. I'm going to have a little bit of a curve. Basically, I just want more of the dust later on. So if we go to the end here, we should be able to see quite a bit more dust in the render. All right, so I'm going to go back to the master scene here and then just render one frame of the IPR. It's kind of hard to tell on the dust layer just on itself if it's looking good. So we want to make sure that it looks fine in the master scene with all the other geometry. And we don't want to have too much dust, but we want to have you know, a fair amount of dust. Uh, this might actually be a little bit more than we want. It's up to you though. If you want to have a little bit more of the dust gone at this point, what we could do, we could stop the IPR, go back to our graph editor. We could have this start at frame one again to it to start a little bit earlier, or we could have it end a little bit earlier. I'll just put it back to the original start time and then we'll take a comparison to see if the thickness is all right. Now we can always adjust that in After Effects, but it is going to affect the shading of the ship a little bit. So you have some leeway to affect the opacity, but if you dropped it to zero, but it's still casting shadows on the ship, that would look a little bit incorrect. So I think, I think this is going to look okay with this amount of dust. I think I'll be happy with that. All right, so I'm going to now go to the ship layer. And we do need to figure out what to do with the ground plane here with our displacement. So this should be occluding the landing gear, and right now it's not. So what we're going to do, instead of using the dust and rocks VDB like this, we're actually going to make a change here. So this is going to depend on your scene. If the crypto mat and using like an actual luma mat in After Effects works, then you don't need to do this. But if you want to make sure that your ship is landing properly on the ground with no ground existing there, this is what we're going to solve. Very first thing on the dust and rocks. I'm just going to call this dust, okay? Because I don't need the rocks in here, so I can remove that element from our layer. On the dust and rock shapes, I don't need this entire collection. I can just click delete. So I have one for the razor crest, so I'll just call this collection ship. And because we already have a collection in our render layers called ship in one of these other ones, this is why it says ship two, dust two, that's fine. We can right click over our layer, create a new collection, and this will be for our environment or our rocks. We'll just say rocks. And then we're gonna grab the rocks. We'll add that collection in there. And then on this collection, we're gonna create a material override. So material override, and we're just gonna use that material wrapper that we used before. And for our Matt, we're going to say matte surface alpha contribution is going to be negative one. We don't need it to cast or shadows or affect the alpha. So let's go to the very last frame here, frame 200. And then let's just render one frame of this and just see if this is correct. And when I deleted that collection, I also deleted the override for the dust. So really fast. Back to our dust right here. Uh, select our dust VDB. Go to the volume grid. Render stats, and I accidentally deleted the primary visibility. Let's overwrite that. Now you can see that that's been added. So, whoops. All right, let's try that one more time. So when that is pretty much done rendering, we can select our alpha, and then you can see that it's cut out properly. That's exactly what we want, and it still is collecting shadows from here. Let's turn off the lens effects there. For whatever reason, on GPU mode. Sometimes lens effects and denoising can lead to some weird results. So if you find that and you are on GPU mode, just disable them from the frame buffer. But this looks pretty good. 
if I wanted to just brighten this up just to check. See, that's all good there, and we're still getting all the shadows and everything. So, okay, everything is good there. So that's a pretty quick fix. We should have just done that to begin with. All right, so now we are ready for that. I did want to make an animation change on mine. So I'm going to go over to a perspective viewport and just have a look. I, I don't like how it dips down like that. I think it looks kind of silly. So at frame 52, it kind of does that dip. I want to pull this up. So it's not going to dip down so much. A little bit of that is fine. I just don't want it to be ridiculous. And you could even do something else like at frame 52, maybe it's going to be more on this side or something. Or frame 96 or something we just dip it a little bit this way also on our camera the composition is getting a little bit close so i'll select the camera and right here at a frame looks like 108 ish we just need to dip that down a little bit to keep that more in frame something more like that i think is going to be a little bit better Keep in mind that you are graded on the animation of this, but I'm not going to be super hardcore with it. I just want to make sure that you are using the graph editor and your keyframes aren't perfectly linear everywhere. Uh, we do want to do stuff like linearize maybe the front part of these. So it can already be in motion right at the very beginning. It's not going to ease into it. And there should be a little bit of a bounce and flare. So it flares back and then it bounces down. Uh, my bounce is a bit over the top. You wouldn't need it to like hit the ground and like shake as much, but something like that is going to be okay. All right, so there's one other thing I wanted to check here, and that's the lens flare. All right, so I'm going to go right to the very end here, and then I'm going to go back to IPR because I realized I wanted to change the lens effects. I made the size of the lens flare just a little bit too large, and I want to reduce that. So I want to make this the default 30 instead of 40. I think that will look a little bit more subtle and just a little bit better. Okay, so when you make adjustments to your lens effects, you do that in the frame buffer and it uses whatever settings are here to render the path. And as long as this is enabled here, you will get a glare render pass. Okay, that's good. So other adjustments that we need to make on our dust, I forgot while we were on here. There was a weird part on mine where there was like a, an odd highlight. And I don't know what was causing it, but I, let's just go back to the IPR and you can see that it looks like the sun or something is like reflecting. We get like a, a, a weird white spot there on our dust. So make sure you're on the dust layer for this. If you see something odd like that, what we're going to do, we're just going to select our sun because it looks like that is the sun. I don't know what is causing that bug, but we're just going to create an absolute override for it and then set the size to zero. I think that's going to be fine. If I go back to IPR now, hopefully that goes away. And if it does, we're good. If it's still there, oh yeah, okay, it's gone. Cool. So it must be something to do with the VDB and having the sun size there. I have no idea. That looks like a bug to me. So if you see something weird like that, set your size multiplier just on the dust layer to be zero because this is what controls the size of the sun. Okay, so I think that's pretty much good on that. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to go over how to add clouds to our sky. Welcome back to the Rise of Chris series. In this video, we're going to be adding clouds to our sky. Currently, we have a V-Ray Sun and Sky in use, and I want to show you how you can combine that with an HDRI without changing the overall lighting of the shot. This does require that you have render layers set up, so if you don't have those set up, I would recommend checking out one of the previous videos. We're also going to be setting up the scene for final rendering, and this is going to be the last video as part of the series inside of Maya before we do everything else inside of After Effects. All right, let's get started. I'm going to go back to the master scene now, and I mentioned that I would like to add clouds. So if you'd like to add clouds too, I do recommend adding something in the sky. 
And we're gonna do this in a kind of a hacky way. There is a proper way that you can do this by combining an HDR with a V-Ray light, but we just want some clouds in the sky. That's the only thing I care about for this. So we can do this pretty easily just with a V-Ray dome light, but then we'll only have that dome light affect the sky layer. So let's go to create lights, V-Ray dome light. And then on this light, we're going to say use dome text. And then on the dome text channel, we'll grab a file input. And I already have this uh, HDR that I downloaded from Polyhaven. So this is gonna be perfectly fine for what I need. Color space, we need to set that to scene linear, rec 709 sRGB. I'll go to the environment place node, just do like a horizontal flip and then just change this. So the light's more or less coming from the right direction. If you need to get to a different camera view to see that properly, you can do that and just make sure that the light is coming in, which actually that's pretty far off. Let me go back to the dome light here. And we need to make sure that the sun is going to be here. Like that. That would make sense with the rest of the clouds. Now, if we go back to our camera, we should still see that there are clouds in the sky. This looks more interesting and the direction is more or less the same. The sun is a little lower in the horizon here. So you could do vertical rotation if you wanted to, but that's going to make your perspective look very bizarre. So I think this is going to be good. If we need to make some adjustments in After Effects, we can definitely do that. So we really only want this to affect the sky layer. So we can go to our sky layer, go back to the dome light, and then we can actually disable the enabled tab and then create an override for it to be enabled only on the sky layer. If I go right click over enabled, create absolute override, turn it on, you'll see that it is there. But if I go to the dust layer, it's not there. If I go to the environment, not there. Ship layer, not there. Even the master layer is not there. Okay. We don't want the rest of that lighting to affect the rest of the scene. Now we could do some kind of blend where we blend both of them, but I don't want to change the lighting too much at this point. I just want to add some clouds. I'm going to go back to the sky layer now. We need to render out at least one test frame just to check. And as you can see, this is going to be pretty dark because whenever you have a V-Ray sunlight, we have to have that camera exposure node and it makes everything else darker without the sun. So let's go to our intensity multiplier and just do something like 20 and that will boost up the sky. You could play around with the values here if you wanted to do something a little bit brighter or darker. However, we can still do that in After Effects. So just get it close and then if we need to, we can alter that later. Okay. You could also set up like a giant sphere and do a spherical mapping on it and all that stuff, but dome light works just, just fine for that. So let's just use a dome light. Okay. All right. So I'm going to save the scene now, and I'm going to show you the settings that I would use for the final output. If you are not ready to use the final output, then go back to After Effects, just make your tweaks, make sure everything is working. If you have to render out part of another layer, just to make sure everything is working, you can go ahead and do that. But, uh, the settings that I think are going to be the best for us are going to be a threshold of around 0.05. If you're on the regular V-Ray mode, instead of using bucket, use progressive. Same thing on the noise threshold, we could say 0.05. Render time limit, maybe increase this to 0.5 or 1 or something like that. Now keep in mind, this is a 200 frame animation, which I'm sure by now you realize how long that can take to render. So one minute is going to be like a full day render, okay, for all of those layers. If you are running out of time, maybe try half that, okay? Now, the sky doesn't take that long to render at all, but let's just pretend that it, would, it was going to be 30 seconds of frame for the entire thing. That would be 200 times 4, which is 800 minutes. So if we divide that by 60, it would be 13 hours if it was one minute of frame. Divide that by 2, it would be nearly seven hours at 30 seconds of frame. But the sky does not take that long to render. So it would be some kind of average in between this. Okay, right. So this is the settings that I would use. Okay, if I was doing something that was going to go in a portfolio and I wanted to make sure this was great, I would put this back to the default. Sometimes at work, we have to go even lower than this. 
the lowering the threshold increases the quality, but I think for us it's going to be fine. Sometimes 0.1 might be fine. You just need to find a balance that works for you. And that's with Bucket, though. If we use Progressive, the most important thing is going to be this render time. Okay. All right. So I'm going to switch mine back to Bucket. It's back to 0 0.05. One thing that I'm going to do, and it is a recommendation, but not necessarily for this assignment, for the GI engine here, you might see flickering in light cache. So anytime there's like a highlight, that highlight might flicker with light cache because light caching takes your GI and then it reuses that for every single frame. Or if it's in animation mode, it will use it for X number of frames, basically. But animation mode is sometimes can still lead to the same problems. So for me, what I do, I set this to brute force. This is what it would have to be if you were doing anything professional. This is going to get you the best results, but it is going to increase render time. So if you're already running out of time, leave this on light cache and go forward with that. If you have time and you want to make a better quality render, use the brute force. Okay, so then I would just set this all up to render again, and then I would batch again. This is going to create a version 2 folder, and this is going to take a while to render. Maybe something that you could do overnight if you're on your own computer. On campus, though, the computers close down wherever the lab closes. So if you're using the VPN service or if you are on campus, there is a time limit that you would have to do this probably during the day. So you need to manage your time there and figure out how to render that if you need to render completely on campus. The next lecture, we're going to be adding a little bit of film grain to this, making some final color correction adjustments. We'll see this with the new sky and then see this with the dust in here properly. We can make our final composites. Then we'll put the slate on and then it will be done. All right, so I'll see you guys in the next lecture. All right, welcome back. In this part, we're going to take the renders that we set up last time and then start compositing those. This is going to be closer to the final. We're also going to be doing some very cheap lens flare techniques. And if you're looking for a more advanced way of doing this, I do recommend optical flares. And this is going to be a very, very hacky way of doing some more subtle lens flare, more like atmospherics. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. And now we're going to take our version two frames and finish the composite using the newest renders from Maya. So hopefully you will not need to go back to Maya to make any other changes. If you do, or you, you notice some egregious problem, something that you, you can't fix in After Effects and something that is distracting to the scene and it's just not good, you're really not happy with it, or it's an error where you really do need to fix, then yes, you should go back to Maya and make those corrections and then render out a version three. You might only need to render out one of the layers, or maybe you need to render out just a part of it or something like that. You can always go back and tweak things though forever. So I think for the purpose of this assignment, as long as the overall composite looks good and there's no noticeable errors, unless it's something that's a, a problem or something that would be a noticeable problem, I wouldn't really worry about it. You will always have a chance to resubmit this assignment if you realize that it's not, it's not quite up to par or if I think something could be done a little bit better, you will have the chance to render out a version three and submit that instead. Okay, so we're gonna load in version two. And to do that, if you did not have a version two and you just overwrote your version one, you would just right click over all of those layers and click reload, but hopefully you did render out a version two. And some of you might be on version three or version four or whatever, it doesn't really matter, but hopefully this is not version one. So we're going to go to dust version one, replace footage with file. And then in the images folder here, you can see that a version two has been created. Let's go to the dust and then I can click on any one of these. And as long as the EXR sequence is checked, it will import the version two. Next, we'll go down to the environment, replace footage with file. We'll grab the version two of our environment layer. Same thing for the ship. And then the same thing for our sky as well. Okay, so there we go. Right away, this, the sky looks pretty dark, so we're going to change that. But I want to go right to the very end and show that the dust now looks a bit better, in my opinion. It's a bit thicker. Before, it just kind of faded away really unnaturally. Also, the ground plane is occluding the landing gear, which is exactly what we needed to have happen. Because on mine, if you remember, it was, it was kind of messed up. The landing gear was sticking on top of the ground. 
Okay, so there's going to be a few things that I'd like to fix here. So I'm going to just pull this up a little bit so we can see all those layers. And then I'm going to go down to the sky. And then for the sky, I think it's a little bit too dark. So I'm going to go and add a curves adjustment to this. And basically, I just want to lift up some of the brighter midtones. All the way from the shadows to the highlights, it's going to be boosted just a little bit. So that looks a little bit better. Next, uh, I noticed this, these specular hits from the rocks. And for me, while it is how the material is created, I really don't like them. So if we go down to our depth of field and we turn this off, you can see this is just like a hot spot, like a specular highlight on the rocks render layer. But I don't really like that. So we have a few options. So on the environment specular here, I could click T for opacity and I could lessen the intensity of it. But if we look at the overall shot and we just toggle this layer, even back at 100%, toggle it on and off, the specular pass is not doing a lot. So I could just turn this off and it doesn't really look that much worse. Like we are losing a little bit of light here, but honestly, I think it's worth not having those really distracting highlights there. So I'm just going to turn that layer completely off. You'll also notice that I didn't even composite my glare last time. So I do have a glare pass. So if I wanted to add the glare pass, I could have done that. So if I make that into glare, you can see there's a little bit of a hit there. But now that we remove the specular pass, that wouldn't be that wouldn't really make sense to happen. So it, this is completely up to you. If you want to leave those in, that's perfectly fine. If your material is a little bit different to mine or the angle is different, you might not see those. But for me, I just I didn't like them, so I wanted to remove them. You can also see that the ship is looking pretty dark again. So on the ship CC layer, I'm going to go to the exposure node and on the offset, I'm going to just boost that up by 0 0.01. And you can see that that just boosts it just a little bit more. We don't want to lift it too much, but I think that looks a little bit better. On our depth of field, I also noticed that it looks pretty good where it is after frame 70 or so. But our depth of field before that, I think, looks a little bit too strong, especially on the back. So at around frame 70 ish, I'm going to animate the blur radius. And then I'm going to go right to the very beginning here at frame zero. And then I'm going to drop that down to something like, I don't know, we could do one. We don't want to get rid of the blur completely, but that looks a little bit better. It's like the focusing will change slightly throughout the shot. So if I click U, just have two keyframes here and then if we wanted to ease those in and out we can just select these keyframes here and click f9 so if i undo that clicking f9 is the same thing in the graph editor as clicking this button right here easy ease but i can just click f9 and it does the same thing as the ship comes closer and closer and closer the blur will change a little bit i think that will just look a little bit a little bit nicer in terms of the overall color correction, I think it looks pretty good, but when the dust starts coming on, I think everything looks a little bit reddish. On our color correction adjustment layer, I'm gonna go down to the elementary color that we added and then just drop down the saturation just a little bit more. You could even do something that's a lot more desaturated. I kind of like it like this, but I think the dust itself might need just a little less saturation so if I go to the dust layer, I could add a hue and saturation effect. And then we could just drop down the saturation to something like, I don't know, negative 15. Now you could drop down the saturation more if you wanted to, or if you wanted your dust to be a little bit lighter, you could do that too. You grab a curves effect on it. We could boost that a little bit if we wanted to, something more like that. That's up to you. Just do something that you think looks good. What we want to avoid though, we don't want the dust to be really dark because it looks weird and we don't want it to be too bright either. Okay. You want a nice balance So something in this range. You could also just simply go and click on T for opacity 
And remember, you can lower the opacity. So if you if your dust was too thick, you can always do this. Now remember though that the ship was rendered, the ship and the the environment was rendered with the dust on at whatever setting you had on in Maya. So if your dust was really really thick and you had a lot of it, the shading on the ship will be darker. And the same for the environment as well. Likewise, if your dust was barely visible in Maya, it's probably not going to be casting a lot of shadow on the other objects. But if you need to make your dust thicker, you can always simply duplicate your dust layer and you could do something more like this. Although you will run into the issue like this, where you can start to see a silhouette around your ship. So in this case, you would want to, on the, on the duplicate, you want to pull that down until you couldn't really see that anymore. You'd have to be pretty subtle with that. Okay. I think one dust layer for me is good, and I don't I don't need anything else than that. And I actually quite like it without the curves. So I'll leave the curves there if I want to, but I'll just turn the effect off. It'd be really cool to add some extra debris, and this is my intention. But for right now, I think this is this is good without any more debris. Uh, if we if this was like a portfolio piece, that would be really cool. If you're interested in doing more of a visual effects type of thing for capstone, you could absolutely do something like this and just make it, you know, a lot better or a lot more involved. Okay, so another thing I want to do is add a lens flare. Now, I mentioned before that lens flares are actually a little bit tricky to do, but because the sun is so far off screen, right? We could have just some kind of glow of light, and that light glow is going to look pretty nice when we composite that on all of our layers right here. So let's grab a new solid layer. We'll call this lens flare. Click OK. And on this layer, I want to grab a gradient effect. It's going to be called gradient ramp. Grab that. So if you select the gradient ramp effect, you basically get these two targets so you have by default a linear gradient so you get two color values and this is, creates a gradient between them but if we change the ramp shape to radial ramp we then get a circular shape for our ramp i'm going to swap the two colors here and then i'm going to pull down the dark value here and then the upper value the, the bright value we're just going to pull those off to the side something like that so we get some nice screen right to screen left glow Next for the color, this one we want to do something that's kind of brownish. If you were picking a color for like the actual sun, you'd do something like, oh, it's, it's yellow, right? But you can see how that's looking here. It's look, it looks just way too bright. So really, we could either do this and then lower the opacity like all the way down. But I found it's a little bit easier just to pick a color more like around this. So it looks very gray for us, which is fine. And remember, with the OCIO color profile on here, all the values do look a little bit different. Okay, so if you were trying to do a color picker, you want to make sure you've soloed this. But with the OCIO on, it's changing all the colors, basically. All right, so that looks, that looks all right, but then we're going to add it, and then you can really see what this is going to do. So if I turn, toggle this on and off, you can see how this has created some kind of glow of light from screen right to screen left. So I want to add a glow like this, and then I want to do some very basic animation with it. You can also see how you can change the intensity just by pulling in or pulling out the start of ramp target right here, and it makes it all a little bit brighter. So next, because the camera is changing and the position of the sun changes relative to the camera, we're going to animate the start of ramp right here. So that's at frame zero. And then we'll go forward until the camera is about in a position where it's not really moving up and down anymore. So maybe something like around 160. And then we're going to zoom out and then we're going to pull this like way up. Something more like that. So it's like pretty far off screen. And if we fit up to 100% and then toggle our lens flare, you can see how that's still influencing the shot quite a bit, even though it's so high up. 
And remember to see it again, you just select your, your layer up there. We could even pull that up a little bit higher. And then I can ease this transition by clicking U. And then we could ease both of these. Marquee, select both of those keyframes and then click F9. I'll change into like a little hourglass icon and all that does is just eases in those two keyframes there. And basically we'll just get a very nice subtle lens flare. Now it'd be really cool to use a plugin like optical flares. Optical flares is going to get you get those rings on the camera lens. But uh, really we just want something pretty subtle for this. All right guys, thanks for watching. In the next part, we're going to do our camera shake and film grain. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Welcome back to the Razor Crest series. In this video, we're going to go over how to create some camera shake. I'm going to be showing you a technique that is completely manual, but gives you a fair amount of control. There are plugins that do this, but I want to show you a completely free and custom way to do it. We're also going to be going how to add film grain. Any type of camera is going to have a little bit of grain. And remember that the whole point of visual effects is to match what a camera sees. I'm going to be showing you how to add that appropriately to your shot so it doesn't look as CG. All right, that sounds interesting. Let's get started. This next part is going to involve pre-composing all of these layers. So then we could add a little bit of camera shake and add our grain. Let's do that next. We'll select everything in here. or You can either shift select all your layers or click control A and that will make sure everything is selected too. Then control shift C. And then we're just going to call this razor crest landing or you could call it shot or you could call it shot without shake or whatever, something like that, or you could leave it pre comp. And then inside this pre comp, this is going to allow us to do some camera shake, but then we can also do things like grain. Now you might think, why would I want grain on an image? But if you zoom in on the ship here, it looks very, very smooth. Even the sky looks very, very clean. None of the shadows have any amount of grain on them and it just looks a little fake. So even the best quality cameras still have a tiny amount of grain. It was a good idea to add grain to your ship. Now, the reason why we want grain outside of our main comp is because we're going to be doing camera shake. So if the camera's moving around, that's going to cause all of our grain to blur, but we don't want that to blur because when the camera's shaking, there's still going to be grain on the sensor of the camera. And you could have a really quick moving shot, but there's still going to be grain on there. So we're going to grab an adjustment layer. We're going to call this grain. Then we're going to grab the add grain effect. The first thing that we need to do is change our viewing mode to final output. And then right here, you can see that this looks absolutely horrendous. Don't turn anything in like this. That would be, that would completely ruin the overall image. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to lower the size and play around with some of the other intensity settings. But then more importantly, we're going to be able to tell After Effects where we want the grain. Because on a real life plate, darker areas or just shadowed areas are far more susceptible to grain than bright areas are. So in areas where it's really dark, we want more grain. In areas where it's bright, we want less grain. The first thing is though, we want to drop down the intensity quite a bit. You can start with like 0.1 and uh, the intensity is far less now, but the size is still like way too, way too much. So we could do something like 0.25. And when you do 0.25, it is going to look a little bit stronger. So then on the, on the intensity, we could do something like 0.05. And that looks quite a bit better. Next for the color, I don't really want it to be so colored. So if you zoom in here, we can still see there's quite a bit of color there. You can say monochromatic and it gets rid of all the color, but in real grain, there is going to be a slight difference in color, but instead let's just drop this down to like 0.5. You can see there's a tiny amount of color, but that's pretty subtle. Then for the application, this is where we're going to be able to say where we want the shading. So on shadows, we'll leave that but then for things like the clouds in the sky, we don't want this much grain. So on the midtones, we could do something like 0.5. You notice the sky loses a little bit of that grain. Uh, on YouTube though, on, on the compression here, this might not be as clear depending on how, how its compression handles this. So this is something that you're going to have to just judge that for yourself. Highlights though, I'm going to put that at 0.1 and I think this looks pretty good. For the most part, 
you should see just a very fine amount of grain on the ship, the underside of the ship. And then if we zoom in on some of these rocks, if we toggle the grain on and off, you should be able to see there's a little bit of grain here. Something like that. That's all we have to do for the grain. Now for the camera shake, we're going to create a null object. And the null object is kind of like a locator in Maya or a dummy object in other, other software. So you can basically just add transform information, so movement information, and then have other layers follow it. So I'll call this layer camera shake. Grab a slider control. So a slider control just allows us to add a custom variable basically, and then we can use it in like a, a little expression. So we're going to be using a wiggle expression and the wiggle expression is what it's going to allow us to randomly animate some camera shake. And to control that wiggle expression, we actually need four of these slider controls. So we can just duplicate that control D three times and we'll have three extra copies of it. Then next we'll click enter. And we'll say shake position frequency. Next we'll do shake position intensity. then shake rotation frequency and shake rotation intensity. We're not going to animate the scale because that would mean the camera's going forward and back and it tends to just make the whole thing look a little bit jerky. So we don't want to do that. All right, so then what we're going to do, we're going to click P on the camera shake null object and then shift R. So P brings up the position channel and shift R just appends another channel to your selection. So you could do the same thing. You could do R, which opens up just rotation, and then Shift P or Shift S, Shift T. And you're just adding other channels because by default, if you just click T, you only get opacity. Then if you click P, you only get position and so on. So we're going to do position and then rotation with Shift R. Then for position, we're going to hold down the Alt key on your keyboard and then click the stopwatch. And this is going to bring up the transform position node like this. I'm going to highlight all of this. We're going to type in wiggle. And next what we're going to do, we're going to grab this icon here. This is the pick whip for the expression. And then we're going to drag this all the way up to shake position frequency. And then let go of that slider. Next do a comma. And then we're going to grab shake position intensity right here. And when that is good, you can simply click off to the side or click the numpad enter key and that will go off. You can see the position channels are red and this is now equating to whatever is here. So these are called slider controls because you can open up a slider. If I take my Razorcrest landing comp, which is basically everything inside this except for the grain. And then if I take the layer pick whip, add that to camera shake, or you can simply click where it says non and then say camera shake, which goes a little off screen for me. So I'll just do this. On the camera shake, if I go back to the slider for frequency and position, for, so for the position frequency, this is how often it changes position. And the intensity is the amount of movement that occurs. Okay, so we're, we're going to come back to this and we're going to make these pretty subtle, but that's basically what it does. So next we can do the same thing for rotation down here. I can all click over the rotation stopwatch and zoom in on this. Type in wiggle, grab the expression pick whip for the shake rotation frequency, comma, shake rotation intensity, and then numpad enter or just click off to the side somewhere. And now the p rotation is bound to this expression, which takes in two parameters. So the, the wiggle expression requires how often is it going to change and by what amount is it going to change, basically? If I open up these sliders here and then I say for the frequency, I want it to be 13 times a second. And then for the intensity, it's going to be like this, which looks ridiculous. And then as we move around, if we were to just play this forward, this is going to look absolutely ridiculous because every few, every few frames, this is going to be like completely, completely wrong. Okay, that's what it does. But we're not going to do anything silly like that. We're going to be very, very subtle. And you don't actually need these slider controls to be open because the slider is pretty useless, to be honest. It only goes from 0 to 100. And most of the time, you want something that goes to whatever 
number that you want it to go to. So even negative numbers if you want. Okay, so instead we're gonna go to like around frame 30 or so. I can actually close this camera shake layer. I don't need that open anymore. And at frame 30, we're just gonna simply animate all of these on. So these all need to be blue. Click U, and then you can see all those channels have been activated. I can select all of those, click F9, and that just makes them eased in. And then we'll, we can go forward to about when the ship is, a, is about ready to land, like, I don't know, 150 or so. And then at frame 150, the amount of time, like how many times the position changes per second, we could do something like one, so it's once per second. And then how much does it move? Well, we can say the five pixels. You can say 10 if you wanted to, have it a little bit more. And then for the rotation, this is what you have to be careful on, the rotation, I think you're far, it's far easier to, to see if the camera's rotating from side to side. It's a lot more apparent and it's a lot more nauseating. So let's do something pretty low. So 0.5 means once every two seconds. And then for the rotation intensity, we could do something like 0.5 as well. Now these you're going to have to, to check if, to see if they're good. But well, I don't want to see like a lot of really high frequency jittery shake. Okay, it should be pretty, pretty subtle. If you just wanted some kind of like super smooth rocking motion, that would be okay as well. But the point is it is supposed to give a little bit of vibration as it's coming into land, but it's, it's up to you to figure out how good it looks with your, with your composition, your camera and the overall ship animation. At the end here, I recommend not doing like a hundred percent zero because there's really not that many frames for it to suddenly land and stop shaking. So let's just reduce these values by we can say half on this one, maybe point, maybe two on this for the frequency, we could do 0.1, maybe for the intensity 0.25, or maybe even a little bit less than that, 0.15, up to you. Okay, now let's go all the way to the very beginning. I'm going to set this to half resolution, and then let's see how this looks. All right, so here we go. This is a, a really subtle amount of shake that should show up here. You can kind of tell it's really, really subtle. I think without it, it looks a little bit static. And you can tell how much is being added. Up here in the corner, it's going to be a black bar. So as the plate is moving around, you can see the borders of how it's, how it's moving. If you wanted to increase that, you could take position intensity. And you can do something like 10, and then you've, you've doubled the border, okay? So it's up to you what you choose, but I really wouldn't go that much higher. Let's see what 10 looks like. And the first time that you've buffered this, it will go faster when you make adjustments to the shake. Just keep that in mind. So as we come down here, it is going to be... A, I think also the camera in Maya kind of dips down a little bit quickly, which is a, a change that I would fix. If I was doing this, if I was going to do a version three, but I think that looks pretty good. I wouldn't do anything more than this though. And actually I'm going to go halfway on that and just say 7.5. All right. So we do have to address this edge and the way that we do that is not very elegant. All we do is click S for scale on our razor crest landing comp. And then we just need to scale this up. So at the maximum amount of shake, it's going to be a little bit larger so we could do something like 101 so just increase that by one percent see if that solves it there which it looks like it's getting very close we might need to do 101.5 just to give a little bit more boundary there the more rotation you have which it really should be pretty subtle but the more rotation you have the more you have to scale in so if you were doing an effect shot and you knew you were going to add a lot of shake, you would do what's called an overscan in Maya, which you actually end up rendering a little bit wider than you need, just so you can fix things like camera shake. And it's also useful for lens distortion corrections and things like that. But basically just go through each of your edges, scrub through the entire shot, and just make sure that that line doesn't go up higher. Because if you see a black edge, you will lose points for that. But don't make it too large. You don't want to make it so zoomed in that it looks, looks silly. Another thing that you could have done is just pull back a little bit of your camera, with your camera in Maya, and that would allow you to scale in a little bit more.
but I think just between one and two percent, that should be all that you need to scale in by. I'm going to actually quickly go back into my Razorcrest comp. There's one thing that I forgot to do in my comp here, and that's on the dust. I forgot to use the denoise dust because this looks pretty, pretty grainy. So if I solo just the dust, you can see that this is already pretty grainy. Last time we added a denoising pass, so we're going to go to extractor. Pull up extractor above that hue and saturation. And then on the layers, we're going to choose denoiser. And now when you zoom in, you should see that that's applied the denoising. With, without, and remember that denoising does alter the values because if it's very grainy, it basically averages the colors of surrounding pixels. And if they are darker or lighter, it will make your image darker or lighter. So we may have just made this entire thing just a little bit darker it looks like we have so you may need to go with the curves adjustment and boost that up a little bit if you want to kind of match what you had before okay i think also on our color correction i'm going to brighten up the shadows just a little bit because i think they're getting a little bit too dark and when i did that i actually want to go back to the dust now maybe not make that quite so bright I don't know what I want to do with that curves. I think that looks okay, but so does that. Maybe something halfway in between that. Going into my tweaking phase again, so let's uh, back out of your comp. And one thing I wanted to show you, when you have lots of different comps like this, like for example, we have Razorcrest Landing, we have our ship and environment depth, which we haven't used for a while. Then we have comp one. Well, really, you should keep your hierarchy in order like this. But sometimes it gets completely messed up. So if you're on, let's say, your ship environment depth, then you want to back out to your Razor Crest Landing, or whatever comp this is in. Sometimes you will have so many comps, it goes like off screen, okay? Especially if you're on a smaller screen. So if you click the tab key, the tab key will show you what the parent comp is and if it has any child comps. So if we go back to our Razor Crest Landing comp, click tab again, you can see it has the environment ship depth as a child comp. And then it also has a parent comp. You can go to comp one. So on comp one, if you click tab, you can see that there's a child comp, which is Razorcrest. Using the tab key is a really useful way to step forwards and backwards between different nodes of your composition. Uh, one other thing that we can do here, anytime you add a null object, you get a little box here. This does not render, but it's kind of annoying. But if you turn off the layer of visibility, everything else still works but uh, you're not going to get that annoying box. So the very last thing that we have to do on this composition is on our Razorcrest landing comp, we do need to enable motion blur. So you enable motion blur with this switch right here. And as long as motion blur is enabled for your composition, when the ship jitters back and forth, it will also blur just a little bit too, which is the type of response that we would see in a real camera. All right, guys, thanks for watching. We are nearly done now. There's only one more video left. And in the final video, we'll be setting up our composition for rendering and then adding our slate. See you guys there. All right, welcome back to the final part of the Razorcrest series. In this video, we're going to be setting up our composition for final preview rendering. So basically, this is something that you would send the client to have a look at. Not really final frames or anything, but just something that the client can see for the first time. We're going to use H.264. It's very common to use ProRes or DNX HD, but I'm going to show you something that would work for pretty much any device. We're going to be using the media encoder as opposed to just rendering from After Effects, and we're also going to be setting up our visual effects slate. If you would like to use the same slate, it is available on my Patreon. Otherwise, you can create your own. All right, let's get started with the final part of this series. Okay, so all of this though needs to be pre-composed again. So we're going to do control shift C and then this time we're going to say shake and grain and inside our master comp now which is comp one this is where we're going to apply our slate and then name this whatever our preview is going to be called but to do that we need to make this 1080 again so if yours is not 1080 you need to make this 1080 so it's control K to bring up your composition settings then we're going to type in 1920 by 1080 
And then here for the duration, we need to add one more frame for the slate. So it's going to be 201 frames. Click OK. And then you'll notice that this is extended everything by one frame. Go right to the very first frame, so frame zero. Click page down to step forward one frame. Select this layer and then click the left bracket key. So then the very first frame is completely black. It's actually completely transparent. This is where the slate goes. You should not see your ship with your slate. Like they should be separate. Okay. You could also just zoom in all the way and then just move this over like that. Whichever way you like, I prefer using page down and then the left bracket key, but it's up to you. All right, so let's grab our slate. So slate for VFX. Make sure that if you're in the motion graphics class, you use the visual effects slate for this assignment. We're going to open that up. I'm going to grab the slate right here. Okay. Now remember, we got to open up the slate comp, grab everything with control A, click control X on your keyboard to cut all those layers, go back to comp one, then control V to paste them in. This is how we transfer all of those layers to our new composition. This is to prevent us from having to run a script. Basically, this is the only way to, to really do this. For the description, type in Razor Crest Landing. For the rest of this, apart from the artist name, this is not me, this is you. For the rest of this, everything should be automatic. So the frame rate should be 24. This is automatically determined. Switch this back to full resolution so we can see this more clearly. Everything else should be just automated like this. Okay, last thing for the comp name. This is going to be whatever your composition is called. So control K or composition settings. And then this is any 270 underscore project 02 underscore whatever version number you're currently on. So I, I made a mistake here. We should have saved this file as version two. So we'll click version two, click OK. I need to up version this right away. We should have done that as soon as we opened our composition. So that's version two. If you're on version three, give me a version three. If you're on version 20, give me a version 20. You're probably not on a version 20 though. That's a, you're up versioning too much. If you want to do increments and saves, so you can have version 1.2, version 1.3 or whatever. Increments and saves don't count, right? So every time you like do a proper render, that's what's important, right? You don't want to confuse yourself and clients with like really elaborate version numbers. Version one, two, three, four. Sometimes it'll be like version two B, or like a version three A, B, and C. All those three separate files. That's pretty a common convention, but you just want to do something like this, okay? Fit this to a hundred, and then step through this. On the letterboxing, this is where you're going to see your frame counter, and then the file name right here, and then we're good to go. And on our slate here. Obviously, because our slate is using so many different frames, we're going to click on the little shy icon, gets rid of all of those. And then we can go up to composition, add to Adobe Media Encoder Q. Click on this. We'll open up the Media Encoder. None of this is new information. This is going to be pretty much the same thing that we did for the previous two exercises. But I thought we would do a little bit of review on this. So this should pop up here if it takes a little bit for you. It's, it's fine. Sometimes this can be pretty slow. Sometimes it can be pretty fast. It just depends on your computer and just how it's feeling, I guess, because sometimes mine is really fast and sometimes mine takes forever. So this name right here is the same name as your composition. If this says slate, you did it wrong. You need to go back and fix that. Uh, we don't need audio exported. Uh, it shouldn't really matter if it's on or not, but we don't need that channel at all. Now for this, we need to do you can do hardware encoding or you can do software encoding. If it's on software, you could do something like 15 and 25. I know I sometimes change these around. Basically, anything between this is probably going to be good. Uh, 15 is going to be too low on the maximum, though. So on the maximum, I do like to give it a little bit more. Uh, sometimes I say 20 and 25. If it's for YouTube, it would be 35 and 45 at 4K. But uh, for, for an assignment like this, let's just do 20, 25. That makes sure there's not going to be 
a lot of grain. If you want to make sure it's slightly smaller and better compressed, you can do two pass. This will take twice as long to render though. If you have a graphics card, like if you are rendering with V-Ray's GPU mode, you might consider switching this to hardware encoding. If you switch it to hardware encoding though, you can't do variable bit rates like this, it's constant. So I'm going to leave that on software. Use maximum render quality. And then by default, this is going to save in, in an AME folder. If that's fine for you, no problem, that's, that's cool. But I'm going to make a new folder called previews. And in the previous folder, this is where I would save out versions of this. Because sometimes those AME folders, they're, they kind of get lost. So let's just do that. Click OK. Click on the start queue. And this is going to vary quite a bit. If you're rendering to a flash drive, this might take forever. This is going to depend on your system. So just remember that VBR2 pass will take twice as long. So if you start this off and you see something like 30 minutes or an hour or something crazy, just drop it back down to VBR1 pass or switch it to hardware encoding, which doesn't have variable bit rate at all, and just render that. Okay. So VBR2 pass is more to do with how it optimizes the compression. And you tend to get better compression and, and perhaps a slightly smaller file size, but uh, you don't have to bother with that for this. All right. So when that is done, simply click on the output file location. We'll open up an explorer window. You can play it with whatever you, player you like, but I'm going to pull this back into After Effects. After Effects is, good, is a really good player as well. Like it makes sure you, it plays every single frame. So I'm going to just double click this, open up a footage tab, drag that out. The first frame should be your slate. Now on your slate, check to make sure all the information is correct. Check to make sure that at the very last frame says frame 200, and that's what the length is going to be. If your shot for whatever reason is a little bit longer or a little bit shorter than that, the length still needs to match whatever you submit. Okay. All right. So now we can play this back and just have one final look at this. Hopefully it's good to go. If you need to make more tweaks, then go ahead and make those tweaks and then render this out again. So there are some things that I would fix. I'm still not 100% happy with the dust. It looks, it fades a little bit too quickly still, in my opinion. I'd like it to be a little thicker, more like this at the very end, but it's better than what it was. And we could go back and forth all day with that. There's also the sharpness of the shadow here, what we never even talked about. If you were trying to get a softer shadow, let's say you're doing like overcast, that would be the sun size in V-Ray, that if you increase the sun size, it's going to, it's going to increase your shadow softness. So that's something else we didn't talk about. If you have any specific issues with your scene or you want me to take a look at it, I'd be more than happy to help. All right, so once that is all good, just submit this to Canvas. When I grade it, if I need to take a look at something just to make sure you did something right, I might ask for that. So keep all of your Maya files and keep all of your After Effects files and everything. And you might also want to resubmit this later on in the semester for more points. Okay. So this should have served as a pretty good introduction to compositing directly from Maya. And even if you have no interest in visual effects, if you have interest in rendering from Maya or rendering for whatever app you're, you choose to use in the future, the things that we've done here are not Maya dependent and they're not really After Effects dependent. They're just pretty foundational level compositing. And even if you were to do something like this for just a still, so it's something that wasn't even moving, you can use a lot of the same techniques and a lot of the same principles. All right, so finish this up, get that submitted, and then we can move on to the final set of assignments, and then the semester will be over. So if you have any questions, please let me know as soon as possible, because this takes a fair amount of time to render out. You want to make sure that all your corrections are, are made as soon as possible. So thank you for making it through the entire series, and I look forward to see what you guys come up with. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it through this entire lecture series, I really appreciate it. Put a huge amount of time into this, so I hope you enjoyed it. But most importantly, I hope you learned something about Maya, V-Ray, and After Effects. As always, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to help, and I'd love to see what you guys come up with if you use this as reference. Anyway. Thanks again for watching. Hopefully it won't take another full year before I release new content for this channel, but we'll see how it goes. All right, guys, until next time.